Aladdin and the Magic Lamp by Unknown. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lucy LaFaro. Aladdin and the Magic Lamp by Unknown. There once lived a poor tailor who had a son called Aladdin, a careless idle boy who would do nothing but play all day long in the streets with little idle boys like himself. This so grieved the father that he died. Yet in spite of his mother's tears and prayers, Aladdin did not mend his ways. One day, when he was playing in the streets as usual, a stranger asked him his age, and if he was not the son of Mustafa the tailor. I am, sir, replied Aladdin, but he died a long while ago. On this the stranger, who was a famous African magician, fell on his neck and kissed him, saying, I am your uncle, and knew you from your likeness to my brother. Go to your mother, and tell her I am coming. Aladdin ran home and told his mother of his newly found uncle. Indeed, child, she said, your father had a brother, but I always thought he was dead. However, she prepared supper, and bade Aladdin seek his uncle, who came laden with wine and fruit. He fell down and kissed the place where Mustafa used to sit, bidding Aladdin's mother not to be surprised at not having seen him before, as he had been forty years out of the country. He then turned to Aladdin, and asked him his trade, at which the boy hung his head, while his mother burst into tears. On learning that Aladdin was idle and would learn no trade, he offered to take a shop for him and stock it with merchandise. Next day, he bought Aladdin a fine suit of clothes, and took him all over the city, showing him the sights, and brought him home at nightfall to his mother, who was overjoyed to see her son so fine. Next day the magician led Aladdin into some beautiful gardens a long way outside the city gates. They sat down by a fountain, and the magician pulled a cake from his girdle, which he divided between them. Then they journeyed onwards, till they almost reached the mountains. Aladdin was so tired that he begged to go back, but the magician beguiled him with pleasant stories, and led him on in spite of himself. At last they came to two mountains, divided by a narrow valley. "'We will go no farther,' said his uncle. "'I will show you something wonderful. Only do you gather up sticks while I kindle a fire.' When it was lit, the magician threw on it a powder he had about him at the same time saying some magical words. The earth trembled a little in front of them, disclosing a square flat stone with a brass ring in the middle to raise it by. Aladdin tried to run away, but the magician caught him and gave him a blow that knocked him down. "'What have I done, uncle?' he said piteously, whereupon the magician said more kindly, "'Fear nothing, but obey me. Beneath this stone lies a treasure which is to be yours, and no one else may touch it. So you must do exactly as I tell you. At the word treasure, Aladdin forgot his fears, and grasped the ring as he was told, saying the names of his father and grandfather. The stone came up quite easily, and some steps appeared. Go down, said the magician, at the foot of those steps you will find an open door leading into three large halls. Tuck up your gown and go through them without touching anything, or you will die instantly. These halls lead into a garden of fine fruit trees. Walk on till you come to a niche in a terrace where stands a lighted lamp. Pour out the oil it contains and bring it to me. He drew a ring from his finger and gave it to Aladdin, bidding him prosper. Aladdin found everything as the magician had said, gathered some fine fruit off the trees, and, having got the lamp, arrived at the mouth of the cave. The magician cried out in a great hurry, Make haste and give me the lamp. This Aladdin refused to do, until he was out of the cave. The magician flew into a terrible passion, and throwing some more powder on to the fire, he said something, 
and the stone rolled back into its place. The man left the country, which plainly showed that he was no uncle of Aladdin's, but a cunning magician, who had read in his magic books of a wonderful lamp, which would make him the most powerful man in the world. Though he alone knew where to find it, he could only receive it from the hand of another. He had picked out the foolish Aladdin for this purpose, intending to get the lamp and kill him afterwards. For two days Aladdin remained in the dark, crying and lamenting. At last he clasped his hands in prayer, and in so doing rubbed the ring, which the magician had forgotten to take from him. Immediately an enormous and frightful genie rose out of the earth, saying, What wouldst thou with me? I am the slave of the ring, and will obey thee in all things. Aladdin fearlessly replied, Deliver me from this place. Whereupon the earth opened, and he found himself outside. As soon as his eyes could bear the light, he went home, but fainted on the threshold. When he came to himself, he told his mother what had passed, and showed her the lamp and the fruits he had gathered in the garden, which were in reality precious stones. He then asked for some food. Alas, child, she said, I have nothing in the house, but I have spun a little cotton, and will go sell it. Aladdin bade her keep her cotton, for he would sell the lamp instead. As it was very dirty, she began to rub it, that it might fetch a higher price. Instantly a hideous genie appeared, and asked what she would have. She fainted away, but Aladdin, snatching the lamp, said boldly, Fetch me something to eat. The genie returned with a silver bowl, twelve silver plates containing rich meats, two silver cups, and two bottles of wine. Aladdin's mother, when she came to herself, said, Whence comes this splendid feast? Ask not, but eat, replied Aladdin. So they sat at breakfast till it was dinner time, and Aladdin told his mother about the lamp. She begged him to sell it, and have nothing to do with devils. No, said Aladdin, since chance hath made us aware of its virtues, we will use it, and the ring likewise, which I shall always wear on my finger. When they had eaten all the genie had brought, Aladdin sold one of the silver plates, and so on until none were left. He then had recourse to the genie, who gave him another set of plates, and thus they lived many years. One day Aladdin heard an order from the Sultan, proclaimed that everyone was to stay at home and close his shutters, while the princess, his daughter, went to and from the bath. Aladdin was seized by a desire to see her face, which was very difficult, as she always went veiled. He hid himself behind the door of the bath and peeped through a chink. The princess lifted her veil as she went in, and looked so beautiful that Aladdin fell in love with her at first sight. He went home so changed that his mother was frightened. He told her he loved the princess so deeply he could not live without her, and meant to ask her in marriage of her father. His mother on hearing this burst out laughing, but Aladdin at last prevailed upon her to go before the Sultan and carry his request. She fetched a napkin and laid in it the magic fruits from the enchanted garden, which sparkled and shone like the most beautiful jewels. She took these with her to please the Sultan, and set out, trusting in the lamp. The Grand Vizier and the Lords of the Council had just gone in as she entered the hall and placed herself in front of the Sultan. He, however, took no notice of her. She went every day for a week, and stood in the same place. When the council broke up on the sixth day, the sultan said to his vizier, I see a certain woman in the audience chamber every day carrying something in a napkin. Call her next time, that I may find out what she wants. Next day, at a sign from the vizier, she went up to the foot of the throne, and remained kneeling, until the sultan said to her, Rise, good woman, and tell me what you want. She hesitated, so the sultan sent away all but the vizier. 
and bade her speak freely, promising to forgive her beforehand for anything she might say. She then told him of her son's violent love for the princess. I prayed him to forget her, she said, but in vain. He threatened to do some desperate deed if I refused to go and ask your majesty for the hand of the princess. Now I pray you to forgive not me alone, but my son Aladdin. The sultan asked her kindly what she had in the napkin, whereupon she unfolded the jewels and presented them. He was thunderstruck, and turning to the vizier said, What sayest thou? Ought I not to bestow the princess on one who values her at such a price? The vizier, who wanted her for his own son, begged the sultan to withhold her for three months, in the course of which he hoped his son could contrive to make him a richer present. The sultan granted this, and told Aladdin's mother that, though he consented to the marriage, she must not appear before him again for three months. Aladdin waited patiently for nearly three months, but after two had elapsed, his mother, going into the city to buy oil, found everyone rejoicing, and asked what was going on. "'Do you not know,' was the answer, "'that the son of the Grand Vizier is to marry the Sultan's daughter to-night?' Breathless, she ran and told Aladdin, who was overwhelmed at first, but presently bethought him of the lamp. He rubbed it, and the genie appeared, saying, "'What is thy will?' Aladdin replied, the sultan, as thou knowest, has broken his promise to me, and the vizier's son is to have the princess. My command is that to-night you bring hither the bride and bridegroom. Master, I obey, said the genie. Aladdin then went to his chamber, where, sure enough, at midnight, the genie transported the bed containing the vizier's son and the princess. Take this new married man, he said, and put him outside in the coal, and return at daybreak. Whereupon the genie took the vizier's son out of bed, leaving Aladdin with the princess. Fear nothing, Aladdin said to her, you are my wife, promised to me by your unjust father, and no harm will come to you. The princess was too frightened to speak, and passed the most miserable night of her life while Aladdin lay down beside her and slept soundly. At the appointed hour, the genie fetched in the shivering bridegroom, laid him in his place, and transported the bed back to the palace. Presently the sultan came to wish his daughter good morning. The unhappy vizier's son jumped up and hid himself, while the princess would not say a word, and was very sorrowful. The sultan sent her mother to her, who said, How comes it, child, that you will not speak to your father? What has happened? The princess sighed deeply, and at last told her mother how during the night the bed had been carried into some strange house, and what had passed there. Her mother did not believe her in the least, and bade her rise and consider it an idle dream. The following night exactly the same thing happened and next morning, on the princess's refusing to speak, the sultan threatened to cut off her head. She then confessed all, bidding him ask the vizier's son if it were not so. The sultan told the vizier to ask his son, who owned the truth, adding that, dearly as he loved the princess, he had rather die than go through another such fearful night, and wish to be separated from her. His wish was granted, and there was an end of feasting and rejoicing. When the three months were over, Aladdin sent his mother to remind the sultan of his promise. She stood in the same place as before, and the sultan, who had forgotten Aladdin, at once remembered him, and sent for her. On seeing her poverty, the sultan felt less inclined than ever to keep his word, and asked his vizier's advice, who counselled him, to set so high a value on the princess that no man living would come up to it. The sultan then turned to Aladdin's mother, saying, Good woman, our sultan must remember his promises, and I will remember mine, but your son must first send me forty basins of gold brimful of jewels, carried by forty black slaves, 
led by as many white ones, splendidly dressed. Tell him that I await his answer. The mother of Aladdin bowed low and went home, thinking all was lost. She gave Aladdin the message, adding, He may wait long enough for your answer. Not so long, mother, as you think, her son replied. I will do a great deal more than that for the princess. He summoned the genie, and in a few moments the eighty slaves arrived and filled up the small house and garden. Aladdin made them to set out to the palace, two by two, followed by his mother. They were so richly dressed, with such splendid jewels, that every one crowded to see them, and the basins of gold they carried on their heads. They entered the palace, and, after kneeling before the sultan, stood in a half-circle round the throne, with their arms crossed, while Aladdin's mother presented them to the sultan. He hesitated no longer, but said, "'Good woman, return and tell your son that I wait for him with open arms.' She lost no time in telling Aladdin, bidding him make haste. But Aladdin first called the genie. "'I want a scented bath,' he said, "'a richly embroidered habit, a horse surpassing the sultan's, and twenty slaves to attend me. Beside this, six slaves, beautifully dressed, to wait on my mother, and lastly, ten thousand pieces of gold in ten purses. No sooner said than done. Aladdin mounted his horse and passed through the streets, the slaves strewing gold as they went. Those who had played with him in his childhood knew him not. He had grown so handsome. When the sultan saw him, he came down from his throne, embraced him, and led him into a hall where a feast was spread, intending to marry him to the princess that very day. But Aladdin refused, saying, I must build a palace fit for her, and took his leave. Once home, he said to the genie, Build me a palace of the finest marble, set with jasper, agate, and other precious stones. In the middle you shall build me a large hall, with a dome, its four walls of massy gold and silver, each side having six windows, whose lattices, all except one, which is to be left unfinished, must be set with diamonds and rubies. There must be stables and horses and grooms and slaves. Go and see about it. The palace was finished the next day, and the genie carried him there, and showed him all his orders faithfully carried out, even to the laying of a velvet carpet from Aladdin's palace to the sultan's. Aladdin's mother then dressed herself carefully, and walked to the palace with her slaves, while he followed her on horseback. The sultan sent musicians with trumpets and cymbals to meet them, so that the air resounded with music and cheers. She was taken to the princess, who saluted her and treated her with great honour. At night the princess said good-bye to her father, and set out on the carpet for Aladdin's palace, with his mother at her side, and followed by the hundred slaves. She was charmed at the sight of Aladdin, who ran to receive her. Princess, he said, blame your beauty for my boldness, if I have displeased you. She told him that, having seen him, she willingly obeyed her father in this matter. After the wedding had taken place, Aladdin led her into the hall, where a feast was spread, and she supped with him, after which they danced till midnight. Next day Aladdin invited the sultan to see the palace. On entering the hall with the four-and-twenty windows with their rubies, diamonds, and emeralds, he cried, It is a world's wonder! There is only one thing that surprises me. Was it by accident that one window was left unfinished? No, sir, by design, returned Aladdin. I wish your majesty to have the glory of finishing this palace. The sultan was pleased, and sent for the best jewellers in the city. He showed them the unfinished window, and bade them fit it up like the others. Sir, replied their spokesman, we cannot find jewels enough. The sultan had his own fetched, which they soon used, but to no purpose, for in a month's time the work was not half done. Aladdin, knowing that their task was vain, bade them undo their work and carry the jewels back, and the genie finished the window at his command. 
The sultan was surprised to receive his jewels again, and visited Aladdin, who showed him the window finished. The sultan embraced him, the envious vizier meanwhile, hinting that it was the work of enchantment. Aladdin had won the hearts of the people by his gentle bearing. He was made captain of the sultan's armies, and won several battles for him but remained as courteous as before, and lived thus in peace and contentment for several years. But far away in Africa the magician remembered Aladdin, and by his magic arts discovered that Aladdin, instead of perishing miserably in the cave, had escaped and had married a princess, with whom he was living in great honour and wealth. He knew that the poor tailor's son could only have accomplished this by means of the lamp, and travelled night and day till he reached the capital of China, bent on Aladdin's ruin. As he passed through the town, he heard people talking everywhere about a marvellous palace. "'Forgive my ignorance,' he asked. "'What is the palace you speak of?' "'Have you not heard of Prince Aladdin's palace?' was the reply. "'The greatest wonder in the world. "'I will direct you if you have a mind to see it.' The magician thanked him who spoke, and, having seen the palace, knew that it had been raised by the genie of the lamp, and became half mad with rage. He determined to get hold of the lamp, and again plunge Aladdin into the deepest poverty. Unluckily, Aladdin had gone a-hunting for eight days, which gave the magician plenty of time. He bought a dozen lamps, put them into a basket, and went to the palace, crying, New lamps for old, followed by a jeering crowd. The princess, sitting in the hall of four and twenty windows, sent a slave to find out what the noise was about, who came back laughing, so that the princess scolded her. Madam, replied the slave, who can help laughing to see an old fool offering to exchange fine new lamps for old ones? Another slave, hearing this, said, There is an old one on the cornice, there, which he can have. Now this was the magic lamp, which Aladdin had left there, as he could not take it out hunting with him. The princess, not knowing its value, laughingly bade the slave take it and make the exchange. She went and said to the magician, Give me a new lamp for this. He snatched it and bade the slave take her choice amid the jeers of the crowd. Little he cared, but left off crying his lamps, and went out of the city gates to a lonely place, where he remained till nightfall, when he pulled out the lamp and rubbed it. The genie appeared, and at the magician's command, carried him, together with the palace and the princess in it, to a lonely place in Africa. Next morning the sultan looked out of the window towards Aladdin's palace, and rubbed his eyes, for it was gone. He sent for the vizier, and asked what had become of the palace. The vizier looked out too, and was lost in astonishment. He again put it down to enchantment, and this time the sultan believed him, and sent thirty men on horseback to fetch Aladdin back in chains. They met him riding home bound him, and forced him to go with them on foot. The people, however, who loved him, followed, armed to see that he came to no harm. He was carried before the sultan, who ordered the executioner to cut off his head. The executioner made Aladdin kneel down, bandaged his eyes, and raised his scimitar to strike. In that instant, the vizier, who saw that the crowd had forced their way into the courtyard, and was scaling the walls to rescue Aladdin, called to the executioner to stay his hand. The people, indeed, looked so threatening that the sultan gave way and ordered Aladdin to be unbound and pardoned him in the sight of the crowd. Aladdin now begged to know what he had done. "'False wretch!' said the sultan. "'Come hither!' and showed him from the window the place where his palace had stood." Aladdin was so amazed he could not say a word. "'Where is your palace and my daughter?' demanded the sultan. "'For the first I am not so deeply concerned, but my daughter I must have, 
and you must find her or lose your head. Aladdin begged for forty days in which to find her, promising, if he failed, to return to suffer death at the Sultan's pleasure. His prayer was granted, and he went forth sadly from the Sultan's presence. For three days he wandered about like a madman, asking everyone what had become of his palace. But they only laughed and pitied him. He came to the banks of a river, and knelt down to say his prayers, before throwing himself in. In doing so, he rubbed the ring he still wore. The genie he had seen in the cave appeared, and asked his will. "'Save my life, genie,' said Aladdin, "'and bring my palace back.' "'That is not in my power,' said the genie. "'I am only the slave of the ring. "'You must ask him of the lamp.' "'Even so,' said Aladdin, "'but thou canst take me to the place, "'and set me down under my dear wife's window.' He at once found himself in Africa, under the window of the princess, and fell asleep out of sheer weariness. He was awakened by the singing of the birds, and his heart was lighter. He saw plainly that all his misfortunes were owing to the loss of the lamp, and vainly wondered who had robbed him of it. That morning the princess rose earlier than she had done since she had been carried into Africa by the magician, whose company she was forced to endure once a day. She, however, treated him so harshly that he dared not live there altogether. As she was dressing, one of her women looked out and saw Aladdin. The princess ran and opened the window, and at the noise she made, Aladdin looked up. She called to him to come to her, and great was the joy of these lovers at seeing each other again. After he had kissed her, Aladdin said, I beg of you, princess, in God's name, before we speak of anything else, for your own sake and mine, tell me what has become of an old lamp I left on the cornice in the hall of four and twenty windows when I went a-hunting. Alas, she said, I am the innocent cause of our sorrows, and told him of the exchange of the lamp. Now I know, cried Aladdin, that we have to thank the African magician for this. Where is the lamp? He carries it about with him, said the princess. I know, for he pulled it out of his breast to show me. He wished me to break my faith with you and marry him, saying that you were beheaded by my father's command. He is forever speaking ill of you, but I only reply by my tears. If I persist... I doubt not, but he will use violence. Aladdin comforted her, and left her for a while. He changed clothes with the first person he met in the town, and having bought a certain powder, returned to the princess, who let him in by a little side door. Put on your most beautiful dress, he said to her, and receive the magician with smiles, leading him to believe that you have forgotten me. Invite him to sup with you, and say you wish to taste the wine of his country. He will go for some, and while he is gone, I will tell you what to do. She listened carefully to Aladdin, and when he left her, arrayed herself gaily for the first time since she left China. She put on a girdle and headdress of diamonds, and seeing in a glass that she was more beautiful than ever, received the magician saying to his great amazement, I have made up my mind that Aladdin is dead, and that all my tears will not bring him back to me, so I am resolved to mourn no more, and have therefore invited you to sup with me. But I am tired of the wines of China, and would fain taste those of Africa. The magician flew to his cellar, and the princess put the powder Aladdin had given her in her cup. When he returned, she asked him to drink her health in the wine of Africa, handing him her cup in exchange for his, as a sign she was reconciled to him. Before drinking, the magician made her a speech in praise of her beauty, but the princess cut him short, saying, Let us drink first, and you shall say what you will afterwards. 
she set her cup to her lips and kept it there, while the magician drained his to the dregs and fell back lifeless. The princess then opened the door to Aladdin and flung her arms round his neck. But Aladdin went to the dead magician, took the lamp out of his vest, and bade the genie carry the palace and all in it back to China. This was done, and the princess in her chamber felt only two little shocks, and little thought she was home again. The sultan, who was sitting in his closet, mourning for his lost daughter, happened to look up and rubbed his eyes, for there stood the palace as before. He hastened thither, and Aladdin received him in the hall of the four-and-twenty windows, with the princess at his side. Aladdin told him what had happened, and showed him the dead body of the magician, that he might believe. A ten days' feast was proclaimed, and it seemed as if Aladdin might now live the rest of his life in peace, but it was not meant to be. The African magician had a younger brother, who was, if possible, more wicked and more cunning than himself. He travelled to China to avenge his brother's death, and went to visit a pious woman called Fatima, thinking she might be of use to him. He entered her cell, and clapped a dagger to her breast, telling her to rise and do his bidding on pain of death. He changed clothes with her, coloured her face like hers, put on her veil, and murdered her, that she might tell no tales. Then he went towards the palace of Aladdin, and all the people, thinking he was the holy woman, gathered round him, kissing his hands, and begging his blessing. When he got to the palace, there was such a noise going on round him, that the princess bade her slave look out the window and ask what was the matter. The slave said it was the holy woman, curing people by her touch of their ailments, whereupon the princess, who had long desired to see Fatima, sent for her. On coming to the princess, the magician offered up a prayer for her health and prosperity. When he had done, the princess made him sit by her, and begged him to stay with her always. The false Fatima, who wished for nothing better, consented, but kept his veil down for fear of discovery. The princess showed him the hall, and asked him what he thought of it. "'It is truly beautiful,' said the false Fatima. "'In my mind it wants but one thing.' "'And what is that?' said the princess. "'If only a rox's egg,' he replied were hung up from the middle of this dome. It would be the wonder of the world. After this the princess could think of nothing but the rox's egg, and when Aladdin returned from hunting he found her in a very ill humour. He begged to know what was amiss, and she told him that all her pleasure in the hall was spoilt for want of a rox's egg hanging from the dome. If that is all, replied Aladdin, you shall soon be happy. He left her and rubbed the lamp, and when the genie appeared, commanded him to bring a rox's egg. The genie gave such a loud and terrible shriek that the hall shook. Wretch! he cried. Is it not enough that I have done everything for you? But you must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome. You and your wife and your palace deserve to be burnt to ashes but that this request does not come from you, but from the brother of the African magician, whom you destroyed. He is now in your palace, disguised as the holy woman, whom he murdered. He it was who put that wish in your wife's head. Take care of yourself, for he means to kill you. So saying, the genie disappeared. Aladdin went back to the princess, saying his head ached and requesting that the holy Fatima should be fetched to lay her hands on it. But when the magician came near, Aladdin, seizing his dagger, pierced him to the heart. "'What have you done?' cried the princess. "'You have killed the holy woman!' "'Not so,' replied Aladdin, but a wicked magician, and told her of how she had been deceived. After this, Aladdin and his wife lived in peace. He succeeded the sultan, when he died, and reigned for many years, leaving behind him a long line of kings. End of 
Aladdin and the Magic Lamp At Manjala's Inn by I. L. Karajale This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Antonia Violetta Mandu. Recorded by the Public Library of Bukovina, I. L. Sbiera, Suchava, Romania. At Manjala's Inn by I. L. Karajale. It took a quarter of an hour to reach Manjala's Inn. From there to Upper Popesht was about nine miles. At an easy pace that meant one hour and a half. A good hack, if they gave it oats at the inn, and three quarters of an hour rest, could do it comfortably. That is to say, one quarter of an hour and three quarters of an hour made one hour, on to Popesht, was one hour and a half, that made two and a half. It was past seven already. At ten o'clock at latest, I should be with Polkovnik Yordake. I was rather late. I ought to have started earlier, but, after all, he expected me. I was turning this over in my mind when I saw in the distance a good gunshot length away a great deal of light coming from Majola's inn, for it still retained that name. It was now really Madame Majola's inn. The husband died some five years ago. What a capable woman! How she had worked! How she had improved the place! They were on the point of selling the inn while her husband was alive. Since then she had paid off the debts and have repaired the house. Moreover, she has built a flight of stone steps, and everyone said she had a good sum of money too. Some surmised that she had found a hidden treasure, others that she had dealings with the supernatural. Once some robbers attempted an attack upon her. They tried to force the door. One of them, the strongest, a man like a bull, viewed it, the axe, but when he tried to strike he fell to the ground. They quickly raised him up. He was dead. His brother tried to speak, but could not. He was dumb. There were four of them. They hoisted the dead man on to his brother's back. The other two took his feet, that they might carry him off to bury him somewhere away. As they left the courtyard of the inn, Madame Manjola began to scream from the window, Thieves! And in front of her there suddenly appeared the sub-prefect with numerous men and four mounted soldiers. The official shouted, Who is there? Two of the robbers escaped. The dumb man remained behind with his dead brother on his back. Now, what happened at the trial? Everyone knew the mute had been able to speak. How could anyone doubt but that the dumb man was shaming? They beat him till he was crazy to try and make his speech come back, but in vain. Since then, the lads had lost all desire to attack the place. While all this was passing through my mind, I arrived at the inn. A number of carts were waiting in the yard of the inn. Some were carrying timber down the valley, others maize up the hill. It was a raw autumn evening. The drivers were warming themselves round the fire. It was the light from the latter that had been visible so far away. An ostler took my horse in charge to give him some oats in the stable. I entered the tap room where a good many men were drinking, while two sleepily, sleepy gypsies, one with a lute and one with a zither, 
were playing monotonously in a corner. I was hungry and cold. The damp had pierced through me. Where's your mistress? I asked the boy behind the bar, by the kitchen fire. It ought to be warmer there, I said, and passed through the vestibule out of the tap room into the kitchen. It was very clean in the kitchen, and the smell was not like that in the tap room of fur and boots and damp shoes. There was a smell of new-made bread. Madame Manjala was looking after the oven. Well met, Mrs. Margala. Welcome, Mr. Fonica. Is there a chance of getting anything to eat? Up to midnight even, for respectable people like yourself. Mrs. Margala quickly gave orders to one of the servants to lay a table in the next room, and then, going up to the hearth, said, Look, choose for yourself. Mrs. Margala was beautiful, well-built, and fascinating, that I knew, but never since I had known her, and I had known her for a long time, for I had passed Manjola's inn many a time when my dead father was alive, as the road to the town led by it. Had she appeared to me more attractive? I was young, smart, and daring, much more daring than smart. I came up on her left side as she was bending over the hearth and took her by the waist. With my hand I took hold of her right arm, which was as hard as iron, and the devil tempted me to give it a pinch. Have you got nothing to do? said the woman, looking at me askance. But I, to cover my blunder, said, what marvellous eyes you have, Mrs. Margala. Don't write and flatter me. You had better tell me what to give you. Give me, give me, give me yourself. <laughs> really. Indeed, you have marvellous eyes, Mrs. Margala, sighing. Supposing your father-in-law heard you. What father-in-law? What do you mean by that? You think, because you hide yourself under your cap, that nobody sees what you do. Aren't you going to Pokovnik Yordake to engage yourself to his eldest daughter? Come, don't look at me like that. Go into the next room to dinner. I had seen many clean and quiet rooms in the course of my life, but a room like that one. What a bed, what curtains, what walls, what a ceiling! all white as milk, and the lampshade, and all those crochet things of every kind and shape, and the warmth, like being under a hand's wing, and the smell of apples and quinces. I was about to seat myself at the table, when, according to a habit I had acquired in my childhood, I turned to bow towards the east. I looked carefully round all along the walls, not an icon to be seen. What are you looking for? said Mrs. Margola. Your icons. Where do you keep them? There's the icons. They only breed worms and wood lice. What a cleanly woman. I seated myself at the table and crossed myself as I was my cousin when suddenly there was a yell. It appeared that with the heel of my boot I had trodden upon an old tomcat which was under the table. Mrs. Margala jumped up quickly and undid the outside door. The injured cat made a bound outside while the cold air rushed into the extinguished the lamp. She groped about for the matches. I searched here, she searched there. We met face to face in the dark. I, very bold, took her in my arms and began to kiss her. The lady now resisted, now yielded. Her cheeks were burning, her mouth was cold, soft and unfluttered about her ears. At last the servant arrived with a tray with vines. 
on it and a light. We must have hunted some time for the matches, for the chimney of the lamp was quite cold. I lit it again. What excellent food! Hot bread, roast duck with cabbage, boiled veal sausages and wine, and Turkish coffee, and laughter and conversation. Good luck to Mrs. Margiola. After coffee, she said to the old maid servant, Tell them to bring out a half bottle of muscadine. That wonderful old wine! A sort of languor seized me every limb. I sat on one side of the bed, draining the last amber drops from my glass, and smoking a cigarette, while through the cold of tobacco smoke I watched Mrs. Margiola, who sat on a chair opposite, rolling cigarettes for me. I said, Indeed, Mrs. Margiola, you have marvellous eyes. Do you know what? What? Would it trouble you to make me another cup of coffee? Not quite so sweet as this. How she laughed! When the maid brought the coffee pot, she said, Madam, you sit talking here. You don't know what it is like outside. What is it? A high wind has got up and there is a storm coming. I jumped to my feet and looked at the time. It was nearly a quarter to eleven. Instead of half an hour, I had been at the inn for two hours and a half. That's what comes when one begins to talk. Let someone get my horse. Who? The ostlers have gone to bed. I will go to the stable myself. They have bewitched you with Polkovniku, said the lady, with a ripple of laughter, as she bared my passage through the door. I put her gently on on one side, and went out on to the veranda. It was indeed a dreadful night. The driver's fires had died down. Men and animals were sleeping on the straw, lying one against the other on the ground while above them the wind howled wildly. There is a great storm, said Mrs. Margiola, shuddering as she seized me firmly by the hand. You are mad to start in such a weather. Stay the night here. Start at daybreak tomorrow. That's impossible. I forcibly withdraw my hand. I proceeded to the stables. With great difficulty, I roused on Osler and found out my horse. I tightened the girth, fastened the horse to the steps, and then went to the room to bid my hostess good night. The woman, immersed in thought, was sitting on the bed with my cap in her hand. She was turning and twisting it about. How much have I to pay? I asked. You can pay me. When you come back, replied my hostess, looking intently into the lining of my cap. And then she rose to her feet and held it out to me. I took the cap and put it on my head, rather on one side. I said, looking straight into the woman's eyes, which seemed to shine most strangely, I kiss your eyes, Mrs. Margara. A safe journey to you. I threw myself into the saddle. The old servant opened the gate for me, and out I rode. Resting my left hand on my horse's flank, I turned to my head round. Over the top of the fence could be seen the open door of the room, and in the opening I was outlined the white figure of the woman with her hand above her arched eyebrows. I rode at a slow pace, whistling a gay song to myself, until I turned the corner of the fence to get to the road, when the picture was hidden from my sight. I said to myself, Here I'll go, and the cross to myself. At that moment I plainly heard the banging of a door and the mew of a cat. My hostess, unable to see me any longer, 
went hastily back into the worms and doubtless caught the cat in the door. That damn cat! It was always getting on the people's feet. I had gone a good part of the way. The storm increased and shook me in the saddle. Overhead, cloud after cloud hurried across the valley and above the hill, as though in fear of chastisement from one high. Now massed together, now disappears, they revealed at long intervals the pale light of the waning moon. The damp cold pierced through me. I felt it paralyzing legs and arms. As I rode, with head bent to avoid the buffeting of the wind, I began to feel pains in my back. My forehead and temples were burning, and there was a drumming in my ears. I have drunk too much, I thought to myself, and I pushed my cap on to the nape of my neck and raised my forehead towards the sky. But the wheeling clouds made me dizzy. I felt a burning sensation below my left rib. I drew in a deep breath of cold air, and the knife seemed to drive out through my chest. I tucked my chin down again. My cap seemed to squeeze my head like a vice. I took it off and placed it on the point of my saddle. I felt ill. It was foolish of me to have started. Everybody would be asleep at Polkovnik Yordaki. They would not have expected me. They would not have imagined that I should be silly enough to start in such a weather. I urged on my horse, which staggered as though it too had been drinking. The wind had sunk. The rain had ceased. It was misty. It began to grow dark and to diesel. I put my cap on again. Suddenly, the blood began to beat against my temples. The horse was quite done, exhausted by the violence of the wind. I dug my heels into him. I gave him a cut with my whip. The animal took a few hasty paces, then snorted and stood still on the spot as though he had seen some unexpected obstacle in front of him. I looked. I really saw, a few paces in front of the horse, a teeny creature, jumping and skipping. An animal? What could it be? A wild beast? It was a very small one. I put my hand to my revolver. Then I clearly had the bleed of a kid. I urged on the horse as much as I could. It turned strained round and started to go back. A few paces forward, and again it stood snorting. The kid again. The horse stopped. It turned round. I gave it some cuts with the whip and tightened the curb. It moved forward. A few paces. The kid again. The clouds has disappeared. One could see now as clearly as possible. It was a little black kid. Now it trotted forward. Now it turned back. It flung out its hoofs and finally reared itself on to its hind legs and ran about with its little beard in front and its head ready to butt, making wonderful bounds and playing every kind of wild antique. I cut off my horse, which would not advance for the world, and took the reins up short. I bent down to the ground. Come, come, I called the kid, with my hand as though I wanted to give it some bran. The kid approached, jumping continually. The horse snorted madly. It tried to break away. I went down on my knees, but I held the horse firmly. The kid came close up to my hand. It was a dear little black buck which allowed itself to be patted and lifted up. I put it in the bag on the right side among some clothes. At that moment the horse was convulsed and shook in every limb as though in its death 
throws. I remounted. The horse started off like a mad thing. For some time it went like the wind over ditches, over mole hills, over bushes, without my being able to stop it, without my knowing where I was, or being able to guess where it was taking me. During this wild chase, when at any moment I might have broken my neck, with body frozen and hand on fire, I thought of the comfortable heaven I had so stupidly left. Why? Mrs. Margola would have given me her room, otherwise she would not have invited me. The kid was moving in the bag, trying to make itself more comfortable. I looked towards it. With its intelligent little head stuck out of the bag, it was peering wisely at me. The thought of another pair of eyes flashed through my mind. What a fool I had been! The horse stumbled. I stopped him forcibly. He tried to move on again, but sank to his knees. Suddenly, through an opening of the cloth, appeared the winning moon shining on the side of a slope. The sight of it struck me all of a hip. It was in front of me. There were then two moons in the sky. I was going uphill. The moon ought to be behind me. I turned my head quickly to see the real moon. I had missed my way. I was going downhill. Where was I? I looked ahead a maze filled with uncut stalks. Behind me lay open field. I crossed myself, and pressing my horse with my very legs, I tried to help him rise. Just then I felt a violent blow on my right foot, a cry. I had kicked the kid. I put my hand quickly into the bag. The bag was empty. I had lost the kid on the road. The horse rose, shaking its head, as though it were giddy. I reared on to its legs, hurled itself on one side and threw me to the other. Finally, he tore away like a thing possessed and disappeared into the darkness. By the time I got up, much shaken, I could hear rustle among the maze close by came the sound of a man's voice saying clearly hi hi may heaven remove you who is there i called an honest man who gergi which gergi not gergi natrut who watches the maize fields aren't you coming this way yes here i come and the figure of man became visible among the maze. May I ask, Brother Georgi, where we are at this moment? I have missed my way in the storm. Where do you want to go to? To Upper Popest. Ha! <laughs> to Pokovniku or Dake. That's it. In that case, you have not missed your road. You will have some trouble to get to Popest. You are only at Herkulesht here. At Herkulesht, I said joyfully. Then I am close to Manjola's inn. Look there. We are at the back of the stables. Come and show me the way to that. I don't just go and break my neck. I had been wandering about for four hours. A few steps brought us to the inn. Mrs. Margola's room was lit up and shadows moved across the curtain. Who knew what other, wiser travel had enjoyed that bed? I should have to rest content with some bench by the kitchen fire. But what luck! As I knocked, someone heard me. The old maid servant hurried to open to me. As I entered, I stumbled over something soft on the threshold. The kid! Did you ever? It was my hostess kid. 
at the two end of the room and went and lay down comfortably under the bed. What was I to say? Did the woman know I had returned or had she got up very early? The bed was made. Mrs. Margala, so much I was able to say. Wishing to thank God that I had escaped with my life, I started to raise my right hand to my head. The lady quickly seized my hand and pulling it down, drew me with all her strength into her arms. I can still see that room. What a bed, what curtains, what walls, what a ceiling, all white as milk, and the lampshade and all those crochet things of every kind and shape, and the warmth like being under a hand's wing, and the small of apples and quinces. I should have stayed a long time at Manjola's inn if my father-in-law, Polkovnik Yordaki, God forgive him, had not fetched me away by force. Three times I fled from him before the marriage and returned to the inn until the old man, who at all costs wanted me for a son-in-law, set men to catch me and take me gagged. To a little monastery in the mountains. Forty days of fasting, ten flexions and prayers. I left it quite repentant. I got engaged and I married. Only lately, one clear winter's night, while my father-in-law and I were sitting talking together, as is the custom of the country, in front of a flagon of wine, we heard from a prefect who arrived from the town where he had been making some purchases that during the day there had been a big fire at Herkulesht. Marjola's inn had been burned to the ground, burying poor Mrs. Margola, who thus met her end under a gigantic funeral pyre. And so, at the last, the sorceress was thrown on the bonfire, said my father-in-law, laughing. And I began to tell the above story for at least the hundredth time. Pokovnik maintained, among the other things, that the lady put a charm into the lining of my cap, and that the kid and the cat were one and the same. Maybe, I said. She was the devil. Listen to me. She may have been, I replied. But if that it is so, then the devil, it seems, led to the good. At first it seemed to be good to catch one, but later it sees where it leads on. How do you know all this? It's not your business, replied the old man. That's another story. End of Manjola's Inn by I. L. Karajale. Bliss by Catherine Mansfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Mulligan. Bliss by Catherine Mansfield. Although Bertha Young was thirty, she still had moments like this when she wanted to run instead of walk, to take dancing steps on and off the pavement, to bowl a hoop, to throw something up in the air and catch it again, or to stand still and laugh at nothing, at nothing simply. What can you do if you are thirty, and turning the corner of your own street, you are overcome suddenly by a feeling of 
bliss, absolute bliss, as if though you'd suddenly swallowed a bright piece of that late afternoon sun, and it burned in your bosom, sending out a little shower of sparks into every particle, into every finger and toe. Oh, is there no way you can express it without being drunk and disorderly? How idiotic civilization is! Why be given a body if you have to keep it shut up in a case like a rare, rare fiddle? No, that about the fiddle is not quite what I mean, she thought, running up the steps and feeling in her bag for the key. She'd forgotten it, as usual, and rattling the letter-box. It's not what I mean, because— Thank you, Mary. She went into the hall. Is nurse back? Yes, ma'am. And has the fruit come? Yes, ma'am, everything's come. Bring the fruit up to the dining-room, will you? I'll arrange it before I go upstairs. It was dusky in the dining-room and quite chilly. But all the same Bertha threw off her coat. She could not bear the tight clasp of it another moment, and the cold air fell on her arms. But in her bosom there was still that bright, glowing place, the shower of little sparks coming from it. It was almost unbearable. She hardly dared to breathe for fear of fanning it higher, and yet she breathed deeply, deeply. She hardly dared to look into the court mirror, but she did look, and it gave her back a woman, radiant, with a smiling, trembling lips, with big, dark eyes and an air of listening, waiting for something divine to happen, that she knew must happen, infallibly. Mary brought in the fruit on a tray, and with it a glass bowl and a blue dish, very lovely, with a strange sheen on it, as if though it had been dipped in milk. "'Shall I turn on the light, ma'am?' "'No, thank you. I can see quite well.' There were tangerines and apples stained with a strawberry pink, some yellow pears, smooth as silk, some white grapes covered with a silver bloom, and a big cluster of purple ones. These last she had bought to turn in with the new dining-room carpet. Yes, that did sound rather far-fetched and absurd, but it was really why she had bought them. She had a thought in the shop. I must have some purple ones to bring the carpet up to the table, and it had seemed quite sent at the time. When she had finished with them and had made two pyramids of these bright round shapes, she stood away from the table to get the effect, and it really was most curious, for the dark table seemed to melt into the dusky light, and the glass dish and the blue bowl to float in the air. This, of course, in the present mood, was so incredibly beautiful. She began to laugh. No, no, I'm, I'm getting hysterical. And she seized her bag and coat and ran upstairs to the nursery. Nurse sat at a low table, giving little Bee her supper after her bath. The baby had on a white flannel gown and a blue woolen jacket, and her dark, fine hair was brushed up into a funny little peak. She looked up when she saw her mother and began to jump. "'Now, my lovely, eat it up like a good girl,' said Nurse, setting her lips in a way that Bertha knew, that meant she had come into the nursery at another wrong moment. "'Has she been good, Nanny?' "'She's been a little sweet all the afternoon,' whispered Nanny. "'We went to the park, and I sat down on a chair, and took her out of the pram, and a big dog came along and put its head on my knee, and she clutched its ear, tucked it. "'Oh, you should have seen her.' Bertha wanted to ask if it wasn't rather dangerous to let her clutch at a strange dog's ear. But she did not dare to. She stood watching them, her hands by her side, like the poor little girl in front of the rich little girl with the doll. The baby looked up at her again, stared, and then smiled so charmingly that Bertha couldn't help crying, "'Oh, Nanny, do let me finish giving her her supper while you put the bath things away.' "'Well, ma'am, she oughtn't to be changed hands while she's eating,' said Nanny, still whispering. "'It unsettles her. It's very likely to upset her.' "'How absurd it was!' Why have a baby, if it has to be kept, not in a case like a rare, rare fiddle, but in another woman's arms? Oh, I must, said she. 
Barry thundered to Nanny handed her over. Now don't excite her after her supper. You know you do, ma'am, and I have such a time with her after. Thank heaven. Nanny went out of the room with the bath towels. Now I've got you to myself, my little precious, said Bertha as the baby leaned against her. She ate delightfully, holding up her lips for the spoon and then waving her hands. Sometimes she wouldn't let the spoon go, and sometimes, just as Bertha had filled it, she waved it away to the four winds. When the soup was finished, Bertha turned round to the fire. You're nice! You're very nice! said she, kissing a warm baby. I'm fond of you. I like you. And indeed, she loved little bee so much. Her neck as she bent forward, her exquisite toes as they shone transparent in the firelight, that all her feeling of bliss came back again, and again she didn't know how to express it, what to do with it. "'You're wanted on the telephone,' said Nanny, coming back in triumph and seizing her little bee. Down she flew. It was Harry. "'Oh, is it you, Burr? Look here, I'll be late.' I'll take a taxi and come along as quickly as I can, but get dinner put back ten minutes, will you, all right? Yes, perfectly. Oh, Harry! Yes? What had she to say? She had nothing to say. She only wanted to get in touch with him for a moment. She couldn't absurdly cry, Hasn't it been a divine day? What is it? crept out the little voice. Nothing. Entendu, said Bertha and hung up the receiver, thinking how more than idiotic civilization was. They had people coming to dinner. The Norman Knights, a very sound couple. He was about to start a theatre, and she was awfully keen on interior decoration. A young man, Eddie Warren, who had just published a little book of poems, and whom everybody was asking to dine, and a find of Bertha's, called Pearl Fulton. What Miss Fulton did, Bertha didn't know. They had met at a club, and Bertha had fallen in love with her, as she always did fall in love with beautiful women who had something strange about them. The provoking thing was that, though they had been about it together and met a number of times and really talked, Bertha couldn't yet make her out. Up to a certain point, Miss Fulton was really wonderfully frank, but the certain point wasn't there, and beyond that she would not go. Was there anything beyond it? Harry said no, voted a dullish, and called like all blonde women, with a touch, perhaps, of anemia of the brain. But Bertha wouldn't agree with him, not yet, at any rate. No, the way she has of sitting with her head a little on one side, and smiling— has something behind it, Harry, and I must find out what that something is. Most likely it's a good stomach, answered Harry. He made a point of catching Bertha's heels with replies of that kind. Liver frozen, my dear girl, or pure flatulence, or kidney disease, and so on. For some strange reason Bertha liked this, and almost admired it in him very much. She went into the drawing-room and lighted the fire, then, picking up the cushions one by one that Mary had disposed so carefully, she threw them back onto the chairs and the couches. That made all the difference. The room came alive at once. As she was about to throw the last one, she surprised herself by suddenly hugging it to her, passionately, passionately. But it did not put out the fire in her bosom. Oh, on the contrary! The windows of the drawing-room opened on to a balcony overlooking the garden. At the far end, against the wall, there was a tall, slender pear-tree in fullest richest bloom. It stood perfect, as if they would be calmed against a jade green sky. Bertha couldn't help feeling, even from this distance, that it had not a single bud or a faded petal. Down below, in the garden-beds, the red and yellow tulips, heavy with flowers, seemed to lean upon the dusk. A grey cat, dragging its belly, crept across the lawn, and the black one, its shadow, trailed after. The sight of them, so intent and so quick, gave Bertha a curious shiver. 
what creepy things cats are she stammered and she turned away from the window and began walking up and down oh how strong the jonquil smelt in the warm room too strong oh no and yet as though overcome she flung down on a couch and pressed her hands to her eyes i'm too happy too happy she murmured and she seemed to see on her eyelids the lovely pear tree with its wide open blossoms as a symbol of her own life really really she had everything she was young harry and she were as much in love as ever and they got on together splendidly and were really good pals she had an adorable baby they didn't have to worry about money they have this absolutely satisfactory housing garden and friends modern thrilling friends writers and painters and poets or people keen on social questions just the kind of friends if they wanted and then there were books and there was music and she had found a wonderful little dressmaker they were going abroad in the summer and their new cook made the most superb omelettes i'm absurd absurd she sat up but she felt quite dizzy quite drunk it must have been the spring yes it was the spring now she was so tired she could not drag herself upstairs to dress a white dress a string of jade beads green shoes and stockings it wasn't intentional she had a thought of this scheme hours before she stood at the drawing-room window her paddles rustled softly into the hall and she kissed Miss Norman Knight, who was taking off the most amusing orange coat with a procession of black monkeys around to hem and up the front. Why? Why? Why is the middle class so stodgy, so utterly without sense of humour? My dear, it's only by a fluke that I am here at all. Norman being the protective fluke, for my darling monkey so upset the train that it rose to a man and simply ate me with its eyes did laugh, was it amused, that I should have laughed. No, just stared and bored me through and through. But the cream of it was, said Norman, pressing a large tortoise-shell-rimmed monocle into his eye, you don't mind me telling this face, do you? At the home and among their friends they called each other face and mug. The cream of it was when she, being full-fed, turned to the woman beside her and said, Haven't you ever seen a monkey before? oh yes mrs norman knight joined in the laughter wasn't that too absolutely creamy and the funnier thing still was that now her coat was off she did look like a very intelligent monkey who had even made that yellow silk dress out of scraped banana skins and rambaree rings they were like little dangling nuts this is a sad sad fall said mug pausing in front of little bee's perambulator when the perambulator comes into the hall and he waved the rest of the quotation away this is a sad sad fall said mark pausing in front of little bee's perambulator when the perambulator comes into the hall and he waved the rest of the quotation away the bell rang it was lean pale eddie warren as usual in a state of acute distress it is the right house isn't it he pleaded oh i think so i hope so said bertha brightly i have had such a dreadful experience with the taximan it was most sinister i couldn't get him to stop the more i knocked and called the faster he went and in the moonlight this bizarre figure with a flattened head crouching over the little wheel he shuddered taking off an immense white silk scarf bertha noticed that her socks were white too most charming but how dreadful she cried yes it really was said eddie following her into the drawing-room i saw myself driving through the eternity in a timeless taxi he knew the norman knights in fact he was going to write a play for n k when the theatre scheme came off well warren how's the play said norman knight dropping his monocle and giving his eye a moment in which to rise to the surface before it was screwed down again and mrs norman knight oh mr warren what happy socks i am so glad you like them said he staring at his feet they seem to have got so much whiter since the moon rose and he turned his lean sorrowful young face to bertha 
There is a moon, you know. She wanted to cry. I'm sure there is, often, often. He really was a most attractive person. But so was Faye crouched before the fire in her banana skins, and so was Mark smoking a cigarette, and saying as he flicked the ash, Why doth the bridegroom tarry? There he is now. Bang went the front door open and shut. Harry shouted, Hello, you people, down in five minutes. And they heard him swarm up the stairs. Bertha couldn't help smiling. She knew how he loved doing things at high pressure. What, after all, did the next five minutes matter? But he would pretend to himself that they mattered beyond measure. And then he would make a great point of coming into the drawing-room extravagantly cool and collected. Harry had such a zest for life. Oh, how she appreciated it in him! And his passion for fighting, for seeking in everything that came up against him another test of his power and of his courage. That, too, she understood, even when it made him just occasionally to other people who didn't know him well, a little ridiculous, perhaps. But there were moments when he rushed into battle where no battle was. She talked and laughed, and positively forgot until he had come in, just as she had imagined, that Pearl Fulton had not turned up. "'I wonder if Miss Fulton has forgotten.' "'I expect so,' said Harry. "'Is she on the phone?' "'Ah, there's a taxi now.' And Bertha smiled with that little air of proprietorship that she always assumed while her women finds were new and mysterious. "'She lives in taxis.' "'She'll run too fat if she does,' said Harry, coolly ringing the bell for dinner. "'Frightful danger for blonde women.' "'Harry, don't!' warned Bertha, laughing up at him. Came another tiny moment while they waited, laughing and talking, just a trifle too much at their ease, a trifle too unaware. And then Miss Fulton, all in silver, with a silver fillet binding her pale blonde hair, came in smiling, her hat a little on one side. "'Am I late?' "'No, not at all,' said Bertha. "'Come along!' and she took her arm, and they moved into the dining-room. What was there in the touch of that cool arm that could fan, fan, start blazing, blazing the fire of bliss that Bertha did not know what to do with? Miss Fulton did not look at her, but then she seldom did look at people directly. Her heavy eyelids lay upon her eyes, and the strange half-smile came and went upon her lips as though she lived by listening rather than seeing. But Bertha knew suddenly, as if the longest, the most intimate look had passed between them, as if they had said to each other, You too, that Pal Fulting, staring the beautiful red soup in the grey plate, was feeling just what she was feeling. And the others, Bays and Mug, Eddie and Harry, the spoons rising and falling, dabbing their lips with their napkins, crumbling bread, fiddling with the forks and glasses, and talking. I met her at the Alpha Show, the weirdest little person. She not only cut off her hair, but she seemed to have taken a dreadfully good snap off her legs and arms and her neck and her poor little nose as well. Isn't she very lié with my load? The man who wrote a laugh and false teeth? He wants to write a play for me, one act. One man decides to commit suicide, gives all the reasons why he should and why he shouldn't, and just as he made up his mind either to do it or not to do it, curtain. Not half a bad idea. What's he going to call it? Stomach trouble? I think I have come across the same idea in a little French review, quite unknown in England. No, they didn't share it. There were dears. Dears, and she loved having him there at the table, and giving them delicious food and wine. In fact, she longed to tell them how delightful they were, and what decorative group they made, how they seemed to set one another off, and how they reminded her of a play by Chekhov. Harry was enjoying his dinner. It was part of his, well, not his nature exactly, and certainly not his pose, his something or rather to talk about food and to glory in his shameless passion for the white flesh of the lobster and the green of pistachio's ices green and cold like the eyelids of egyptian dancers 
when he looked up at her and said, Bertha, this is a very admirable souffle. She almost could have wept with childlike pleasure. Oh, why did you feel so tender towards the whole world tonight? Everything was good, was right. All that happened seemed to fill again her bringing cup of bliss. And still, the back of her mind, there was a pear tree. It would be silver now in the light of poor dear Reddy's moon. Silver as Miss Fulton, who sat there turning a tangerine in the slender fingers that were so pale a light seemed to come from them. What she simply couldn't make out, what was miraculous, was how she should have guessed Miss Fulton's mood so exactly and so instantly. For she never doubted for a moment that she was right. And yet, what had she to go on? Less than nothing. I believe this does happen very, very rarely between women, never between men, thought Bertha. But while I am making the coffee in the drawing-room, perhaps she will give a sign. What she meant by that she did not know, and what would happen after that she could not imagine. While she thought like this, she saw herself talking and laughing. She had to talk because of her desire to laugh. I must laugh or die. But when she noticed Face's funny little habit of tucking something down the front of her bodies, as if she kept tiny secret hordes of nuts there too, Bertha had to dig her nails into her hands so as not to laugh too much. It was over at last, and— "'Come and see my new coffee machine,' said Bertha. "'We only have a new coffee machine once a fortnight,' said Harry. Face took her arm this time. Miss Fulton bent her head and followed after. The fire had died down in the drawing-room to a red, flickering nest of baby phoenixes, said Face. Don't turn up the light for a moment, it is so lovely. And down she crouched by the fire again. She was always cold, without her little red flannel jacket, of course, thought Bertha. At that moment Miss Fulton gave the sign. Have you a garden? said the cool, sleepy voice. This was so exquisite on her part that all Bertha could do was to obey. She crossed the room, pulled the curtains apart, and opened those long windows. There, she breathed, and the two women stood side by side, looking at the slender flowering tree. Although it was so still, it seemed like the flame of a candle to stretch up, to point, to quiver in the bright air, to grow taller as they gazed almost to touch the rim of the round silver moon. How long did they stand there, both, as it were, caught in that circle of unearthly light, understanding each other perfectly, creatures of another world, and wondering what they were to do in this one, with all this blissful treasure that burned in their bosoms and dropped in silver flowers from their hair and hands? Forever, for a moment? And did Miss Fulton murmur, Yes, just that? Or did Bertha dream it? Then the light was snapped on, and Face made the coffee, and Harry said, My dear Mrs. Knight, don't ask me about my baby. I never see her. I shan't feel the slightest interest in her until she has a lover. And Mark took his eye out of the conservatory for a moment, and then put it on the glass again. And Eddie Warren drank his coffee, and set down the cup with a face of anguish, as if though he had drunk and seemed the spider. "'What I want to do is to give the young man a show. I believe Londy is simply teeming with first-job unwritten plays. What I want to say to him is, here's the theatre, fire ahead.' "'You know, my dear, I'm going to decorate a room for the Jacob Nathans.' Oh, I'm so tempted to do a fried fish scheme with the backs of the chairs shaped like frying pans and lovely chipped potatoes embroidered all over the curtains. The trouble with our young writing men is that they are still too romantic. You can't put out to sea without being seasick and wanting a basin. Well, why won't they have the courage of those basins? A dreadful poem about a girl who was violated by a beggar without a nose in a little wood. 
Miss Fulton sank into the lowest, deepest chair, and Harry handed round the cigarette. From the way he stood in front of her, shaking the silver box and saying abruptly, Egyptian, Turkish, Virginian, they're all mixed up. Bertie realized that she not only bored him, he really disliked her. And she decided from the way Miss Fulton said, No, thank you, I won't smoke. That she felt it too, and was hurt. Oh, Harry, don't dislike her. You're quite wrong about her. She's wonderful, wonderful. And besides, how can you feel so differently about someone who means so much to me? I shall try to tell you when we are in bed tonight what has been happening, what she and I have shared. At those last words, something strange and almost terrifying darted into Bertha's mind. And this something blind and smiling whispered to her, Soon these people will go. The house will be quiet. Quiet. The lights will be out. And you and he will be alone together in the dark room. The warm bed. She jumped from her chair and ran over to the piano. What a pity someone does not play! She cried. What a pity somebody does not play! For the first time in her life, Bertha Young desired her husband. Oh, she'd loved him. She'd been in love with him, of course, in every other way, but just not in that way. And equally, of course, she'd understood it, that he was different. They discussed it so often. It had worried her dreadfully at first to find that she was so cold. But after a time, it had not seemed to matter. They were so frank with each other, such good pals. That was the best of being modern. But now, ardently, ardently, the words ached in her ardent body. Was this what that feeling of bliss had been leading up to? But then, my dear, said Mrs. Norman Knight, you know our shame. We are victims of time and train. We live in Hampstead. It's been so nice. I'll come with you into the hall, said Bertha. I loved having you, but you must not miss last train. That's so awful, isn't it? I have a whisky night before you go called Harry. No, thanks, old chap. Bertha could squeeze his hand for that as she shook it. Good night, good bye, she cried from the top steps, feeling that the self of hers was taking leave of them forever. As she got back into the drawing room, the others were on the move. There you can go part of the way in my taxi. I shall be so thankful not to have to face another drive alone after my dreadful experience. We can get a taxi at the rank just at the end of the street. You won't have to walk more than a few yards. That's a comfort. I'll go and put on my coat. Miss Fulton moved towards the hall, and Bertha was following, and Harry almost pushed past. Let me help you. Bertha knew he was repenting his rudeness. She let him go. What a boy he was in some ways. So impulsive, so simple and Eddie and she were left by the fire. I wonder if you have seen Bilk's new poem called Table d'Hôte, said Eddie softly. It's so wonderful. In the last anthology, have you got a copy? I'd so like to show it to you. It begins with an incredibly beautiful line. Why must it always be tomato soup? Yes, said Bertha, and she moved noiselessly to a table opposite the drawing-room door, and Eddie glided noiselessly after her. She picked up the little book and gave it to him. They had not made a sound. While he looked it up, she turned her head towards the hall, and she saw Harry with Miss Fulton's coat in his arms, and Miss Fulton with her back turned to him and her head bent. He tossed the coat away, put his hands on her shoulders, and turned her violently to him. His lips said, I adore you, and Miss Fulton laid her moonbeam fingers on his cheeks and smiled a sleepy smile. Harry's nostrils quivered. His lips curled back in a hideous grin, while he whispered, Tomorrow, and with her eyelids, Miss Fulton said, Yes. Here it is, said Eddie. Why must it always be tomato soup? It's deeply true, don't you feel? Tomato soup is so dreadfully eternal. If you prefer, 
said Harry's voice very loud from the hall. I can phone you a cab to come to the door. Oh, no, it's not necessary, said Miss Fulton. She came up to Bertha and gave her the slender fingers to hold. Good-bye. Thank you so much. Good-bye, said Bertha. Miss Fulton held her hand a moment longer. You are lovely, Petri, she murmured, and then she was gone, with Eddie following like the black cat following the grey cat. I'll shut up shop, said Harry, extravagantly cool and collected. Your lovely pear tree. Pear tree. Pear tree. Bess, I simply ran over to the long windows. Oh, what's going to happen now? she cried. But the pear tree was as lovely as ever, and as full of flower, and as still. End of Bliss Recording by Julie van Malchem. The Cook's Wedding by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vlad Shuilov The Cook's Wedding by Anton Chekhov Translated by Constance Garnett Grisha, a fat solemn little person of seven, was standing by the kitchen door, listening and peeping through the keyhole. In the kitchen something extraordinary, and in his opinion never seen before, was taking place. A big, thick-set, a red-haired peasant, with a beard and a drop of perspiration on his nose, wearing a cabman's full coat, was sitting at the kitchen table, on which they chopped the meat and sliced the onions. He was balancing a saucer on the five fingers of his right hand and drinking tea out of it, and crunching sugar so loudly that it sent a shiver down Grisha's back. Aksenia Stepanovna, the old nurse, was sitting on the dirty stool facing him, and she too was drinking tea, her face was grave, though at the same time it beamed with a kind of triumph. Pelagia, the cook, was busy at the stove, and was apparently trying to hide her face. And on her face Grisha saw a regular illumination, it was burning and shifting through every shade of color, beginning with crimson purple and ending with deathly white. She was continually catching hold of knives, forks, bits of wood and rags, with trembling hands, moving, grumbling to herself, making a clatter, but in reality doing nothing. She did not once glance at the table at which they were drinking tea, and to the question put to her by the nurse, she grave jerky, sullen answers without turning her face. Help yourself, Danila Semyonitch, the nurse urged him hospitably. Why do you keep on with tea and nothing but tea? You should have a drop of vodka. A nurse put before the visitor a bottle of vodka and a wine glass, while her face wore a very willy expression. I never touch it. No, said the cabman, declining. Don't press me, Aksenia Stepanovna. What a man! A cabman and not drink. A bachelor cannot get on without drinking. Help yourself. The cabman looked askness at the bottle, then at Norse Willie face, and his own face assumed an expression no less cunning as much as to say, You won't catch me, you old witch. I don't drink, please excuse me. Such a weakness does not do in our calling. A man who works at a trade may drink, for he sits at home. But we cabmen are always in a view of the public, aren't we? If one goes into a pot house, one finds one's horse gone. If one takes a drop too much, it is worse still. Before you know where you are, you will fall asleep, or slip off the box. That's where it is. And how much do you make a date, Danila Semyonitch? That's a courting. One day you will have a fare for three rubles, and another day you will come back to the yard without a farthing. The days are very different. Nowadays our business is no good. There are lots and lots of cabmen, as you know. Hey, dear, and folks are partially nowadays and always contriving to go by tram. And yet, thank God, 
I have nothing to complain of. I have plenty to eat and good clothes to wear. And we could even provide well for another. The cabman stole a glance at Pelagia, if it were to the liking. Grisha did not hear what was said further. His mamma came to the door and sent him to the nursery to learn his lessons. Go and learn your lesson. It's not your business to listen here. When Grisha reached the nursery, he put my own book in front of him, but he did not get on with his reading. All that he had just seen and heard aroused a multitude of questions in his mind. The cook's going to be married, he thought. Strange. I don't understand what people get married for. Mama was married to Papa, cousin Verochka to Pavel Andreich. But one might be married to Papa and Pavel Andreich, after all. They have gold watch chains and nice suits. Their boots are always polished. But to marry the dreadful cabman with a red nose and felt boots? Fee! And why it is Norse wants poor Pelagia to be married? When the visitor had gone out of the kitchen, Pelagia appeared and began clearing away. Her agitation still persisted, her face was red and looked scared. She scarcely touched the floor with the broom and swept every corner five times over. She lingered for a long time in the room where Mama was sitting. She was evidently oppressed by her isolation and she was longing to express herself, to share her impression with someone to open her heart. He's gone, she muttered, seeing that Mama would not begin the conversation. One can see he is a good man, said Mama, not taking her eyes off her sewing. Sober and steady. I declare I won't marry him, mistress, Pelagie cried suddenly, flushing crimson. I declare I won't. Don't be silly. You are not a child. It's a serious step. You must think it over thoroughly. It's no use talking nonsense. Do you like him? What an idea, mistress, cried Pelagie, abashed. They say such things that... My goodness! She should say she doesn't like him, thought Grisha. What an affected creature you are! Do you like him? But he is old, mistress! Think of something else! Norse flew out at her from the next room. He has not reached his fortieth year, and what do you want a young man for? Handsome is as handsome does. Marry him, and that's all about it. I swear I won't! squealed Pelagia. You are talking nonsense. What sort of rascal do you want? Anyone else would have bowed down to his feet. And you declare you won't marry him? You want to be always winking at the postman and tutors. The tutors that used to come to Grishka, mistress? She was never tried of making eyes at him. Oh, the shameless hussy! Have you ever seen this Danilo before? Mama asked Pelagia. How could I have seen him? I set eyes on him today, for the first time. Aksenia picked him up and brought him along. The accursed devil! And where has he come from for my undoing? At dinner, when Pelagia was handing the dishes, everyone looked into her face and teased her about the cabman. She turned fearfully red and went off into a forced giggle. Must be shameful to get married, thought Grishka. Terribly shameful. All the dishes were too salt and blood oozed from the half-raw chickens, and to cap it all, plates and knives kept dropping out of Pelagia's hands during dinner, a thought from a shelf that had given away. But no one said a word of blame to her, as they all understood the state of her feelings. Only once Papa flicked his table napkin angrily and said to Mama, What do you want to be getting them all married for? What business is it of yours? Let them get married of themselves if they want to. After dinner, neighboring cooks and maid servants kept flitting into the kitchen, and there was a sound of whispering till the late evening. How they had sent it out the matchmaking, God knows. When Grishka woke in the night, he heard his nurse and the cook whispering together in the nursery. Nurse was talking persuasively while the cook alternately sobbed and giggled. When he fell asleep after this, Grishka dreamed of Pelagia being carried off by Chernomor and a witch. Next day there was a calm. 
The life of the kitchen went on its accustomed way as so the cabman did not exist. Only from time to time Norse put on her new shawl, assumed a solemn and austere air, and went off somewhere for an hour or two, obviously to conduct negotiations. Pelagia did not see the cabman, and when his name was mentioned, she flushed up and cried, May he be thrice damned, as though I should be thinking of him. Tfu! In the evening, Mama went into the kitchen, while Norse and Pelagia were seriously mincing something and said, You can marry him, of course. That's your business. But I must tell you, Pelagia, that he cannot live here. You know, I don't like to have anyone sitting in the kitchen. Mind now remember, and I can't let you slip out. Goodness knows, what an idea, mistress, shrieked the cook. Why do you keep throwing him at, up at me? Plug you take him. He is a regular course. Confound him. Glancing one Sunday morning into the kitchen, Grishka was struck dumb with amazement. The kitchen was crammed full of people. There were cooks from the whole courtyard, the porter, two policemen, and non-commissioned officer with good conduct stripes, and the boy Filka. This Filka was generally hanging about the laundry, playing with the dogs. Now he was combed and washed and was holding an icon in a tin foil setting. Pelagia was standing in the middle of the kitchen in a new cotton dress with a flower on her head. Beside her stood the cabman. The happy pair were red in the face and perspiring and blinking with embarrassment. Well, I fancy it is time, said the non-commissioned officer after a prolonged silence. Pelagie's face worked all over and she began blubbering. The soldier took a big loaf from the table, stood beside Norse and began blessing the couple. The cabman went up to the soldier, flooped down on his knees and gave a smacking kiss on his hand. He did the same before nurse. Pelagia followed him mechanically, and she too bowed down to the ground. At last the outer door was opened, there was a whiff of white mist, and the whole party flocked noisily out of the kitchen into the yard. Poor thing, poor thing, thought Grishka, hearing the sobs of the cook. Where have they taken her? Why don't papa and mamma protect her? After the wedding there was singing and concertina playing in the laundry till late evening. Mama was cross all the evening because Norse smelt of vodka and owing to the wedding there was no one to heat the samovar. Pelagia had not come back by the time Grisha went to bed. The poor thing is crying somewhere in the dark, he thought, while the cabman is saying to her, shut up. Next morning the cook was in the kitchen again, the cabman came in for a minute, he thanked Mama and glancing sternly at Pelagia said, Will you look after her, madam? Be a father and a mother to her, and you too, Aksenia Stepanovna, don't forsake her, see that everything is as it should be, without any nonsense, and also, madam, if you would Kindly advance me five rubles of your wages. I have to buy a new horse collar. Again a problem for Grisha. Pelagia was living in freedom, doing as she liked and not having to account to anyone for her actions. And all at once, for no sort of reason, a stranger turns up, who has somehow accrued rights over her conduct and her property. Grisha was distressed. He longed passionately almost to tears to comfort this victim as he supposed of man's injustice. Picking out the very biggest apple in the storeroom, he stole into the kitchen, slipped it into Pelagie's hand and darted headlong away. End of the Cook's Wedding Recording by Vlad Shulov. The Devil and Tom Walker by Washington Irving this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A few miles from Boston in Massachusetts, there is a deep inlet winding several miles into the interior of the country from Charles Bay and terminating in a thickly wooded swamp or morass. 
On one side of this inlet is a beautiful dark grove. On the opposite side, the land rises abruptly from the water's edge into a high ridge, on which grow a few scattered oaks of great age and immense size. Under one of these gigantic trees, according to old stories, there was a great amount of treasure buried by Kidd the pirate. The inlet allowed a facility to bring the money in a boat secretly and at night to the very foot of the hill. The elevation of the place permitted a good lookout to be kept that no one was at hand, while the remarkable trees formed good landmarks by which the place might easily be found again. The old stories add, moreover, that the devil presided at the hiding of the money and took it under his guardianship. But this, it is well known, he always does with buried treasure, particularly when it has been ill-gotten. Be that as it may, Kidd never returned to recover his wealth, being shortly after seized at Boston, sent out to England, and there hanged for a pirate. About the year 1727, just at the time that earthquakes were prevalent in New England, and shook many tall sinners down upon their knees, there lived near this place a meagre, miserly fellow of the name of Tom Walker. He had a wife as miserly as himself. They were so miserly that they even conspired to cheat each other. Whatever the woman could lay hands on, she hid away. A hen could not cackle, but she was on the alert to secure the new laid egg. Her husband was continually prying about to detect her secret hoards, and many and fierce were the conflicts that took place about what ought to have been common property. They lived in a forlorn-looking house that stood alone and had an air of starvation. A few straggling savin trees, emblems of sterility, grew near it. No smoke ever curled from its chimney, no traveller stopped at its door. A miserable horse, whose ribs were as articulate as the bars of a gridiron, stalked about a field, where a thin carpet of moss, scarcely covering the ragged beds of pudding-stone, tantalized and balked his hunger, and sometimes he would lean his head over the fence, look piteously at the passer-by, and seemed to petition deliverance from this land of famine. The house and its inmates had altogether a bad name. Tom's wife was a tall termagant, fierce of temper, loud of tongue, and strong of arm. Her voice was often heard in wordy warfare with her husband, and his face sometimes showed signs that their conflicts were not confined to words. No one ventured, however, to interfere between them. The lonely wayfarer shrank within himself at the horrid clamour and clapper-clawing, eyed the den of discord askance, and hurried on his way, rejoicing, if a bachelor, in his celibacy. One day that Tom Walker had been to a distant part of the neighbourhood, he took what he considered a shortcut homeward, through the swamp, like most shortcuts, it was an ill-chosen route. The swamp was thickly grown with great gloomy pines and hemlocks, some of them ninety feet high, which made it dark at noonday, and a retreat for all the owls of the neighbourhood. It was full of pits and quagmires, partly covered with weeds and mosses, where the green surface often betrayed the traveller into a gulf of black, smothering mud. There were also dark and stagnant pools, the abodes of the tadpole, the bullfrog, and the water-snake, where the trunks of pines and hemlocks lay half-drowned, half-rotting, looking like alligators sleeping in the mire. Tom had long been picking his way cautiously through this treacherous forest, stepping from tuft to tuft of rushes and roots, which afforded precarious footholds among deep sloughs or pacing carefully like a cat along the prostrate trunks of trees, startled now and then by the sudden screaming of the bittern or the quacking of a wild duck rising on the wing from some solitary pool. At length 
he arrived at a firm piece of ground which ran like a peninsula into the deep bosom of the swamp. It had been one of the strongholds of the Indians during their wars with the first colonists. Here they had thrown up a kind of fort which they had looked upon as almost impregnable, and had used as a place of refuge for their squaws and children. Nothing remained of the old Indian fort but a few embankments, gradually sinking to the level of the surrounding earth, and already overgrown in part by oaks and other forest trees, the foliage of which formed a contrast to the dark pines and hemlocks of the swamps. It was late in the dusk of evening when Tom Walker reached the old fort, and he paused there a while to rest himself. Any one but he would have felt unwilling to linger in this lonely, melancholy place, for the common people had a bad opinion of it, from the stories handed down from the times of the Indian wars, when it was asserted that the savages held incantations here and made sacrifices to the evil spirit. Tom Walker, however, was not a man to be troubled with any fears of the kind. He reposed himself for some time on the trunk of a fallen hemlock, listening to the boding cry of the tree-toad, and delving with his walking-stick into a mound of black mould at his feet. As he turned up the soil unconsciously, his staff struck against something hard. He raked it out of the vegetable mould, and lo, a cloven skull, with an Indian tomahawk buried deep in it, lay before him. The rust on the weapon showed the time that had elapsed since this death blow had been given. It was a dreary memento of the fierce struggle that had taken place in this last foothold of the Indian warriors. Huh! said Tom Walker, as he gave it a kick to shake the dirt from it. Let the skull alone, said a gruff voice. Tom lifted up his eyes, and beheld a great black man seated directly opposite him on the stump of a tree. He was exceedingly surprised, having neither heard nor seen any one approach, and he was still more perplexed on observing, as well as the gathering gloom would permit, that the stranger was neither negro nor Indian. It is true, he was dressed in a rude Indian garb, and had a red belt or sash swathed around his body, but his face was neither black nor copper colour, but swarthy and dingy, and begrimed with soot, as if he had been accustomed to toil among fires and forges. He had a shock of coarse black hair that stood out from his head in all directions, and bore an axe on his shoulder. He scowled for a moment at Tom with a pair of great red eyes. "'What are you doing on my grounds?' said the black man, with a hoarse, growling voice. "'Your grounds?' said Tom, with a sneer. "'No more your grounds than mine. They belong to Deacon Peabody.' "'Deacon Peabody be damned, <laughs> as I flatter myself he will be, if he does not look more to his own sins, and less to those of his neighbours. Look yonder, and see how Deacon Peabody is faring.' Tom looked in the direction that the stranger pointed, and beheld one of the great trees, fair and flourishing without, but rotten at the core, and saw that it had been nearly hewn through, so that the first high wind was likely to blow it down. On the bark of the tree was scored the name of Deacon Peabody, an eminent man who had waxed wealthy by driving shrewd bargains with the Indians. He now looked around, and found most of the tall trees marked with the name of some great man of the colony, and all more or less scored by the axe. The one on which he had been seated, and which had evidently just been hewn down, bore the name of Crowin's shield, and he recollected a mighty rich man of that name, who made a vulgar display of wealth, which it was whispered he had acquired by buccaneering. "'He's just ready for burning,' said the black man with a growl of triumph. "'You see, I'm likely to have a good stock of firewood for winter.' "'But what right have you?' 
said Tom, to cut down Deacon Peabody's timber. The right of a prior claim, said the other. This woodland belonged to me long before one of your white-faced race put foot upon the soil. And pray, who are you, if I may be so bold, said Tom. Oh, I go by various names. I'm the wild huntsman in some countries, the black miner in others. In this neighborhood, I'm known by the name of the black woodsman. I am he to whom the red man consecrated this spot, and in honor of whom they now and then roasted a white man by way of sweet-smelling sacrifice. Since the red men have been exterminated by you white savages, I amuse myself by presiding at the persecution of Quakers and Anabaptists. I'm the great patron and prompter of slave dealers and the grand master of the Salem witches. The upshot of all which is that, if I mistake not, said Tom sturdily, you are he commonly called Old Scratch. The same at your service, replied the black man with a half-civil nod. Such was the opening of this interview, according to the old story, though it has almost too familiar an air to be credited. One would think that to meet with such a singular personage in this wild, lonely place would have shaken any man's nerve, but Tom was a hard-minded fellow, not easily daunted, and he had lived so long with a termagant wife that he did not even fear the devil. It is said that after this commencement they had a long and earnest conversation together. As Tom returned homeward, the black man told him of great sums of money buried by Kid the pirate under the oak trees on the high ridge not far from the morass. All of these were under his command and protected by his power, so that none could find them but such as propitiated his favour. These he offered to place within Tom Walker's reach, having conceived an especial kindness for him, but they were to be had only on certain conditions. What these conditions were may be easily surmised, though Tom never disclosed them publicly. They must have been very hard, for he required time to think of them, and he was not a man to stick at trifles when money was in view. When they reached the edge of the swamp, the stranger paused. "'What proof have I that all you've been telling me is true?' said Tom. "'There's my signature,' said the black man, pressing his finger on Tom's forehead. So saying, he turned off among the thickets of the swamp, and seemed, as Tom said, to go down, down, down into the earth until nothing but his head and shoulders could be seen, and so on until he totally disappeared. When Tom reached home, he found the black print of a finger burned, as it were, into his forehead, which nothing could obliterate. The first news his wife had to tell him was the sudden death of Absalom Crowinshield, the rich buccaneer. It was announced in the papers, with the usual flourish, that a great man had fallen in Israel. Tom recollected the tree which his black friend had just hewn down, and which was ready for burning. Ah, let the freebooter roast, said Tom. Who cares? He now felt convinced that all he had heard and seen was no illusion. He was not prone to let his wife into his confidences, but as this was an uneasy secret, he willingly shared it with her. All her avarice was awakened at the mention of hidden gold, and she urged her husband to comply with the black man's terms and secure what would make them wealthy for life. However Tom might have felt disposed to sell himself to the devil, he was determined not to do so to oblige his wife, so he flatly refused, out of the mere spirit of contradiction. Many and bitter were the quarrels they had on the subject, 
but the more she talked, the more resolute was Tom not to be damned to please her. At length she determined to drive the bargain on her own account, and if she succeeded, to keep all the gain to herself. Being of the same fearless temper as her husband, she set off for the old Indian fort towards the close of a summer's day. She was many hours absent. When she came back, she was reserved and sullen in her replies. She spoke something of a black man whom she had met about twilight, hewing at the root of a tall tree. He was sulky, however, and would not come to terms. She was to go again with a propitiatory offering, but what it was she forbore to say. The next evening she set off again for the swamp with her apron heavily laden. Tom waited and waited for her, but in vain. Midnight came, but she did not make her appearance. Morning, noon, night returned, but still she did not come. Tom now grew uneasy for her safety, especially as he found she had carried off in her apron the silver teapot and spoons, and every portable article of value. Another night elapsed, another morning came, but no wife. In a word, she was never heard of more. What was her real fate nobody knows, in consequence of so many pretending to know. It is one of those facts which has become confounded by a variety of historians. Some asserted that she lost her way among the tangled mazes of the swamp and sank into some pit or slough. Others, more uncharitable, hinted that she had eloped with the household booty and made off to some other province, while others surmised that the tempter had decoyed her into a dismal quagmire on the top of which her hat was found lying. In confirmation of this, it was said, a great black man with an axe on his shoulder was seen late that very evening coming out of the swamp, carrying a bundle tied in a check apron, with an air of surly triumph. The most current and probable story, however, observes that Tom Walker grew so anxious about the fate of his wife and his property that he set out at length to seek both of them at the Indian fort. During a long summer's afternoon he searched among the gloomy place, but no wife was to be seen. He called her name repeatedly, but she was nowhere to be heard. The bittern alone responded to his voice as he flew screaming by, or the bullfrog croaked dolefully from a neighboring pool. At length, it is said, just in the brown hour of twilight, when the owls begin to hoot and the bats to flit about, his attention was attracted by the clamour of carrion crows hovering about a cypress tree. He looked up and beheld a bundle tied in a check apron and hanging in the branches of the tree, with a great vulture perched hard by, as if keeping watch upon it. He leaped with joy, for he recognized his wife's apron, and supposed it to contain the household valuables. "'Let us get hold of the property,' said he consolingly to himself, "'and we will endeavor to do without the woman.' As he scrambled up the tree, the vulture spread its wide wings and sailed off, screaming into the deep shadows of the forest. Tom seized the checked apron, but woeful sight! found nothing but a heart and liver tied up in it. Such, according to this most authentic old story, was all that was to be found of Tom's wife. She had probably attempted to deal with the black man as she had been accustomed to deal with her husband, but though a female scold is generally considered a match for the devil, yet in this instance she appears to have had the worst of it. She must have died game, however, for it is said Tom noticed many prints of cloven feet deeply stamped around the tree, and found handfuls of hair that looked as if they had been plucked from the coarse black shock of the woodsman. Tom knew his wife's prowess by experience. He shrugged his shoulders as he looked at the signs of fierce clapper-clawing. Egad, said he to himself. Old Scratch must have had a tough time of it. 
Tom consoled himself for the loss of his property, with the loss of his wife, for he was a man of fortitude. He even felt something like gratitude towards the black woodsman, who he considered had done him a kindness. He sought, therefore, to cultivate a further acquaintance with him, but for some time without success. The old blacklegs played shy, for, whatever people may think, he is not always to be had for the calling. He knows how to play his cards when pretty sure of his game. At length, it is said, when delay had whetted Tom's eagerness to the quick, and prepared him to agree to anything rather than not gain the promised treasure, he met the black man one evening in his usual woodsman's dress, with his axe on his shoulder, sauntering along the swamp and humming a tune. He affected to receive Tom's advances with great indifference, made brief replies, and went on humming his tune. By degrees, however, Tom brought him to business, and they began to haggle about the terms on which the former was to have the pirate's treasure. There was one condition which need not be mentioned. Being generally understood in all cases where the devil grants favours, but there were others about which, though of less importance, he was inflexibly obstinate. He insisted that the money found, through his means, should be employed in his service. He proposed, therefore, that Tom should employ it in the black traffic, that is to say, that he should fit out a slave ship. This, however, Tom resolutely refused. He was bad enough in all conscience, but the devil himself could not tempt him to turn slave-trader. Finding Tom so squeamish on this point, he did not insist upon it, but proposed instead that he should turn usurer, the devil being extremely anxious for the increase of usurers, looking upon them as his peculiar people. For this no objections were made, for it was just to Tom's taste. "'You shall open a broker's shop in Boston next month,' said the black man. "'I'll do it tomorrow, if you wish,' said Tom Walker. "'You shall lend money at two per cent a month.' "'Egad, I'll charge four, replied Tom Walker. "'You shall extort bonds, foreclose mortgages, drive the merchants to bankruptcy.' "'I'll drive them to the devil,' cried Tom Walker." "'You are the usurer for my money,' said the black legs with delight. "'When will you want the rhino?' "'This very night.' "'Done,' said the devil. "'Done,' said Tom Walker. So they shook hands and struck a bargain. A few days' time saw Tom Walker seated behind his desk in a counting-house in Boston. His reputation for a ready-moneyed man who would lend money out for a good consideration, soon spread abroad. Everybody remembers the time of Governor Belcher, when money was particularly scarce. It was a time of paper credit. The country had been deluged with government bills. The famous land bank had been established. There had been a rage for speculating. The people had run mad with schemes for new settlements, for building cities in the wilderness. Land jobbers went about with maps of grants and townships and Eldorados, lying nobody knew where, but which everybody was ready to purchase. In a word, the great speculating fever, which breaks out every now and then in the country, had raged to an alarming degree, and everybody was dreaming of making sudden fortunes from nothing. As usual, the fever had subsided, the dream had gone off, and the imaginary fortunes with it. The patients were left in doleful plight, and the whole country resounded with the consequent cry of hard times. At this propitious time of public distress did Tom Walker set up as usurer in Boston. His door was soon thronged by customers, the needy and adventurous, the gambling speculator, the dreaming land jobber, the thriftless tradesman, the merchant with cracked credit. In short, everyone driven to raise money by desperate means and desperate sacrifices hurried to Tom Walker. Thus, 
Tom was the universal friend to the needy, and acted like a friend in need. Uh, that is to say, he always exacted good pay and security. In proportion to the distress of the applicant was the hardness of his terms. He accumulated bonds and mortgages, gradually squeezed his customers closer and closer, and sent them at length dry as a sponge from his door. In this way he made money hand over hand, became a rich and mighty man, and exalted his cocked hat upon change. He built himself, as usual, a vast house out of ostentation, but left the greater part of it unfinished and unfurnished out of parsimony. He even set up a carriage in the fullness of his vain glory, though he nearly starved the horses which drew it and as the ungreased wheels groaned and screeched on the axle-trees, you would have thought you heard the souls of the poor debtors he was squeezing. As Tom waxed old, however, he grew thoughtful. Having secured the good things of this world, he began to feel anxious about those of the next. He thought with regret of the bargain he had made with his black friend, and set his wits to work to cheat him out of the conditions. He became, therefore, all of a sudden, a violent church-goer. He prayed loudly and strenuously, as if heaven were to be taken by force of lungs. Indeed, one might always tell when he had sinned most during the week by the clamour of his Sunday devotion. The quiet Christians, who had been modestly and steadfastly travelling Zionward, were struck with self-approach at seeing themselves so suddenly outstripped in their career by this new-made convert. Tom was as rigid in religious as in money matters. He was a stern supervisor and censurer of his neighbours, and seemed to think every sin entered up to their account became a credit on his own side of the page. He even talked of the expediency of reviving the persecution of Quakers and Anabaptists. In a word, Tom's zeal became as notorious as his riches. Still, in spite of all this strenuous attention to forms, Tom had a lurking dread that the devil, after all, would have his due. That he might not be taken unawares, therefore, it is said he always carried a small Bible in his coat pocket. He had also a great folio Bible on his counting-house desk, and would frequently be found reading it when people called on business. On such occasions he would lay his green spectacles in the book to mark the place, while he turned round to drive some usurious bargain. Some say that Tom grew a little crack-brained in his old days, and that, fancying his end approaching, he had his horse new-shod, saddled and bridled, and buried with his feet uppermost, because he supposed that at the last day the world would be turned upside down, in which case he should find his horse standing ready for mounting, and he was determined at the worst to give his old friend a run for it. This, however, is probably a mere old wise fable. If he really did take such a precaution, it was totally superfluous. At least so says the authentic old legend, which closes his story in the following manner. One hot summer afternoon in the dog days, just as a terrible black thundergust was coming up, Tom sat in his counting-house, in his white linen cap and an India silk morning gown. He was on the point of foreclosing a mortgage, by which he would complete the ruin of an unlucky land speculator, for whom he had professed the greatest friendship. The poor land-jobber begged him to grant a few months' indulgence. Tom had grown testy and irritated, and refused another delay. "'My family will be ruined and brought upon the parish,' said the land-jobber. "'Charity begins at home,' replied Tom. "'I must take care of myself in these hard times.' "'You have made so much money out of me,' said the speculator. Tom lost his patience and his piety. "'The devil take me,' said he, "'if I have made a farthing.' Just then there were three loud knocks at the street door. He stepped out to see who was there. A black man was holding a black horse. 
which neighed and stamped with impatience. Tom, you're come for, said the black fellow gruffly. Tom shrank back, but too late. He had left his little Bible at the bottom of his coat pocket, and his big Bible on the desk buried under the mortgage he was about to foreclose. Never was a sinner taken more unawares. The black man whisked him like a child into the saddle, gave the horse the lash, and away he galloped with Tom on his back in the midst of the thunderstorm. The clerks stuck their pens behind their ears and stared after him from the window. Away went Tom Walker, dashing down the streets, his white cap bobbing up and down, his morning gown fluttering in the wind, and his steed striking fire out of the pavement at every bound. When the clerks turned to look for the black man, he had disappeared. Tom Walker never returned to foreclose the mortgage. A countryman, who lived on the border of the swamp, reported that in the height of the thunder-gust he had heard a great clattering of hoofs and a howling along the road, and running to the window caught sight of a figure, such as I have described, on a horse that galloped like mad across the fields, over the hills, and down into the black hemlock swamp toward the old Indian fort, and that shortly after a thunderbolt falling in that direction seemed to set the whole forest in a blaze. The good people of Boston shook their heads and shrugged their shoulders, but had been so much accustomed to witches and goblins and tricks of the devil, in all kinds of shape from the first settlement of the colony, that they were not so much horror-strucken as might have been expected. Trustees were appointed to take charge of Tom's effects. There was nothing, however, to administer upon. On searching his coffers, all his bonds and mortgages were reduced to cinders. In place of gold and silver, his iron chest was filled with chips and shavings. Two skeletons lay in his stable instead of his half-starved horses, and the very next day his great house took fire and was burned to the ground. Such was the end of Tom Walker and his ill-gotten wealth. Let all griping money-brokers lay this story to heart. The truth of it is not to be doubted. The very hole under the oak-trees whence he dug kids' money is to be seen to this day, and the neighbouring swamp and old Indian fort are often haunted in stormy nights by a figure on horseback, in morning-gown and white cap, which is doubtless the troubled spirit of the usurer. In fact, the story has resolved itself into a proverb, and is the origin of that popular saying so prevalent throughout New England of The Devil and Tom Walker. End of The Devil and Tom Walker Recorded by Joseph Finkberg For Divers Reasons by Charles Battelle Loomis This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Robinson For Divers Reasons by Charles Battelle Loomis I sailed from England last summer on the mid-ocean line. I shall call the steamer the Bathtub. The fare to New York was sixty dollars for an inside berth in an inside room, and that was the kind of room that I selected. The passengers were sociable, amiable, and interesting, and I formed many agreeable ocean friendships, but all seemed lacking in one quality. For instance, I approached a sporty-looking man with a red necktie and a diamond in his shirt bosom. He was leaning over the rail, gazing at the last bit of green that we should see for eleven days. 
I began a conversation with that confidence that he would reply pleasantly which strangers on a steamer always have, nor is that confidence ever abused. Easy motion, isn't it? You come over on this line? No, I came over on the first Bismarck, but I had a touch of the gout in Paris, and the doctors recommended a slow ocean voyage, and so I chose this line. It's the slowest ever. I was too polite to wink at him, and he immediately turned the conversation into other channels. Later in the day I met a lady from Boston. It is, perhaps, unnecessary to say that I was introduced to this lady, also to every Bostonian on board. Easy motion, isn't it? said I, as I drew my chair into the shadow of one of the boats. Yes, said the Boston lady. The motion is easy, as you say, but I prefer a faster boat myself. We were coming home on the St. Louis, but Mr. Adams was cabled to come home at once, and this was the only line that we could secure passage on at such short notice. You are very lucky, said I, mentally figuring that if they had taken the St. Louis they would have reached home two days sooner than the bathtub would dock it. Well, I don't know as we can call it lucky. The table is so inferior at least to Back Bay cooking. I think it was on the same day that I fell into conversation with a well-put-up young man of New York. I fell into it in my usual way by saying, Nice easy motion, isn't it? We were standing in the bow watching a school of porpoises out for their noon recess. You may call it easy, but I call it blamed hard. Ten days more of it. I don't see why I was foolish enough to give up my passage on the Oceanic. But a chap in London told me that if I wanted an absolutely novel experience, I'd better take one of these tubs. Yes, said I, and they have the advantage of being cheap. Table not so bad, either. Well, the cheapness didn't appeal to me. In fact, I tried to get a whole stateroom for two hundred and forty dollars, so that I'd have plenty of room to myself, don't you know? But the confounded boat was so crowded that I could only get an inside berth, lower one at that. If I hadn't foolishly cabled my return home to the governor, I'd have waited and taken a cunarder. I met a southern woman that same day in the ladies' saloon. We were both writing letters, and neither one of us could think of a thing to say, so I looked up and smiled and uttered my formula. Easy motion, isn't it? Oh, yes. I wish it would roll a little. It is so monotonous. They say the sister steamer, the wash tub, is much more of a roller. Fine line, though, isn't it? Do you think so? I've always been accustomed to take the White Star Line, but my husband's brother's cousin, whom we met at Bingham, told us if we wanted to be perfectly comfortable, we'd better take a mid-ocean liner. Cheaper, too, said I, wickedly. She colored and went on. I really don't know about that part of it. My husband always attends to the buying of tickets. I had heard that there was a stowaway who had been discovered the third day out. I went to him. He was peeling potatoes in a dismal room off the kitchen. Hello, my boy, said I. That's right, I see you're helpful. I used to do that for my mother when I was a boy. Easy motion, isn't it? Did you expect to come by this line? He was flattered at not being taken for one of the crew. No, I wanted to take the Bremen, but she was burned at Hoboken, so I came on this. It's kinder fun to peel potatoes. The skins slip off so easy. With a sad heart, I left this insincere young man peeling potatoes and went up on the upper deck. 
There I saw a dignified and a handsome old gentleman, the best-dressed man on board, reading Aristophanes in the original. He had spoken to no one, and people thought him offish. I wondered what tale he would give me, and I stopped alongside of him, and when he looked up I said, Easy motion, isn't it? Yes, luckily for me it is. I'm a poor sailor. But easy or not, easy I had to come by this line, as I practically went broke in London and just had enough to buy a passage by this cheap line. I'll have to touch the friends who come to meet me for the money to tip the stewards. I don't rave over the table, and I know lots of ways in which the service could be improved, but I'm practically broke, and that's why I'm here, so I don't complain. Here he cast a comprehensive glance at such of the passengers as were in sight. Yes, I'm broke and I fancy we're all in the same boat. Shake, said I. End of For Diverse Reasons Recording by Michael Robinson, Carbondale, Illinois The Fox Skin by Gudmundur G. Hagalin this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Dixon. The Fox Skin by Gudmundur G. Hagalin. No need to take care now about fastening the door, Arnie of Bali said to himself as he wrapped the string around the nail driven into the doorpost of the outlying sheep coat. Then he turned around, took out his handkerchief, and putting it to his nose, blew vigorously. This done, he folded the handkerchief together again, wiped his mouth and nose, and took out his snuff horn. What fine balmy weather, thought Arnie. That miserable fox won't come near sheep coats or houses now. Blast its hide. Yes, it had caused him many a wakeful night. All the neighboring farmers would have the fool's luck to catch a fox every single winter. All but him. He couldn't even wound a vixen and had in all his life never caught any kind of fox. Wouldn't it be fun to bring home a dark brown pelt, one with fine overhair? Yes, wouldn't that be fun? Arnie shook his head in delight, cleared his throat vigorously, and took a pinch of snuff. Bending his steps homeward, he tottered along with his body half-stooped, as was his habit, and his hands behind his back. When he looked up, he did not straighten out, but bent his neck back so his head lay between his shoulder blades. Then his red-rimmed eyes looked as if they were about to pop out of his head. His dark red beard rose up as though striving to free itself from its roots, and his empurpled nose and scarlet cheekbones protruded. Pretty good underfoot, thought Arnie. At least it was easy to go between the sheep coats and the house. Everything pretty quiet just now. The sheep took care of themselves during the day, and grazing was plentiful along the seashore and on the hillsides. No reason why he might not now and then lie in wait, somewhat into the night, in the hope of catching a fox. He wasn't too tired for that. But he had given up all that sort of thing. It brought only vexation and trouble. Besides, he had told everybody that he did not think it was worth his while to waste his time on such things, and perhaps catch his death to boot. The Lord knew that was a mere pretense. Eighty crowns for a beautiful dark brown fox skin was a tidy sum. But a man had to think up something to say for himself, the way they all harped on fox hunting. Bjarni of Fell caught a white vixen night before last, or Einar of Brekka caught a brown dog fox yesterday. Or if a man stepped over to a neighbor's for a moment, any hunting? Anyone shot a fox? Our Gisli here caught a grayish brown one last evening. Such incessant twaddle. Arnie's breath came short. Wasn't it enough if a man made an honest living? Yet work or achievement which brought no joy was unblessed. At this point Samir darted up. Arnie thought the dog had deserted him and rushed off home. Now what in the world ailed the creature? Shame on you for a pesky cur. Can't you be still a minute, you brute? Must I beat you? asked Arnie, making threatening gestures at Samir, a large black-spotted dog with ugly shaggy hair. But Samir darted away, ran off whimpering, 
He would pause now and then and look back at his master, until finally he disappeared behind a big boulder. What's got into the beast? He can't have found a fox trail, can he? Arnie walked straight to the rock where Samur had disappeared. Then, slowing down his pace, he tiptoed as if he expected to find a fox hidden there. Yes, there was Samur. There he lay in front of a hole, whimpering and wagging his tail. Shame on you, Samur. Arnie lay down prone on the snow and stretched his arm into the hole. But all of a sudden he jerked his hand back, his heart beating as if it would tear itself out of his breast. He had so plainly felt something furry inside the hole, and he was badly mistaken if a strong fox odor did not come out of it. Was the fox alive, or was it dead? Might it bite him fatally? But that made no difference. Now that he had a good chance of taking a fox, it was do or die. He stood up straight and stretched every muscle, and pulled the mitten on his right hand carefully up over his wrist. Then he knelt down, thrust his hand in the hole, set his teeth, and screwed up his face. Yes, now he had caught hold of it and was pulling it carefully out. Well, 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 not so bad. A dark brown tail, a glossy body, and what fine over hair. For once Arnie of Bally had some luck. The fox was dead. It had been shot in the belly and just crept in there to die. Sly devil, poor beast, blessed creature. Arnie ended by feeling quite tenderly towards the fox. He hardly knew how to give utterance to his joy. Good old Samur, my own precious dog, let me pat you, said Arnie, rubbing the dog's cheek with his own. They could shout themselves blue in the face. It was no trick to kill all you wanted of these little devils, if you just had the powder and shot, and were willing to waste your time on it. But here Arnie's face fell. He did not even have his gun with him. It stood, all covered with rust, at home out in the shed. Just his luck. And how could he claim to have shot a fox without a gun? Get out of here, Samur. Shame on you, you rascal. And Arnie booted Samur so hard that the dog yelped. But in direst need, help is at hand. He could wait for the cover of darkness. Not even his wife should know but that he had shot the fox. Wouldn't she stare at him? She had always defied him and tried to belittle him. No, she should not learn the truth, she least of all. He would not tell a soul. Now Samur, he knew how to hold his tongue, faithful creature. Arnie sat down on the rock with the fox on his knees and started singing to pass the time, allowing his good cheer to ring out as far as his voice would carry. My fine Sunday cap has been carried away by a furious gale, and I'll wear it no more to the chapel to pray in the wind and the hail. He chanted this ballad over and over again until he was tired, then sat still, smiling and stroking the fox skin. He had learned the song when he was a child from his mother, who had sung it all day long one spring while she was shearing the sheep, and he could not think of any other for the moment. It wasn't, in fact, a bad song. There were many good rhymesters in Iceland. He began singing again, rocking his body back and forth vehemently, and stroking the fox skin the while and Samur, who sat in front of him, cocked his head first on one side, then on the other, and gave him a knowing look. At last the dog stretched out his neck, raised his muzzle into the air, and howled, using every variation of key known to him. At this Arnie stopped short and stared at him, then bending his head slightly to one side to study him, he roared with laughter. What an extraordinary dog! <laughs> yes, really extraordinary! In the little kitchen at Bali, Groa, the mistress, crouched before the stove, and poked the fire with such vigor that both ashes and embers flew out on the floor. She was preparing to heat a mouthful of porridge for supper for her old man and the brats. She stood up, rubbed her eyes, and swore. The horrid smoke that always came from that rattle-trap of a stove, and that wretched old fool of a husband was not man enough to fix it. Oh no, he wasn't handy enough for that. He went at every blessed thing as if his fingers were all thumbs. And where could he be loafing tonight? Not home yet. Serve him right if she locked the house and allowed him to stay in the sheep coats, or whatever it was he was dawdling. There now, those infernal brats were at the spinning wheel. Groa jumped up, darted into the passage, and went to the stairs. Will you leave that spinning wheel be, you young devils? If you break the flyer or the upright, your little old mother will be after you. 
A dead calm ensued. So Groa returned to the kitchen, and taking a loaf of pot bread from the cupboard, cut a few slices and spread them with dripping. Now a scratching sound was heard at the door, and Arne entered. Good evening to all, said he with urbanity, as he set down the gun behind the kitchen door. Here's that gun. It has certainly paid for itself, poor old thing. His wife did not reply to his greeting, but she eyed him askance, with a look that was anything but loving. Been fooling around with that gun? Why the blazes couldn't you have come home and brought me a bit of peat from the pit? A fine hunter you are. I might as well have married the devil. And his wife turned from him with a sneer. You're in a nice temper now, my dear. But just take a look at this, said Arnie, throwing down the brown fox on the kitchen floor. At first, Groa stared at her husband as if she had never seen him before. Then she shook her head and smiled sarcastically. You found it dead, I'll wager. Arne started. His face turned red and his eyes protruded. You would say that. You don't let me forget what a superior woman I married. Found it dead. And Arne plumped down on the wood box. His wife laughed. I'll wager I hit the nail on the head that time. Arne jumped to his feet. That confounded old witch should not spoil his pleasure. You're as stark raving mad as you always have been, but I don't care what you say. Kids, come and look at the fox your father has shot. Three days later, they had a visitor. Arnie stood outside and stared at him. For a wonder, somebody had at last found his way to Arnie's. Days and nights had passed, but nobody had come. They always came when they weren't wanted. And now came John of Lawn, that overbearing fellow, but now he could see that Arnie of Bally was also a man among men. Howdy, Arnie, you poor fish, said John, fixing his steely gray eyes on Arnie. How are you, old snake, answered Arnie, smiling contemptuously. What monstrous eyes John had when he looked at a person. Has something special happened? You're somehow so puffed up today, said John with a sarcastic smile. Darn him, muttered Arnie. Was he going to act just like Groa? In that case, Arnie had at least a trump card in reserve. Did you say something? inquired John, sticking a quid of tobacco into his mouth. Or wasn't it meant for my ears? Oh well, I don't care for your mutterings, you poor wretch. But now, go ask your wife to give me a little drink of sour whey. Arnie turned round slowly and lazily. Wasn't the old fellow going to notice the skin? It wasn't so small that it couldn't be seen. There it hung on the wall, right in the sunlight combed and beautifully glossy. That's quite a nice fox skin. Whose is it? asked John, walking over to the wall. Arnie turned round. He could feel his heart beating fast. Mine, he said, with what calm he could muster. What is the idea of you buying a fox skin, you poor beggar? Buying, Arnie sighed. You think I can't shoot me a fox? You, John laughed. That's a downright lie, my dear Arnie. A lie. You'd best not tell people they lie unless you know more about it. A scoundrel like you, I say, a scoundrel like you, replied Arnie, swelling. I think you'd better be getting in and see her. You know her pretty well, I believe. John looked at the farmer of Bali with his steely eyes. For whom are you keeping the skin, Arnie? No one, said Arnie crossly. Then, after some hesitation, the Lord gave it to me. All right, Arnie. Miracles never cease. That is plain enough after this, and no question about it. That's an eighty-crowned skin, however you came by it. But now let's go in and see Groa. As you say, I know her pretty well. She was a smart girl, you poor wretch. Too bad I was married and had to throw her to a creature like you. Arnie grinned, and trotting to the door of the house, called, Groa, a visitor to see you. The woman came to the door. A smile played about her lips. Smoldering embers glowed in her blue eyes, and the sunlight lighted up the unkempt braids of golden hair which fell down about her pale cheeks. But Arnie for once was satisfied. At last John was properly impressed. The affair between Groa and John was something that could not be helped. John surely regretted having lost that girl, yes indeed, and she had her good points. She was smart and a hundred crowns a year, besides everything else that was brought them from Lon was pretty good compensation. Yes, many a man had married less well than Arnie of Bally. And the children were his, most of them anyway. Nobody need tell him anything else. The fox skin became Arnie of Bally's most cherished possession, 
Every day, when the weather was clear, he would hang it, well smoothed and combed, on the outside wall, and when he left home he carefully put it away in a safe place. The skin became famous throughout the district, and many of the younger men made special trips to Bally to examine it. Arnie would beam with joy and strut around with a knowing, self-satisfied expression on his face, and would tell of the patience, the agility, and the marksmanship he had to put into killing this monstrously clever fox. It certainly wasn't hard to kill all you wanted of these devils, if you just had the powder and shot and were willing to give your time to it, he would say, as he turned the skin so that the sunlight shone full on the glossy pelt. Then one day that fall, Arnie came home from tending the sheep, which had just been brought down from the mountain pastures. He hung the skin out and went into the kitchen, where Groa was busy washing, sat down on a box by the wall on the other side of the room, let his head rest on his hands, and looked wise. For a while there was silence. At last Groa looked up from her wash tub and gave Arnie a piercing glance. Have you got your eye on a cow to replace the gray spotted one we killed last spring? Cow? asked Arnie, scratching his head. Cow, yes, so you say, my good woman. So I say, do you think the milk from Dumbo alone goes very far in feeding such a flock of children as we have? You haven't gone and squandered the money we got for Scalda? asked Groa, looking harder still at her husband. Don't be foolish, woman. The money lies untouched at the factors. But he wouldn't pay much for the meat and the hide of Scalda, not anywhere near enough to buy a good milking cow. He said the English on the trawlers don't set much store by cow's meat. The summer has been only so-so, and I'm sure we'll have plenty of uses for what money I've been able to scrape together. Of course, a cow is a good thing to buy, an enjoyable luxury, if only you have plenty of money. If you can't scrape together the money for a cow, we must cut expenses somehow. Perhaps you could stop stuffing your nostrils with that dirty snuff? And you ought at any rate to be able to sell that fancy fox skin you play with so childishly. Is that so? Yes, you play with that wretched fox skin just exactly like any crazy youngster. Wretched, is it? Take care what you say, woman, wretched skin. A fine judge of such matters you are. And standing up, Arnie paced the kitchen floor. An eighty-crowned skin, and you call it wretched. John of Lawn didn't call it any names. You'll believe at least what he says. Now don't get puffed up. You ought to be thankful to get what you can for the skin. It will help in buying the cow. The cow? Let me tell you, woman, that I am not going to buy a cow for the skin. You can take it from me that you will never get a cow for that skin, or anything else, in fact. The farmer at Lawn can shell out whatever is needed for buying the cow. That's the least he can do for you. Groa stopped her washing, stared for a few seconds at Arnie, and then with a quick movement walked up to him, brandishing a bit of wet linen. Will you tell me what you're going to do with the skin? She asked almost in a whisper. Arnie shrank back. The weight of the door was cut off. He raised his arm in self-defense and retreated as far as possible into the corner. I'm going to sell it. Now be reasonable, Groa. I'm going to sell it. And what are you going to buy for it? His wife hissed, boring into him with her eyes. A cow. I'm going to buy a cow for it. You lie. You know you're not going to sell it. You're going to play with it. Know your children hungering for milk and play with the skin. My children? No, God be praised. They're not yours, said Groa, allowing the blows to rain on Arnie. But now I'll keep the skin for you. And like an arrow she shot out of the door, all out of breath and trembling. For a few seconds Arnie stood still. His eyes seemed bursting out of their sockets, and the hair in his beard stood on end. In a flash he rushed over the kitchen floor and out of the house. Groa had just taken the skin down off the nail on the wall. Now she brandished it and looked at Arnie with fury in her gaze. But he did not wait. He rushed at her, gave her such a shove that she fell, and snatching the skin from her, ran. A safe distance away, he turned and stood panting for several seconds. At last, exhausted and trembling with rage, he hissed. I tell you, Groa, I'll have my way about this. The skin is the only thing that is all my own, and no one shall take it from me. Arnie fled then. He took to his heels and ran away as fast as he could up the slopes. Far in the innermost corner of the outlying sheepcote at Bally, to which the sun's rays never reach, Arnie built himself a little cupboard. 
This cupboard is kept carefully locked, and Arnie carries the key on a string which hangs around his neck. Arnie now has become quite prosperous. For a long time it was thought he must keep money in the cupboard, but last spring an acquaintance of his stopped at the outlying sheep coat on his way from the village. The man had some liquor with him and gave Arnie a taste. At last the visitor was allowed to see what the cupboard contained, a carefully combed and smoothed dark brown fox skin. Arnie was visibly moved by the unveiling of his secret. Staring at the ceiling, he licked his whiskers and sighed deeply. It seems to me, Gisley, he said to his friend, that I'd rather lose all my use than this skin, for it was the thing which once made me say, thus far and no farther, and since then I seem to own something right here in my breast, which not even John of Lawn can take away from me. I think I'm now beginning to understand what is meant in the scriptures by the treasure which neither moth nor rust can corrupt. Arnie's red-rimmed eyes were moist. For a while he stood there thinking. But all of a sudden he shook his head, and turning to his acquaintance, said, Let's see the bottle. A man seems to feel warmer inside if he gets a little drop. And Arnie shook himself, as if the mental strain of his philosophizing had occasioned him in a slight chill. End of the Fox Skin Recording by Jerry Dixon, Zephyr Hills, Florida The Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Garden Party. And after all, the weather was ideal. They could not have had a more perfect day for a garden party if they had ordered it. Windless, warm, the sky without a cloud. Only the blue was veiled with a haze of light gold, as it sometimes is in early summer. The gardener had been up since dawn, mowing the lawns and sweeping them, until the grass and the dark flat rosettes where the daisy plants had been seemed to shine. As for the roses, you could not help feeling they understood that roses are the only flowers that impress people at garden parties, the only flowers that everybody is certain of knowing. Hundreds... Yes, literally hundreds had come out in a single night. The green bushes bowed down as though they had been visited by archangels. Breakfast was not yet over before the men came to put up the marquee. Where do you want the marquee put, mother? My dear child, there's no use asking me. I'm determined to leave everything to you children this year. Forget I am your mother. Treat me as an honoured guest. But Meg could not possibly go and supervise the men. She had washed her hair before breakfast, and she sat drinking her coffee in a green turban, with a dark wet curl stamped on each cheek. Josie, the butterfly, always came down in a silk petticoat and kimono jacket. You'll have to go, Laura. You're the artistic one. Away Laura flew, still holding her piece of bread and butter. It's so delicious to have an excuse for eating out of doors, and besides, she loved having to arrange things. She always felt she could do it so much better than anybody else. Four men in their shirt sleeves stood grouped together on the garden path. They carried staves covered with rolls of canvas, and they had big tool bags slung on their backs. They looked impressive. Laura wished now that she had not got the bread and butter, but there was nowhere to put it, and she couldn't possibly throw it away. She blushed and tried to look severe and even a little bit short-sighted as she came up to them. "'Good morning,' she said, copying her mother's voice. "'But that sounded so fearfully affected that she was ashamed and stammered like a little girl. "'Oh, uh, have you come? Is it about the Marquis?' "'That's right, miss,' said the tallest of the men, a lanky, freckled fellow, "'and he shifted his tool bag, knocked back his straw hat, and smiled down at her. "'That's about it.' "'His smile was so easy, so friendly, that Laura recovered. "'What nice eyes he had!' small but such a dark blue and now she looked at the others they were smiling too cheer up we won't bite their smile seemed to say how very nice workmen were and what a beautiful morning she mustn't mention the morning she must be businesslike the marquis well what about the lily lawn would that do and she pointed to the lily lawn with the hand that didn't hold the bread and butter they turned they stared in the direction a little fat chap thrust out his underlip, and the tall fellow frowned. 
"'I don't fancy it,' said he. "'Not conspicuous enough. "'You see, with a thing like a marquee,' "'and he turned to Laura in his easy way, "'you want to put it somewhere where it'll give you a bang slap in the eye "'if you follow me.' "'Laura's upbringing made her wonder for a moment "'whether it was quite respectful of a workman "'to talk to her of bangs slap in the eye, "'but she did quite follow him. "'A corner of the tennis court?' she suggested. "'But the band's going to be in one corner.' Hmm. Going to have a band, are you? said another of the workmen. He was pale. He had a haggard look as his dark eyes scanned the tennis court. What was he thinking? Only a very small band, said Laura gently. Perhaps he wouldn't mind so much if the band was quite small. But the tall fellow interrupted. Look here, miss. That's the place. Against those trees. Over there. That'll do fine. Against the caracas. Then the caraca trees would be hidden. And they were so lovely with their broad, gleaming leaves and their clusters of yellow fruit. They were like trees you imagined growing on a desert island, proud, solitary, lifting their leaves and fruits to the sun in a kind of silent splendor. Must they be hidden by a marquee? They must. Already the men had shouldered their staves and were making for the place. Only the tall fellow was left. He bent down, pinched a sprig of lavender, put his thumb and forefinger to his nose and snuffed up the smell. When Laura saw that gesture she forgot all about the caracas in her wonder at him, caring for things like that, caring for the smell of lavender. How many men that she knew would have done such a thing? Oh, how extraordinarily nice the workmen were, she thought. Why couldn't she have workmen for her friends rather than the silly boys she danced with and who came to Sunday night supper? She would get on much better with men like these. It's all the fault, she decided, as the tall fellow drew something on the back of an envelope, something that was to be looped up or left to hang, of these absurd class distinctions. Well, for her part she didn't feel them, not a bit, not an atom. And now there came the chuck-chuck of wooden hammers. Someone whistled, someone sang out. Are you right there, matey? Matey? The friendliness of it, the... the... Just to prove how happy she was, just to show the tall fellow how at home she felt and how she despised stupid conventions, Laura took a big bite of her bread and butter as she stared at the little drawing. She felt just like a work girl. Laura! Laura, where are you? Telephone, Laura! A voice cried from the house. Coming! Away she skipped, over the lawn, up the path, up the steps, across the veranda and into the porch. In the hall her father and Laurie were brushing their hats, ready to go to the office. "'I say, Laura,' said Laurie very fast, "'you might just give a squiz at my coat before this afternoon, see if it wants pressing.' "'I will,' said she. Suddenly she couldn't stop herself. She ran at Laurie and gave him a quick, small squeeze. "'Oh, I love parties, don't you?' gasped Laura. "'Rather,' said Laurie's warm, boyish voice, and he squeezed his sister too and gave her a gentle push. Dash off to the telephone, old girl. The telephone. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. Kitty, good morning, dear. Come to lunch. Do, dear. Delighted, of course. It will only be a very scratch meal, just the sandwich crusts and broken meringue shells and what's left over. Yes, isn't it a perfect morning? You're white? Oh, I certainly should. One moment, hold the line. Mother's calling. And Laura sat back. What, mother? Can't hear. Mrs. Sheridan's voice floated down the stairs. Tell her to wear the sweet hat she had on last Sunday. Mother says you're to wear the sweet hat you had on last Sunday. Good. One o'clock. Bye-bye. Laura put back the receiver, flung her arms over her head, took a deep breath, stretched, and let them fall. Huh, <sighs> she sighed, and a moment after the sigh she sat up quickly. She was still, listening. All the doors in the house seemed to be open. The house was alive with soft, quick steps and running voices. The green baize door that led to the kitchen regions swung open and shut with a muffled thud. And now there came a long, chuckling, absurd sound. It was the heavy piano being moved on its stiff casters. But the air, if you stopped to notice, was the air always like this? Little faint winds were playing chase, in at the tops of the windows, out at the doors. And there were two tiny spots of sun, one on the ink pot, one on a silver photograph frame, playing too, darling little spots, especially the one on the ink pot lid. It was quite warm, a warm little silver star, 
she could have kissed it. The front doorbell pealed, and there sounded the rustle of Sadie's print skirt on the stairs. A man's voice murmured. Sadie answered, careless, "'I'm sure I don't know. Wait, I'll ask Mrs. Sheridan.' "'What is it, Sadie?' Laura came into the hall. "'It's the florist, Miss Laura.' It was, indeed. There, just inside the door, stood a wide, shallow tray, full of pots of pink lilies. No other kind, nothing but lilies. Canna lilies, big pink flowers, wide open, radiant, almost frighteningly alive on the bright crimson stems. "'Oh, Sadie!' said Laura, and the sound was like a little moan. She crouched down as if to warm herself at the blaze of lilies. She felt they were in her fingers, on her lips, growing in her breast. "'It's some mistake,' she said faintly. "'Nobody ever ordered so many. Sadie, go and find Mother.' But at that moment Mrs. Sheridan joined them. "'It's quite right,' she said calmly. "'Yes, I ordered them. Aren't they lovely?' She pressed Laura's arm. I was passing the shop yesterday, and I saw them in the window, and I suddenly thought for once in my life I shall have enough canna lilies. The garden party will be a good excuse. But I thought you said you didn't mean to interfere, said Laura. Sadie had gone. The florist's man was still outside at his van. She put her arm round her mother's neck, and gently, very gently, she bit her mother's ear. My darling child, you wouldn't like a logical mother, would you? Don't do that. Here's the man. He carried more lilies still, another whole tray. Bank them up just inside the door on both sides of the porch, please, said Mrs. Sheridan. Don't you agree, Laura? Oh, I do, Mother. In the drawing-room, Meg, Josie, and good little hands had at last succeeded in moving the piano. Now, if we put this Chesterfield against the wall and move everything out of the room except the chairs, don't you think? Quite. Hans, move these tables into the smoking room, and bring a sweeper to take these marks off the carpet, and... One moment. Hans! Josie liked giving orders to the servants, and they loved obeying her. She always made them feel they were taking part in some drama. Tell Mother and Miss Laura to come here at once. Very good, Miss Josie. She turned to Meg. I want to hear what the piano sounds like, just in case I'm asked to sing this afternoon. Let's try over This Life is Weary. Pum! ta 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 The piano burst out so passionately that Josie's face changed. She clasped her hands. She looked mournfully and enigmatically at her mother and Laura as they came in. This life is weary, a tear a sigh, a love that changes. This life is weary, a tear a sigh, a love that changes, and then... Goodbye. But at the word goodbye, and although the piano sounded more desperate than ever, her face broke into a brilliant, dreadfully unsympathetic smile. Aren't I in good voice, Mummy? she beamed. This life is weary, hope comes to die, a dream awakening. But now Sadie interrupted them. What is it, Sadie? If you please, m "'Cook says, have you got the flags for the sandwiches?' "'The flags for the sandwiches, Sadie,' echoed Mrs. Sheridan dreamily, "'and the children knew by her face that she hadn't got them. "'Let me see,' and she said to Sadie firmly, "'Tell Cook I'll let her have them in ten minutes.' "'Sadie went. "'Now, Laura,' said her mother quickly, "'come with me into the smoking-room. "'I've got the names somewhere in the back of an envelope. "'You'll have to write them out for me. "'Meg, go upstairs this minute and take that wet thing off your head.' "'Josie, run and finish dressing this instant. "'Do you hear me, children? "'Or shall I have to tell your father when he comes home tonight? "'And, and, Josie, pacify Cook if you go into the kitchen, will you? "'I'm terrified of her this morning.' "'The envelope was found at last behind the dining-room clock, "'though how it had got there Miss Sheridan could not imagine. "'One of you children must have stolen it out of my bag, "'because I remember vividly. "'Cream cheese and lemon curd, have you done that? "'Yes. "'Egg and... Mrs. Sheridan held the envelope away from her. It looks like mice. It can't be mice, can it? Olive, pet, said Laura, looking over her shoulder. Yes, of course, olive. What a horrible combination it sounds, egg and olive. They were finished at last, and Laura took them off to the kitchen. She found Josie there pacifying the cook, who did not look at all terrifying. 
I have never seen such exquisite sandwiches, said Josie's rapturous voice. How many kinds did you say there were, Cook? Fifteen? Fifteen, Miss Josie. Well, Cook, I congratulate you. Cook swept up crusts with a long sandwich knife and smiled broadly. Godbers has come, announced Sadie, issuing out of the pantry. She had seen the man pass the window. That meant the cream puffs had come. Godbers were famous for their cream puffs. Nobody ever thought of making them at home. Bring them in and put them on the table, my girl, ordered Cook. Sadie brought them in and went back to the door. Of course, Laura and Josie were far too grown up to really care about such things. All the same, they couldn't help agreeing that the puffs looked very attractive. Very. Cook began arranging them, shaking off the extra icing sugar. Don't they carry one back to all one's parties? said Laura. I suppose they do, said practical Josie, who never liked to be carried back. They look beautifully light and feathery, I must say. Have one each, my dears, said Cook in her comfortable voice. Your ma won't know. Oh, impossible. Fancy cream puffs so soon after breakfast. The very idea made one shudder. All the same, two minutes later, Josie and Laura were licking their fingers with that absorbed, inward look that only comes from whipped cream. Let's go into the garden, out by the back way, suggested Laura. I want to see how the men are getting on with the Marquis. They're such awfully nice men. But the back door was blocked by Cook, Sadie, Godber's man, and Hans. Something had happened. Tuck, 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 clucked Cook like an agitated hen. Sadie had her hand clapped to her cheek as though she had a toothache. Hans' face was screwed up in the effort to understand. Only Godber's man seemed to be enjoying himself. It was his story. What's the matter? What happened? There's been a horrible accident, said Cook. A man killed. A man killed? Where? How? When? But Godber's man wasn't going to have his story snatched from under his very nose. Know those little cottages just below there, miss? Know them? Of course she knew them. Well, there's a young chap living there, name of Scott, a carter. His horse shied at a traction engine, corner of Hawk Street this morning, and he was thrown out on the back of his head, killed. Dead? Laura stared at Godber's man. Dead when they picked him up, said Godber's man with relish. They were taking the body home as I come up here, and he said to the cook. He's left a wife and five little ones. Josie, come here. Laura caught hold of her sister's sleeve and dragged her through the kitchen to the other side of the green baize door. There she paused and leaned against it. Josie, she said, horrified. However are we going to stop everything? Stop everything, Laura, cried Josie in astonishment. What do you mean? Stop the garden party, of course. Why did Josie pretend? But Josie was still more amazed. Stop the garden party? My dear Laura, don't be so absurd. Of course we can't do anything of the kind. Nobody expects us to. Don't be so extravagant. But we can't possibly have a garden party with a man dead just outside the front gate. That really was extravagant, for the little cottages were in a lane to themselves at the very bottom of a steep rise that led up to the house. A broad road ran between. True, they were far too near. They were the greatest possible eyesore, and they had no right to be in that neighbourhood at all. They were little mean dwellings, painted a chocolate brown. In the garden patches there was nothing but cabbage stalks, sick hens, and tomato cans. The very smoke coming out of the chimneys was poverty-stricken. Little rags and shreds of smoke, so unlike the great silvery plumes that uncurled from the Sheridan's chimneys. Washerwomen lived in the lane, and sweeps, and a cobbler, and a man whose house-front was studded all over with the minute bird-cages. Children swarmed. When the Sheridans were little, they were forbidden to set foot there because of the revolting language and of what they might catch. But since they were grown up, Laura and Laurie, on their prowls, sometimes walked through. It was disgusting and sordid. They came out with a shudder. But still, one must go everywhere. One must see everything. So through they went. And just think of what the band would sound like to that poor woman said Laura. Oh, Laura, Josie began to be seriously annoyed. If you're going to stop a band playing every time someone has an accident, you'll lead a very strenuous life. 
I'm every bit as sorry about it as you. I feel just as sympathetic. Her eyes hardened. She looked at her sister just as she used to when they were little and fighting together. You won't bring a drunken workman back to life by being sentimental, she said softly. Drunk? Who said he was drunk? Laura turned furiously on Josie. She said, just as they had used to say on those occasions, I'm going straight to tell Mother. Do, dear, cooed Josie. Mother, can I come into your room? Laura turned to the big glass doorknob. Of course, child. Why, what's the matter? What's given you such a colour? And Mrs. Sheridan turned round from her dressing table. She was trying on a new hat. Mother, a man's been killed, began Laura. Not in the garden, interrupted her mother. No, no. Oh, what a fright you gave me, Mrs. Sheridan sighed with relief, and took off the big hat and held it on her knees. But listen, mother, said Laura, breathless, half choking, she told the dreadful story. Of course we can't have our party, can we? she pleaded. The band and everybody arriving, they'd hear us, mother, they're nearly neighbours. To Laura's astonishment, her mother behaved just like Josie. It was harder to bear because she seemed amused. She refused to take Laura seriously. But, my dear child, use your common sense. It's only by accident we've heard of it. If someone had died there normally, and I can't understand how they keep alive in those poky little howls, we should still be having our party, shouldn't we? Laura had to say yes to that, but she felt it was all wrong. She sat down on her mother's sofa and pinched the cushion frill. Mother, isn't it terribly heartless of us? she asked. Darling, Mrs. Sheridan got up and came over, her, came over to her carrying the hat. Before Laura could stop her, she had popped it on. My child, said her mother, the hat is yours. It's made for you. It's much too young for me. I have never seen you look such a picture. Look at yourself. And she held up her hand mirror. But mother, Laura began again. She couldn't look at herself. She turned aside. This time Mrs. Sheridan lost patience, just as Josie had done. "'You're being very absurd, Laura,' she said coldly. "'People like that don't expect sacrifices from us, "'and it's not very sympathetic to spoil everybody's enjoyment as you're doing now.' "'I don't understand,' said Laura, "'and she walked quickly out of the room into her own bedroom. "'There, quite by chance, the first thing she saw was this charming girl in the mirror, "'in her black hat trimmed with gold daisies and a long black velvet ribbon.' Never had she imagined she could look like that. Is mother right, she thought. And now she hoped her mother was right. Am I being extravagant? Perhaps it was extravagant. Just for a moment she had another glimpse of that poor woman and those little children, and the body being carried into the house. But it all seemed blurred, unreal, like a picture in the newspaper. I'll remember it again after the party's over, she decided. And somehow that seemed quite the best plan. Lunch was over by half past one. By half past two, they were all ready for the fray. The green coated band had arrived and was established in a corner of the tennis court. My dear, trilled Kitty Maitland, aren't they too like frogs for words? You ought to have arranged them round the pond with the conductor in the middle on a leaf. Laurie arrived and hailed them on his way to dress. At the sight of him, Laura remembered the accident again. She wanted to tell him. If Laurie agreed with the others, then it was bound to be all right. And she followed him into the hall. Laurie! Hello! He was halfway upstairs, but when he turned around and saw Laura, he suddenly puffed out his cheeks and goggled his eyes at her. My word, Laura, you do look stunning, said Laurie. What an absolutely topping hat! Laura said faintly, it is, and smiled up at Laurie, and didn't tell him after all. Soon after that, people began coming in streams. The band struck up. The hired waiters ran from the house to the marquee. Wherever you looked, there were couples strolling, bending to the flowers, greeting, moving on over the lawn. They were like bright birds that had alighted in the Sheridan's garden for this one afternoon, on their way to... where? Ah, what happiness it is to be with people who are all happy, to press hands, press cheeks smile into eyes. Darling, Laura, how well you look. What a becoming hat, child. Laura, you look quite Spanish. I've never seen you look so striking. And Laura, glowing, answered softly. 
Have you had tea? Won't you have an ice? The passion fruit ices really are rather special. She ran to her father and begged him. Daddy, darling, can't the band have something to drink? And the perfect afternoon slowly ripened, slowly faded, slowly its petals closed. Never a more delightful garden party. The greatest success. Quite the most. Laura helped her mother with the goodbyes. They stood side by side in the porch till it was all over. All over, all over, thank heaven, said Mrs. Sheridan. Round up the others, Laura. Let's go and have some fresh coffee. I'm exhausted. Yes, it's been very successful. But, oh, these parties, these parties. Why will you children insist on giving parties? And they all of them sat in the deserted marquee. Have a sandwich, Daddy, dear. I wrote the flag. Thanks. Mr. Sheridan took a bite and the sandwich was gone. He took another. I suppose you didn't hear a beastly accident that happened today, he has said. My dear, said Mrs. Sheridan, holding up her hand. We did. It nearly ruined the party. Laura insisted we should put it off. Oh, mother. Laura didn't want to be teased about it. It was a horrible affair all the same, said Mr. Sheridan. The chap was married, too. Lived just below in the lane, and leaves a wife and half a dozen kiddies, so they say. An awkward little silence fell. Mrs. Sheridan fidgeted with her cup. Really, it was very tactless of father. Suddenly she looked up. There on the table were all those sandwiches, cakes, puffs, all uneaten, all going to be wasted. She had one of her brilliant ideas. I know, she said. Let's make up a basket. Let's send that poor creature some of this perfectly good food. At any rate, it will be the greatest treat for the children. Don't you agree? And she's sure to have neighbours calling in and so on. What a point to have it already prepared. Laura, she jumped up. Get me the big basket out of the stairs cupboard. But, Mother, do you really think it's a good idea? said Laura. Again, how curious. She seemed to be different from them all. To take scraps from their party. Would the poor woman really like that? Of course. What's the matter with you today? An hour or two ago you were insisting on us being sympathetic, and now... Oh, well. Laura ran for the basket. It was filled. It was heaped by her mother. Take it yourself, darling, said she. Run down just as you are. No, wait. Take the arum lilies, too. People of that class are so impressed by arum lilies. The stems will ruin her lace frock, said practical Josie. So they would. Just in time. Only the basket, then. And Laura, her mother, followed her out of the marquee. Don't on any account. What, mother? No. Better not put such ideas into the child's head. Nothing. Run along. It was just growing dusky as Laura shut their garden gates. A big dog ran by like a shadow. The road gleamed white, and down below in the hollow the little cottages were in deep shade. How quiet it seemed after the afternoon. Here she was going down the hill to somewhere where a man lay dead, and she couldn't realise it. Why couldn't she? She stopped a minute, and it seemed to her that kisses, voices, tinkling spoons, laughter, the smell of crushed grass were somehow inside her. She had no room for anything else. How strange! She looked up at the pale sky, and all she thought was, yes, it was the most successful party. Now the broad road was crossed. The lane began, smoky and dark. Women in shawls and men's tweed caps hurried by. Men hung over the palings, the children played in the doorways. A low hum came from the mean little cottages. In some of them there was a flicker of light, and a shadow, crab-like, moved across the window. Laura bent her head and hurried on. She wished now she had put on a coat. How her frock shone! and the big hat with the velvet streamer, if only it was another hat. Were the people looking at her? They must be. It was a mistake to have come. She knew all along it was a mistake. Should she go back even now? No. Too late. This was the house. It must be. A dark knot of people stood outside. Beside the gate an old, old woman with a crutch sat in a chair watching. She had her feet on a newspaper. The voices stopped, 
as Laura drew near. The group parted. It was as though she was expected, as though they had known she was coming here. Laura was terribly nervous. Tossing the velvet ribbon over her shoulder, she said to a woman standing by, Is this Mrs. Scott's house? And the woman, smiling queerly, said, It is, my lass. Oh, to be away from this, she actually said, Help me, God, as she walked up the tiny path and knocked. To be away from those staring eyes, or to be covered up in anything, one of those women's shawls, even. I'll just leave the basket and go, she decided. I shan't even wait for it to be emptied. Then the door opened. A little woman in black showed in the gloom. Laura said, Are you Mrs. Scott? But to her horror the woman answered, Walk in, please, miss. And she was shut in the passage. No, said Laura. I don't want to come in. I only want to leave this basket. Mother said... The little woman in the gloomy passage seemed not to have heard her. Step this way, please, miss, she said in an oily voice, and Laura followed her. She found herself in a wretched little low kitchen, lighted by a smoky lamp. There was a woman sitting before the fire. M, said the little creature who had let her in. M, it's a young lady. She turned to Laura. She said meaningly, I'm a sister, miss. You'll excuse her, won't you? Oh, but of course, said Laura. Please, please don't disturb her. I, I only want to leave. But at that moment the woman at the fire turned round. Her face puffed up, red, with swollen eyes and swollen lips, looked terrible. She seemed as though she couldn't understand why Laura was there. What did it mean? Why was this stranger standing in the kitchen with a basket? What was it all about? And the poor face puckered up again. All right, my dear, said the other. I'll thank the young lady. And again she began. You'll excuse her, miss, I'm sure. And her face, swollen too, tried an oily smile. Laura only wanted to get out, to get away. She was back in the passage. The door opened. She walked straight through into the bedroom where the dead man was lying. You'd like a look at him, wouldn't you? said Em's sister, and she brushed past Laura over to the bed. Don't be afraid, my lass. And now her voice sounded fond and sly, and fondly she drew down the sheet. He looks a picture. There's nothing to show. Come along, my dear. Laura came. There lay a young man, fast asleep, sleeping so soundly, so deeply, that he was far, far away from them both. Oh, so remote, so peaceful. He was dreaming. Never wake him up again. His head was sunk in the pillow. His eyes were closed. They were blind under the closed eyelids. He was given up to his dream. What did garden parties and baskets and lace frocks matter to him? He was far from all those things. He was wonderful, beautiful. While they were laughing, and while the band was playing, this marvel had come to the lane. Happy, happy, all is well, said that sleeping face. This is just as it should be. I am content. But all the same, you had to cry. And she couldn't get out of the room without saying something to him. Laura gave a loud, childish sob. Forgive my hat, she said. And this time she didn't wait for M's sister. She found her way out of the door, down the path, past all those dark people. At the corner of the lane she met Laurie. He stepped out of the shadow. Is that you, Laura? Yes. Mother was getting anxious. Was it all right? Yes, quite. Oh, Laurie! She took his arm and pressed up against him. I say, you're not crying, are you? asked her brother. Laura shook her head. She was. Laurie put his arm around her shoulder. 
Don't cry, he said in his warm, loving voice. Was it awful? No, sobbed Laura. It was simply marvellous. But, Laurie... She stopped. She looked at her brother. Isn't life... She stammered. Isn't life... But what life was, she couldn't explain. No matter. He quite understood. Isn't it, darling? Said Laurie. End of The Garden Party by Catherine Mansfield Her Lover by Maxim Gorky This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Vlad Zhuilov Her Lover by Maxim Gorky an acquaintance of mine once told me the following story. When I was a student at Moscow, I happened to live alongside one of those ladies, whose repute is questionable. She was a Pole, and they called her Teresa. She was a tallish, powerful built brunette, with black, bushy eyebrows and a large, coarse face, as if craved out by a hatchet. The bestial gleam of her dark eyes, her thick bass voice, her cabman-like gait and her immense muscular vigor, worthy of a fishwife, inspired me with horror. I lived on the top flight and her garret was opposite to mine. I never left my door open when I knew her to be at home, but this, after all, was a very rare occurrence. Sometimes I chanced to meet her on the staircase or in the yard, and she would smile upon me with a smile which seemed to me to be sly and cynical. Occasionally I saw her drunk, with the bleary eyes, tousled hair, and particularly hideous grin. On such occasions she would speak to me. How do you do, Mr. Student? And her stupid laugh would still further intensify my loathing of her. I should have liked to have changed my quarters in order to have avoided such encounters and greetings, but my little chamber was a nice one, and there was such a wide view from the window, and it was always so quiet in the street below, so I endured. And one morning I was sprawling on my coach, trying to find some sort of excuse for not attending my class, when the door opened and the bass voice of Teresa the loathsome resounded from my threshold. Good health to you, Mr. Student. What do you want? I said. I saw that her face was confused and supplicatory. It was a very unusual sort of face for her. Sir, I want to beg a favor of you. Will you grant it me? I lay there silent and thought to myself, Gracious, courage, my boy. I want to send a letter home. That's what it is, she said. Her voice was beseeching, soft, timid. Deuce take you, I thought, but up I jumped, sat down at my table, took a sheet of paper and said, Come here, sit down, and dictate. She came, sat down very gingerly on a chair, and looked at me with a guilty look. Well, to whom do you want to write? To Boleslav Kashput, at the town of Svitswana, on the Warsaw Road. Well, fire away. My dear Boles, my darling, my faithful lover, may the mother of God protect thee. So heart of gold, why hast thou not written for such a long time to thy sorrowing little dove, Teresa? I very nearly burst out laughing. A sorrowing little dove? More than a five feet high, with feast as tone and more in weight, and as a black as face as if the little dove had lived all its life in a chimney and had never once washed itself. Restraining myself somehow, I asked, Who is this Bolest? Bolest, Mr. Student, she said, as if offended with me for blundering over the name. He is Bolest, my young man. Young man? Why are you so surprised, sir? Cannot I, a girl, have a young man? She, a girl? Well... Oh, why not? I said. 
All things are possible, and has he been your young man long? Six years. Oh, oh, I thought, well, let us write your letter. And I tell you plainly that I would willingly have changed places with this Boles, if his fair correspondent had been not Teresa but something less than she. I thank you most heartily, sir, for your kind service, said Teresa to me with courtesy. Perhaps I can show you some service, eh? No, I must humbly thank you all the same. Perhaps, sir, your shirts or your trousers may want a little mending. I felt that this mastodon in petticoats had made me grow quite red with shame, and I told her pretty sharply that I had no need whatever of her service. She departed. A week or two passed away. It was evening. I was sitting at my window whistling and thinking of some expedient for enabling me to get away from myself. I was bored. The weather was dirty. I didn't want to go out, and out of sheer ennui I began a course of self-analysis and reflection. This also was dull enough work, but I didn't care about doing anything else. Then the door opened. Heaven be praised. Someone came in. Oh, Mr. Student, you have no pressing business, I hope. It was Teresa. Humph. No, what is it? I was going to ask you, sir, to write me another letter. Very well. To Boles, eh? No, this time it is from him. What? Stupid that I am. It is not for me, Mr. Student. I beg your pardon. It is for a friend of mine, that is to say, not a friend, but an acquaintance. A man acquaintance. He has a sweetheart just like me here, Teresa. That's how it is. Will you, sir, write a letter to this Teresa? I looked at her. Her face was troubled, her fingers were trembling, I was a bit fogged at first, and then I guessed how it was. Look here, my lady, I said. There are no Boleses or Teresas at all, and you have been telling me a pack of lies. Don't you come sneaking about me any longer. I have no wish whatever to cultivate your acquaintance. Do you understand? And suddenly she grew strangely terrified and distraught. She began to shift from foot to foot without moving from the place, and spluttered comically, as if she wanted to say something and couldn't. I waited to see what would come of all this, and I saw and felt that apparently I had made a great mistake in suspecting her of wishing to draw me from the path of righteousness. It was evidently something very different. Mr. Student, she began, and suddenly waving her hand, she turned abruptly towards the door and went out. I remained with a very unpleasant feeling in my mind. I listened. Her door was flung violently too. Plainly, the poor wench was very angry. I thought it over and resolved to go to her and inviting her to come in here, write everything she wanted. I entered her apartment. I looked around. She was sitting at a table, leaning on her elbows, with her head in her hands. Listen to me, I said. Now, whenever I come to this point in my story, I always feel horribly, awkward and idiotic. Well, well. Listen to me, I said. She leaped from her seat, came towards me with flashing eyes, and lying her hands on my shoulders began to whisper, or razor to hum in her peculiar bass voice. Look, you, now! It's like this, there is no Boles at all, and there is no Teresa either, but what's that to you? Is it a hard thing for you to draw your pen over paper, eh? Ah, and you, too, still, such a little fair-haired boy. There is nobody at all, neither Boles, nor Teresa, only me. There you have it, and much good may it do you. Pardon me, said I altogether, flabbergasted by such a reception. What is it all about? There is no Boles, you say? No, so it is. And no Teresa either? And no Teresa. I am Teresa. 
I didn't understand it at all. I fixed my eyes upon her and tried to make out of which of us was taking leave of his or her senses. But she went again to the table, searched about for something, came back to me and said in offended tone, If it was so hard for you to write to Boles, look, there is your letter, take it, others will write for me. I looked, in her hands was my letter to Boles. <laughs> Listen, Teresa, what is the meaning of all this? Why must you get others to write for you when I have already written it, and you haven't sent it? Send it where? Why, to this Boles? There is no such person. I absolutely did not understand it. There was nothing for me but to spit and go. Then she explained. What is it? She said, still offended. There is no such person. I tell you. And she extended her arms as if she herself did not understand why there should be no such person. But I wanted him to be. Am I then not a human creature like the rest of them? Yes, yes, I know, I know, of course. Yet no harm was done to anyone by my writing to him, that I can see. Pardon me, to whom? To Boles, of course. But he doesn't exist. Alas, alas, but what if he doesn't? He doesn't exist, but he might. I write to him, and it looks as if he did exist. And Teresa, that's me, and he replies to me, and then I write to him again. I understood at last, and I felt so sick, so miserable, so ashamed somehow. Alongside of me, not three yards away, lived a human creature who had nobody in the world to treat her kindly, affectionately, and this human being had invented a friend for herself. Look now. You wrote me a letter to Boles, and I gave it to someone else to read it to me. And when they read it to me, I listened and fancied that Boles was there. And I asked you to write me a letter from Boles to Teresa, that is to me. When they write such a letter for me and read it to me, I feel quite sure that Boles is there, and life grows easier on me in consequence. Deuce take you for a blockhead! said I to myself when I heard this. And from thenceforth, regularly, twice a week, I wrote a letter to Boles, an answer from Boles to Teresa. I wrote those answers well. She, of course, listened to them and wept like anything, roared, I should say, with her bass voice. And in return for my thus moving her to tears by real letters from the imaginary Boles, she began to mend the holes I had in my socks, shirts, and other articles of clothing. Subsequently, about three months after this history began, they put her in prison for something or other. No doubt by this time she is dead. My acquaintance shook the ash from his cigarette, looked pensively up at the sky, and thus concluded, Well, well, the more a human creature has tasted of bitter things, the more it hungers after the sweet things of life and we wrapped round in the rugs of our virtues and regarding other through the mist of our self-sufficiency and persuade of our universal impeccability do not understand this. And the whole thing turns out pretty stupidly and very cruelly, the fallen classes we say, and who are the fallen classes I should like to know? They are first of all people with the same bones, flesh and blood and nerves as ourselves, we have been told this day after day for ages, and we actually listen, and the devil only knows how hideous the whole thing is. Or are we completely depraved by the loud sermonizing of humanism? In reality, we also are fallen folks, and so far as I can see, very deeply fallen into the abyss of self-sufficiency and the conviction of our own superiority. But enough of this. It is all as old as the hills, so old that it is a shame to speak of it, very old indeed. Yes, that's what it is. End of Your Lover Recording by Vlad Zhulov. The Imp of the Perverse 
by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Fetterman. The Imp of the Perverse by Edgar Allan Poe. In the consideration of the faculties and impulses, of the prima mobilia of the human soul, the phrenologists have failed to make room for a propensity which, although obviously existing as a radical, primitive, irreducible sentiment, has been equally overlooked by all the moralists who have preceded them. In the pure arrogance of the reason we have all overlooked it, we have suffered its existence to escape our senses solely through want of belief, of faith, whether it be faith in revelation or faith in the Kabbalah. The idea of it has never occurred to us simply because of its supererogation. We saw no need of the impulse for the propensity. We could not perceive its necessity. We could not understand. That is to say, we could not have understood. Had the notion of this primo mobile ever obtruded itself, we could not have understood in what manner it might be made to further the objects of humanity, either temporal or eternal. It cannot be denied that phrenology, and, in great measure, all metaphysicianism, have been concocted a priori. The intellectual or logical man, rather than the understanding or observant man, set himself to imagine designs, to dictate purposes to God. Having thus fathomed to his satisfaction the intentions of Jehovah, out of these intentions he built his innumerable systems of mind. In the matter of phrenology, for example, we first determined, naturally enough, that it was the design of the deity that man should eat. We then assigned to man an organ of alimentiveness, and this organ is the scourge with which the deity compels man, willy-nilly, into eating. Secondly, having settled it to be God's will that man should continue his species, we discovered an organ of amativeness forthwith. And so with combativeness, with ideality, with causality, with constructiveness, so in short, with every organ, whether representing a propensity, a moral sentiment, or a faculty of the pure intellect. And in these arrangements of the Principia of human action, the Spursamites, whether right or wrong, in part, or upon the whole, have but followed in principle the footsteps of their predecessors, deducing and establishing everything from the preconceived destiny of man, and upon the ground of the objects of his creator. It would have been wiser, it would have been safer to classify, if classify we must, upon the basis of what man usually or occasionally did, and was always occasionally doing, rather than upon the basis of what we took it for granted the deity intended him to do. If we cannot comprehend God in his visible works, how then in his inconceivable thoughts that call the works into being? If we cannot understand him in his objective creatures, how then in his substantive moods and phases of creation? Induction, a posteriori, would have brought phrenology to admit as an innate and primitive principle of human action, a paradoxical something, which we may call perverseness, for want of a more characteristic term. In the sense I intend, it is in fact a mobile without motive, a motive not motivert. Through its promptings we act without comprehensible object, or, if this shall be understood as a contradiction in terms, we may so far modify the proposition as to say that through its promptings we act for the reason that we should not. In theory, no reason can be more unreasonable, but in fact, there is none more strong. With certain minds, under certain conditions, it becomes absolutely irresistible. 
I am not more certain that I breathe than that the assurance of the wrong or error of any action is often the one unconquerable force which impels us, and alone impels us to its prosecution. Nor will this overwhelming tendency to do wrong for the wrong's sake admit of analysis or resolution into ulterior elements. It is a radical, a primitive impulse elementary. It will be said, I am aware, that when we persist in acts because we feel we should not persist in them, our conduct is but a modification of that which ordinarily springs from the combativeness of phrenology. But a glance will show the fallacy of this idea. The phrenological combativeness has for its essence the necessity of self-defense. It is our safeguard against injury. Its principle regards our well-being, and thus the desire to be well is excited simultaneously with its development. It follows that the desire to be well must be excited simultaneously with any principle which shall be merely a modification of combativeness. But in the case of that something which I term perverseness, the desire to be well is not only aroused, but a strongly antagonistical sentiment exists. An appeal to one's own heart is, after all, the best reply to this sophistry just noticed. No one who trustingly consults and thoroughly questions his own soul will be disposed to deny the entire radicalness of the propensity in question. It is not more incomprehensible than distinctive. There lives no man who at some period has not been tormented. For example, by an earnest desire to tantalize the listener by circumlocution. The speaker is aware that he displeases. He has every intention to please. He is usually curt, precise, and clear. The most laconic and luminous language is struggling for utterance upon his tongue. It is only with difficulty that he restrains himself from giving it flow. He dreads and deprecates the anger of him whom he addresses. Yet the thought strikes him that by certain involutions and parentheses, this anger may be engendered. That single thought is enough. The impulse increases to a wish, the wish to a desire, the desire to an uncontrollable longing, and the longing to the deep regret and mortification of the speaker, and in defiance of all consequences, is indulged. We have a task before us which must be speedily performed. We know that it will be ruinous to make delay. The most important crisis of our life calls, trumpet-tongued for immediate energy and action. We glow. We are consumed with eagerness to commence the work, with the anticipation of whose glorious result our whole souls are on fire. It must. It shall be undertaken today, and yet we put it off until tomorrow. And why? There is no answer except that we feel perverse, using the word with no comprehension of the principle. Tomorrow arrives, and with it a more impatient anxiety to do our duty. But with this very increase of anxiety arrives, also a nameless, a positively fearful, because unfathomable, craving for delay. This craving gathers strength as the moments fly. The last hour for action is at hand. We tremble with the violence of the conflict within us, of the definite with the indefinite, of the substance with the shadow. But if the contest have proceeded thus far, it is the shadow which prevails. We struggle in vain. The clock strikes, and it is the knell of our welfare. At the same time, it is the chanticleer. Note to the ghost that has so long overawed us. It flies, it disappears, we are free. The old energy returns. We will labor now. Alas, it is too late. We stand upon the brink of a precipice. We peer into the abyss, we grow sick and dizzy. Our first impulse is to shrink from the danger. Unaccountably, we remain. By slow degrees, our sickness and dizziness and horror become merged in a cloud of unnameable feeling. By gradations still more imperceptible, this cloud assumes shape, 
as did the vapor from the bottle out of which arose the genius in the Arabian Nights. But out of this our cloud upon the precipice's edge, there grows into palpability a shape far more terrible than any genius or any demon of a tale. And yet it is but a thought although a fearful one, and one which chills the very marrow of our bones with the fierceness of the delight of its horror. It is merely the idea of what would be our sensations during the sweeping precipitancy of a fall from such a height. And this fall, this rushing annihilation, for the very reason that it involves that one most ghastly and loathsome of all the most ghastly and loathsome images of death and suffering which have ever presented themselves to our imagination. For this very cause do we now the most vividly desire it. And because our reason violently deters us from the brink, therefore do we the most impetuously approach it. There is no passion in nature so demoniacally impatient as that of him who, shuddering upon the edge of a precipice, thus meditates a plunge. To indulge for a moment in any attempt at thought is to be inevitably lost, for reflection but urges us to forbear, and therefore it is, I say, that we cannot. If there be no friendly arm to check us, or if we fail in a sudden effort to prostrate ourselves backward from the abyss, we plunge and are destroyed. Examine these similar actions as we will. We shall find them resulting solely from the spirit of the perverse. We perpetrate them because we feel that we should not. Beyond or behind this, there is no intelligible principle. And we might indeed deem this perverseness a direct instigation of the arch-fiend, were it not occasionally known to operate in the furtherance of good. I have said thus much, that in some measure I may answer your question, that I may explain to you why I am here, that I may assign to you something that shall have at least the faint aspect of a cause for my wearing these fetters, and for my tenanting this cell of the condemned. Had I not been thus prolix, you might either have misunderstood me altogether, or, with the rabble, have fancied me mad. As it is, you will easily perceive that I am one of the many uncounted victims of the imp of the perverse. It is impossible that any deed could have been wrought with a more thorough deliberation. For weeks, for months, I pondered upon the means of the murder. I rejected a thousand schemes because their accomplishment involved a chance of detection. At length, in reading some French memoirs, I found an account of a nearly fatal illness that occurred to Madame Pilau through the agency of a candle accidentally poisoned. The idea struck my fancy at once. I knew my victim's habit of reading in bed. I knew, too, that his apartment was narrow and ill-ventilated. But I need not vex you with the impertinent details. I need not describe the easy artifices by which I substituted in his bedroom candlestand a wax light of my own making for the one which I there found. The next morning he was discovered dead in his bed, and the coroner's verdict was, Death by the visitation of God. Having inherited his estate, all went well with me for years. The idea of detection never once entered my brain. Of the remains of the fatal taper, I had myself carefully disposed. I had left no shadow of a clue by which it would be possible to convict, or even to suspect me of the crime. It is inconceivable how rich a sentiment of satisfaction arose in my bosom as I reflected upon my absolute security. For a very long period of time, I was accustomed to revel in this sentiment. It afforded me more real delight than all the mere worldly advantages accruing from my sin. But there arrived at length an epoch, from which the pleasurable feeling grew, by scarcely perceptible gradations, into a haunting and harassing thought. It harassed because it haunted. I could scarcely get rid of it for an instant. It is quite a common thing to be thus annoyed with the ringing in our ears, or rather in our memories 
of the burthen of some ordinary song, or some unimpressive snatches from an opera. Nor will we be the less tormented if the song in itself is good, or the opera airs meritorious. In this manner, at last, I would perpetually catch myself pondering upon my security, and repeating in a low undertone the phrase, I am safe. One day, while sauntering along the streets, I arrested myself in the act of murmuring half aloud these customary syllables. In a fit of petulance, I remodeled them thus. I am safe. I am safe, yes, if I not be fool enough to make open confession. No sooner had I spoken these words than I felt an icy chill creep to my heart. I had had some experience in these fits of perversity whose nature I have been at some trouble to explain, and I remembered well that in no instance I had successfully resisted their attacks. And now my own casual self-suggestion that I might possibly be fool enough to confess the murder of which I had been guilty confronted me, as if the very ghost of him whom I had murdered and beckoned me on to death. At first... I made an effort to shake off this nightmare of the soul. I walked vigorously, faster, and still faster at length I ran. I felt a maddening desire to shriek out loud. Every succeeding wave of thought overwhelmed me with new terror, for alas, I well, too well understood that to think in my situation was to be lost. I still quickened my pace, I bounded like a madman through the crowded thoroughfares. At length, the populace took the alarm and pursued me. I felt then the consummation of my fate. Could I have torn out my tongue, I would have done it. But a rough voice resounded in my ears. A rougher grasp seized me by the shoulder. I turned. I gasped for breath. For a moment, I experienced all the pangs of suffocation. I became blind and deaf and giddy. And then some invisible fiend, I thought, struck me with his broad palm upon the back. The long imprisoned secret burst forth from my soul. They say that I spoke with distinct enunciation, but with marked emphasis and passionate hurry, as if in dread of interruption before concluding the brief but pregnant sentences that consigned me to the hangman and to hell. Having related all that was necessary for the fullest judicial conviction, I fell prostrate in a swoon. But why shall I say more? Today I wear these chains, and am here. Tomorrow I shall be fetterless. But where? End of the Imp of the Perverse Recording by David Fetterman The Kiss by Kate Chopin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kavanj Atmaja, Izmir, Turkey, 2008. It was still quite light out of doors but inside, with the curtains drawn, and the smoldering fire sending out a dim, uncertain glow, the room was full of deep shadows. Brentain sat in one of these shadows. It had overtaken him, and he did not mind. The obscurity lent him courage to keep his eyes fastened, as ardently as he liked upon the girl who sat in the firelight. She was very handsome with a certain fine, rich coloring that belongs to the Helter Bruin type. She was quite composed, as she idly stroked the satiny coat of the cat that lay curled in her lap, and she occasionally sent a slow glance into the shadow where her companion sat. They were talking low of indifferent things, 
which plainly were not the things that occupied their thoughts. She knew that he loved her, a frank, blustering fellow, without guile enough to conceal his feelings, and no desire to do so. For two weeks past he had sought her society eagerly and persistently. She was confidently waiting for him to declare himself, and she meant to accept him. The rather insignificant and unattractive Brantain was enormously rich, and she liked and required the entourage which wealth could give her. During one of the pauses between their talk of the last tea and the next reception, the door opened and a young man entered whom Brantain knew quite well. The girl turned her face toward him. A stride or two brought him to her side, and bending over her chair, before she could suspect his intention, for she did not realize that he had not seen her visitor, he pressed an ardent, lingering kiss upon her lips. Brentain slowly arose, so did the girl arise, but quickly, and the newcomer stood between them, a little amusement and some defiance struggling with the confusion in his face. I believe, stammered Brentain, I see that I have stayed too long. I... I had no idea. That is... I must wish you goodbye. He was clutching his hat with both hands, and probably did not perceive that she was extending her hand to him. Her presence of mind had not completely deserted her, but she could not have trusted herself to speak. Hang me if I saw him sitting there, Nathy. I know it's deuced awkward for you but I hope you'll forgive me this once, this very first break. Why, what's the matter? Don't touch me, don't come near me, she returned angrily. What do you mean by entering the house without ringing? I came in with your brother, as I often do, he answered coldly in self-justification. We came in the side way. He went upstairs and I came in here hoping to find you. The explanation is simple enough and ought to satisfy you that the misadventure was unavoidable. But do say that you forgive me, Natalie, he entreated, softening. Forgive you? You don't know what you're talking about. Let me pass. It depends upon a good deal whether I ever forgive you. At that next reception, which she and Brentain had been talking about, she approached the young man with a delicious frankness of manner when she saw him there. Will you let me speak to you a moment or two, Mr. Braintain? she asked with an engaging but perturbed smile. He seemed extremely unhappy, but when she took his arm and walked away with him, seeking a retired corner, a ray of hope mingled with the almost comical misery of his expression. She was apparently very outspoken. Perhaps I should not have sold this interview, Mr. Brentain, but, but, oh, I have been very uncomfortable, almost miserable since that little encounter the other afternoon, when I thought how you might have misinterpreted it, and believed things. Hope was plainly gaining the ascendancy over misery in Brentain's round, guileless face. Of course, I know it is nothing to you, but for my own sake, I do want you to understand that Mr. Harvey is an intimate friend of long standing. Why, we have always been like cousins, like brother and sister, I may say. He is my brother's most intimate associate, and often fancies that he is entitled to the same privileges as the family. Oh, I know it is absurd, uncalled for, to tell you this, undignified even. She was almost weeping but it makes so much difference to me what you think of of me her voice had grown very low and agitated the misery had all disappeared from Brentain's face then you do really care what I think Miss Natalie may I call you Miss Natalie they turned into a long dim corridor that was lined on either side with tall graceful plants they walked slowly to the very end of it. 
when they turned to retrace their steps, Brentain's face was radiant and hers was triumphant. Harry was among the guests at the wedding, and he sought her out in a rare moment when she stood alone. Your husband, he said, smiling, has sent me over to kiss you. A quick blush suffused her face and round polished throat. I suppose it's natural for a man to feel and act generously on an occasion of this kind. He tells me he doesn't want his marriage to interrupt wholly that pleasant intimacy which has existed between you and me. I don't know what you've been telling him, with an insolent smile, but he has sent me here to kiss you. She felt like a chess player who, by the clever handling of his pieces, sees the game taking the course intended. Her eyes were bright and tender with a smile as they glanced up into his, and her lips looked hungry for the kiss which they invited. But you know, he went on quietly, I didn't tell him so, it would have seemed ungrateful, but I can tell you. I have stopped kissing women, it's dangerous. Well, she had Brentain and his million left. A person can't have everything in this world, and it was a little unreasonable of her to expect it. End of The Kiss Recording by Kıvanç Atmaca, Izmir, Turkey, 2008The Lady or the Tiger by Frank R. Stockton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Fetterman. The Lady or the Tiger by Frank R. Stockton. In the very olden time, there lived a semi barbaric king whose ideas, though somewhat polished and sharpened by the progressiveness of distant Latin neighbors, were still large, florid, and untrammeled, as became the half of him which was barbaric. He was a man of exuberant fancy, and withal of an authority so irresistible, that at his will he turned his varied fancies into facts. He was greatly given to self-communing, and when he and himself agreed upon anything, the thing was done. When every member of his domestic and political systems moved smoothly in its appointed course, his nature was bland and genial. But whenever there was a little hitch, and some of his orbs got out of their orbits, he was blander and more genial still, for nothing pleased him so much as to make the crooked straight and crush down uneven places. Among the borrowed notions by which his barbarism had become semified, was that of the public arena, in which by exhibitions of manly and beastly valor, the minds of his subjects were refined and cultured. But even here, the exuberant and barbaric fancy asserted itself. The arena of the king was built not to give the people an opportunity of hearing the rhapsodies of dying gladiators, nor to enable them to view the inevitable conclusion of a conflict between religious opinions and hungry jaws but for purposes far better adapted to widen and develop the mental energies of the people. This vast amphitheater, with its encircling galleries, its mysterious vaults, and its unseen passages, was an agent of poetic justice in which crime was punished, or virtue rewarded by the decrees of an impartial and incorruptible chance. When a subject was accused of a crime of sufficient importance to interest the king, public notice was given that on an appointed day, the fate of the accused person would be decided in the king's arena, a structure which well deserved its name. For although its form and plan were borrowed from afar, its purpose emanated solely from the brain of this man, who, every barley corn a king, knew no tradition to which he owed more allegiance than pleased his fancy and who engrafted on every adopted form of human thought and action the rich growth of his barbaric idealism. 
when all the people had assembled in the galleries, and the king, surrounded by his court, sat high up on his throne of royal state on one side of the arena, he gave a signal. A door beneath him opened, and the accused subject stepped out onto the amphitheater. Directly opposite him, on either side, in the enclosed space, were two open doors, exactly alike and side by side. It was the duty and the privilege of the person on trial to walk directly to these doors and open one of them. He could open either door he pleased. He was subject to no guidance or influence but that of the aforementioned impartial and incorruptible chance. If he opened the one, there came out of it a hungry tiger, the fiercest and most cruel that could be procured, which immediately sprang upon him and tore him to pieces as a punishment for his guilt. The moment that the case of the criminal was thus decided, doleful iron bells were clanged, great wells went up from the hired mourners posted on the outer rim of the arena, and the vast audience, with bowed heads and downcast hearts, wended slowly their homeward way, mourning greatly that one so young and fair, or so old and respected, should have merited so dire a fate. But if the accused person opened the other door, there came forth from it a lady, the most suitable to his years and station that his majesty could select from among his fair subjects. And to this lady he was immediately married as a reward of his innocence. It mattered not he might already possess a wife and family, or that his affections might be engaged upon an object of his own selection. The king allowed no such subordinate arrangements to interfere with his great scheme of retribution and reward. The exercises, as in the other instance, took place immediately, and in the arena. Another door opened beneath the king, and a priest followed by a band of choristers, and dancing maidens blowing joyous airs on golden horns, and treading an epithalamic measure, advanced to where the pair stood side by side, and the wedding was promptly and cheerily solemnized. When the gay brass bells rang forth their merry peals, the people shouted glad hurrahs, and the innocent man, preceded by children strewing flowers on his path, led his bride to his home. This was the king's semi-barbaric method of administering justice. Its perfect fairness is obvious. The criminal could not know out of which door would come the lady. He opened either as he pleased, without having the slightest idea whether in the next instant he was to be devoured or married. On some occasions the tiger came out of one door and on some out of the other. The decisions of this tribunal were not only fair, they were positively determinate. The accused person was instantly punished if he found himself guilty, and, if innocent, he was rewarded on the spot whether he liked it or not. There was no escape from the judgments of the king's arena. The institution was a very popular one. When the people gathered together on one of the great trial days, they never knew whether they were to witness a bloody slaughter or a hilarious wedding. This element of uncertainty lent an interest to the occasion which it could not have otherwise have attained. Thus the masses were entertained and pleased, and the thinking part of the community could bring no charge of unfairness against this plan, for did not the accused person have the whole matter in his own hands? This semi-barbaric king had a daughter, as blooming as his most florid fancies, and with a soul as fervent and imperious as his own. As is usual in such cases, she was the apple of his eye, and was loved by him above all humanity. Among his courtiers was a young man of that fineness of blood and lowness of station common to the conventional heroes of romance, who love royal maidens. This royal maiden was well satisfied with her lover, for he was handsome and brave to a degree unsurpassed in all this kingdom and she loved him with an ardor that had enough of barbarism in it to make it exceedingly warm and strong. This love affair moved on happily for many months, until one day the king happened to discover its existence. He did not hesitate nor waver in regard to his duty in the premises. The youth was immediately cast into prison, and a day was appointed for his trial in the king's arena. This, of course, was an especially important occasion, and his majesty, as well as all the people, was greatly interested in the workings and development of this trial. Never before had such a case occurred. 
Never before had a subject dared to love the daughter of the king. In after years such things became commonplace enough, but then they were in no slight degree novel and startling. The tiger cages of the kingdom were searched for the most savage and relentless beasts, from which the fiercest monster might be selected for the arena. And the ranks of maiden youth and beauty throughout the land were carefully surveyed by competent judges in order that the young man might have a fitting bride, in case fate did not determine for himself a different destiny. Of course, everybody knew that the deed with which the accused was charged had been done. He had loved the princess, and neither he, she, nor anyone else thought of denying the fact. But the king would not think of allowing any fact of this kind to interfere with the workings of the tribunal, in which he took such great delight and satisfaction. No matter how the affair turned out, the youth would be disposed of, and the king would take an aesthetic pleasure in watching the course of events, which would determine whether or not the young man had done wrong in allowing himself to love the princess. The appointed day arrived. From far and near the people gathered and thronged to the great galleries of the arena, and the crowds, unable to gain admittance, massed themselves against its outside walls. The king and his court were in their places opposite the twin doors, those fateful portals so terrible in their similarity. All was ready. The signal was given. A door beneath the royal party opened, and the lover of the princess walked into the arena, Tall, beautiful, fair, his appearance was greeted with a low hum of admiration and anxiety. Half the audience had not known so grand a youth had lived among them. No wonder the princess loved him. What a terrible thing for him to be there. As the youth advanced into the arena, he turned, as the custom was, to bow to the king. But he did not think at all of that royal personage. His eyes were fixed upon the princess, who sat to the right of her father. Had it not been for the moiety of barbarism in her nature, it is probable that the lady would not have been there. But her intense and fervid soul would not allow her to be absent on an occasion in which she was so terribly interested. From the moment that the decree had gone forth that her lover should decide his fate in the king's arena, she had thought of nothing, night or day, but this great event and the various subjects connected with it. Possessed of more power, influence, and force of character than anyone who had ever been interested in such a case, she had done what no other person had done. She had possessed herself of the secret of the doors. She knew in which of the two rooms that lay behind those doors stood the cage of the tiger with its open front, and in which waited the lady. Through these thick doors, heavily curtained with skins on the inside, it was impossible that any noise or suggestion should come from within to the person who should approach to raise the latch on one of them but gold and the power of a woman's will had brought the secret to the princess. And not only did she know which room stood the lady ready to emerge, all blushing and radiant should her door be opened, but she knew who the lady was. It was one of the fairest and loveliest of the damsels of the court who had been selected as a reward of the accused youth, should he be proven innocent of the crime of aspiring to one so far above him. And the princess hated her. Often had she seen, or imagined that she had seen, this fair creature throwing glances of admiration upon the person of her lover, and sometimes she thought these glances were perceived and even returned. Now and then she had seen them talking together. It was but for a moment or two, but much can be said in a brief space, and it may have been on most unimportant topics, but how could she know that? The girl was lovely, but she had dared to raise her eyes to the loved one of the princess, and with all the intensity of the savage blood transmitted to her through those long lines of holy barbaric ancestors, she hated the woman who blushed and trembled behind that silent door. When her lover turned and looked at her, and his eye met hers, and she sat there paler and whiter than anyone in the vast ocean of anxious faces about her, he saw, by that power of quick perception which is given to those whose souls are one, that she knew behind which door crouched the tiger, and behind which stood the lady. He had expected her to know it. He understood her nature, and his soul was assured she would never rest until she had made plain to herself this thing, hidden to all other lookers-on, even to the king. The only hope for the youth in which there was any element of certainty 
was based upon the success of the princess in discovering this mystery. And the moment he looked upon her, he saw she had succeeded, as in his soul he knew she would succeed. Then it was that his quick and anxious glance asked the question, Which? It was as plain to her as if he had shouted it from where he stood. There was not an instant to be lost. The question was asked in a flash. It must be answered in another. Her right arm lay on the cushioned parapet before her. She raised her hand and made a slight, quick movement toward the right. No one but her lover saw her. Every eye but his was fixed on the man in the arena. He turned, and with a firm and rapid step he walked across the empty space. Every heart stopped beating, every breath was held, every eye was fixed movably upon that man. Without the slightest hesitation, he went to the door on the right and opened it. Now, the point of the story is this. Did the tiger come out of that door, or did the lady? The more we reflect upon this question, the harder it is to answer. It involves a study of the human heart which leads us through devious mazes of passion, out of which it is difficult to find our way. Think of it, fair reader, not as if the decision of the question depended upon yourself, but upon that hot-blooded semi-barbaric princess, her soul at a white heat beneath the combined fires of despair and jealousy. She had lost him, but who should have him? How often, in her waking hours and in her dreams, had she started in wild horror and covered her face with her hands as she thought of her lover opening the door on the other side of which waited the cruel fangs of the tiger. But how much oftener had she seen him at the other door? How, in her grievous reveries, had she gnashed her teeth and torn her hair when she saw his start of rapturous delight as he opened the door of the lady? How her soul had burned in agony when she had seen him rush to meet that woman with her flushing cheek and sparkling eye of triumph. When she had seen him lead her forth, his whole frame kindled with the joy of recovered life. When she had heard the glad shouts from the multitude and the wild ringing of the happy bells. When she had seen the priest and his joyous followers advance to the couple and make them man and wife before her very eyes and when she had seen them walk away together upon their path of flowers, followed by the tremendous shouts of the hilarious multitude, in which her one despairing shriek was lost and drowned. Would it not be better for him to die at once and go to wait for her in the blessed regions of semi-barbaric futurity? And yet, that awful tiger, those shrieks, that blood! Her decision had been indicated in an instant but it had been made after days and nights of anguished deliberation. She had known she would be asked. She had decided what she would answer, and without the slightest hesitation she had moved her hand to the right. The question of her decision is not one to be lightly considered, and it is not for me to presume to set myself up as the one person able to answer it. And so I leave it with all of you, which came out of the open door the lady or the tiger end of the lady or the tiger recording by david fetterman the lady with the dog this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. The Lady with the Dog by Anton Chekhov. Part 1 It was said that a new person had appeared on the seafront. A lady with a little dog. Dmitri Dmitrich Gurov, who had by then been a fortnight at Yalta, and so was fairly at home there, had begun to take an interest in new arrivals. Sitting in Vernet's pavilion, he saw, walking on the seafront, a fair-haired young lady of medium height, wearing a beret. A white Pomeranian dog was running behind her. And afterwards, he met her in the public gardens, 
and in the square several times a day. She was walking alone, always wearing the same beret, and always with the same white dog. No one knew who she was, and everyone called her simply, the lady with the dog. If she is here alone without a husband or friend, it wouldn't be amiss to make her acquaintance, Gurov reflected. He was under forty, but he had a daughter already twelve years old, and two sons at school. He had been married young, when he was a student in his second year, and by now his wife seemed half as old again as he. She was a tall, erect woman with dark eyebrows, staid and dignified, and, as she said of herself, intellectual. She read a great deal, used phonetic spelling, called her husband not Dmitri but Dmitri, and he secretly considered her unintelligent, narrow, inelegant, was afraid of her, and did not like to be at home. He had begun being unfaithful to her long ago, had been unfaithful to her often, and probably on that account, almost always spoke ill of women, and when they were talked about in his presence, used to call them the lower race. It seemed to him that he had been so schooled by bitter experience that he might call them what he liked, and yet he could not get on for two days together without the lower race. In the society of men, he was bored and not himself. With them he was cold and uncommunicative, but when he was in the company of women he felt free and knew what to say to them and how to behave, and he was at ease with them even when he was silent. In his appearance, in his character, in his whole nature, there was something attractive and elusive which allured women and disposed them in his favor. He knew that, and some force seemed to draw him, too, to them. Experience often repeated, truly bitter experience, had taught him long ago that with decent people, especially Moscow people, always slow to move and irresolute, every intimacy, which at first so agreeably diversifies life and appears a light and charming adventure, inevitably grows into a regular problem of extreme intricacy, and in the long run the situation becomes unbearable. But at every fresh meeting with an interesting woman, this experience seemed to slip out of his memory, and he was eager for life and everything seemed simple and amusing. One evening he was dining in the gardens, and the lady in the beret came up slowly to take the next table. Her expression, her gait, her dress, and the way she did her hair told him that she was a lady, that she was married, that she was in Yalta for the first time and alone and that she was dull there. The stories told of the immorality in such places as Yalta are to a great extent untrue. He despised them, and knew that such stories were for the most part made up by persons who would themselves have been glad to sin if they had been able. But when the lady sat down at the next table three paces from him, he remembered these tales of easy conquests, of trips to the mountains, and the tempting thought of a swift, fleeting love affair, a romance with an unknown woman whose name he did not know, suddenly took possession of him. He beckoned coaxingly to the Pomeranian, and when the dog came up to him he shook his finger at it. The Pomeranian growled, and Gurov shook his finger at it again. The lady looked at him, and at once dropped her eyes. He doesn't bite, she said, and blushed. May I give him a bone, he asked. And when she nodded, he asked courteously, Have you been long in Yalta? Five days. 
and I have already dragged out a fortnight here. There was a brief silence. Time goes fast, and yet it is so dull here, she said, not looking at him. That's only the fashion to say it is dull here. A provincial will live in Belyov or Zidra and not be dull, and when he comes here it's, oh, the dullness, oh, the dust. One would think he came from Grenada. She laughed. Then both continued eating in silence, like strangers. But, after dinner, they walked side by side, and there sprang up between them the light, jesting conversation of people who are free and satisfied, to whom it does not matter where they go or what they talk about. They walked and talked of the strange light on the sea. The water was of a soft, warm, lilac hue, and there was a golden streak from the moon upon it. They talked of how sultry it was after a hot day. Gurov told her that he came from Moscow, that he had taken his degree in arts, but had a post in a bank, that he had trained as an opera singer, but had given it up, that he owned two houses in Moscow. And from her, he learnt that she had grown up in Petersburg, but had lived in S since her marriage two years before, that she was staying another month in Yalta, and that her husband, who needed a holiday too, might perhaps come and fetch her. She was not sure whether her husband had a post in a crown department or under the provincial council and was amused by her own ignorance. And Gurov learnt, too, that she was called Anna Sergeyevna. Afterwards, he thought about her in his room at the hotel, thought she would certainly meet him next day. It would be sure to happen. As he got into bed, he thought how lately she had been a girl at school, doing lessons like his own daughter. He recalled the diffidence, the angularity that was still manifest in her laugh and her manner of talking with a stranger. This must have been the first time in her life she had been alone in surroundings in which she was followed, looked at, and spoken to merely from a secret motive, which she could hardly fail to guess. He recalled her slender, delicate neck, her lovely gray eyes. There's something pathetic about her anyway, he thought, and fell asleep. Part 2 A week had passed since they had made acquaintance. It was a holiday. It was sultry indoors, while in the street the wind whirled the dust round and round and blew people's hats off. It was a thirsty day, and Gurov often went into the pavilion and pressed Anna Sergeyevna to have syrup and water or an ice. One did not know what to do with oneself. In the evening, when the wind had dropped a little, they went out on the groin to see the steamer come in. There were a great many people walking about the harbor. They had gathered to welcome someone, bringing bouquets. And two peculiarities of a well-dressed Yalta crowd were very conspicuous. The elderly ladies were dressed like young ones, and there were great numbers of generals. Owing to the roughness of the sea, the steamer arrived late, after the sun had set, and it was a long time turning about before it reached the groin. Anna Sergeyevna looked through her lorgnette at the steamer and the passengers, as though looking for acquaintances. And when she turned to Gurov, her eyes were shining. She talked a great deal and asked disconnected questions, forgetting next moment what she had asked. Then she dropped her lorgnette in the crush. 
the festive crowd began to disperse. It was too dark to see people's faces. The wind had completely dropped. But Gurov and Anna Sergeyevna still stood as though waiting to see someone else come from the steamer. Anna Sergeyevna was silent now, and sniffed the flowers without looking at Gurov. The weather is better this evening, he said. Where shall we go now? Shall we drive somewhere? She made no answer. Then he looked at her intently, and all at once put his arm around her and kissed her on the lips, and breathed in the moisture and the fragrance of the flowers and he immediately looked round him, anxiously wondering whether anyone had seen them. Let us go to your hotel, he said softly, and both walked quickly. The room was close, and smelt of the scent she had bought at the Japanese shop. Gurov looked at her and thought, What different people one meets in the world? From the past... He preserved memories of careless, good-natured women who loved cheerfully and were grateful to him for the happiness he gave them, however brief it might be, and of women like his wife, who loved without any genuine feeling, with superfluous phrases, affectedly, hysterically, with an expression that suggested that it was not love nor passion but something more significant, and of two or three others, very beautiful, cold women, on whose faces he had caught a glimpse of a rapacious expression, an obstinate desire to snatch from life more than it could give, and these were capricious, unreflecting, domineering, unintelligent women, not in their first youth, and when Gurov grew cold to them, their beauty excited his hatred, and the lace on their linen seemed to him like scales. But in this case, there was still the diffidence, the angularity of inexperienced youth, an awkward feeling, and there was a sense of consternation as though someone had suddenly knocked at the door. The attitude of Anna Sergeyevna, the lady with the dog, to what had happened was somehow peculiar, very grave, as though it were her fall. So it seemed, and it was strange and inappropriate. Her face dropped and faded, and on both sides of it, her long hair hung down mournfully. She mused in a dejected attitude like the woman who was a sinner in an old-fashioned picture. It's wrong, she said. You will be the first to despise me now. There was a watermelon on the table. Gurov cut himself a slice and began eating it without haste. There followed at least half an hour of silence. Anna Sergeyevna was touching. There was about her the purity of a good, simple woman who had seen little of life. The solitary candle burning on the table threw a faint light on her face, yet it was clear that she was very unhappy. How could I despise you, asked Gurov. You don't know what you are saying. God forgive me, she said, and her eyes filled with tears. It's awful. You seem to feel you need to be forgiven. Forgiven? No. I am a bad, low woman. I despise myself and don't attempt to justify myself. It's not my husband but myself I have deceived, and not only just now. I have been deceiving myself for a long time. My husband may be a good, honest man, but he is a flunky. I don't know what he does there, what his work is, but I know he is a flunky. I was twenty when I was married to him. I have been tormented by curiosity. I wanted something better, 
There must be a different sort of life, I said to myself. I wanted to live, to live, to live. I was fired by curiosity. You don't understand it, but I swear to God, I could not control myself. Something happened to me. I could not be restrained. I told my husband I was ill and came here. And here, I have been walking about as though I were dazed like a mad creature, and now I have become a vulgar, contemptible woman whom anyone may despise. Gurov felt bored already listening to her. He was irritated by the naive tone, by this remorse, so unexpected and inopportune. But for the tears in her eyes, he might have thought she was jesting or playing a part. I don't understand, he said softly. What is it you want? She hid her face on his breast and pressed close to him. Believe me, believe me, I beseech you, she said. I love a pure, honest life, and sin is loathsome to me. I don't know what I am doing. Simple people say, the evil one has beguiled me. And I may say of myself now that the evil one has beguiled me. Hush, hush, he muttered. He looked at her, fixed, scared eyes, kissed her, talked softly and affectionately, and by degrees she was comforted, and her gaiety returned. They both began laughing. Afterwards, when they went out, there was not a soul on the seafront. The town, with its cypresses, had quite a death-like air, but the sea still broke noisily on the shore. A single barge was rocking on the waves, and a lantern was blinking sleepily on it. They found a cab and drove to Orianda. I found out your surname in the hall just now. It was written on the board. Von Dideritz, said Gurov. Is your husband a German? No. I believe his grandfather was a German, but he is an Orthodox Russian himself. At Orianda, they sat on a seat not far from the church, looked down at the sea, and were silent. Yalta was hardly visible through the morning mist. White clouds stood motionless on the mountain tops. The leaves did not stir on the trees. Grasshoppers chirruped, and the monotonous hollow sound of the sea rising up from below spoke of the peace, of the eternal sleep awaiting us. So it must have sounded when there was no Yalta, no Orianda here. So it sounds now. And it will sound as indifferently and monotonously when we are all no more. And in this constancy, in this complete indifference to the life and death of each of us, there lies hid, perhaps, a pledge of our eternal salvation, of the unceasing movement of life upon earth, of unceasing progress towards perfection. Sitting beside a young woman, who in the dawn seemed so lovely, soothed and spellbound in these magical surroundings, the sea, mountains, clouds, the open sky, Gurov thought how, in reality, everything is beautiful in this world when one reflects. Everything except what we think or do ourselves, when we forget our human dignity and the higher aims of our existence. A man walked up to them, probably a keeper, looked at them and walked away. And this detail seemed mysterious and beautiful, too. They saw a steamer come from Theodosia, 
with its lights out in the glow of dawn. There is dew on the grass, said Anna Sergeyevna, after a silence. Yes, it's time to go home. They went back to the town. Then they met every day at twelve o'clock on the seafront, lunched and dined together, went for walks, admired the sea. She complained that she slept badly, that her heart throbbed violently, asked the same questions, troubled now by jealousy, and now by the fear that he did not respect her sufficiently. And often in the square or gardens, when there was no one near them, he suddenly drew her to him and kissed her passionately. Complete idleness, these kisses in broad daylight, while he looked round in dread of someone seeing them, the heat, the smell of the sea, and the continual passing to and fro before him of idle, well-dressed, well-fed people, made a new man of him. He told Anna Sergeyevna how beautiful she was, how fascinating. He was impatiently passionate. He would not move a step away from her, while she was often pensive, and continually urged him to confess that he did not respect her did not love her in the least, and thought of her as nothing but a common woman. Rather late almost every evening, they drove somewhere out of town, to Orianda, or to the waterfall, and the expedition was always a success. The scenery invariably impressed them as grand and beautiful. They were expecting her husband to come, but a letter came from him, saying that there was something wrong with his eyes, and he entreated his wife to come home as quickly as possible. Anna Sergeyevna made haste to go. It's a good thing I am going away, she said to Gurov. It's the finger of destiny. She went by coach, and he went with her. They were driving the whole day. When she had got into a compartment of the express, and when the second bell had rung, she said, Let me look at you once more. Look at you once again. That's right. She did not shed tears, but was so sad that she seemed ill, and her face was quivering. I shall remember you. Think of you, she said. God be with you. Be happy. Don't remember evil against me. We are parting for ever. It must be so, for we ought never to have met. Well, God be with you. The train moved off rapidly. Its lights soon vanished from sight, and a minute later there was no sound of it, as though everything had conspired together to end as quickly as possible that sweet delirium, that madness. Left alone on the platform and gazing into the dark distance, Gurov listened to the chirrup of the grasshoppers and the hum of the telegraph wires, feeling as though he had only just waked up. And he thought, musing, that there had been another episode or adventure in his life, and it, too, was at an end, and nothing was left of it but a memory. He was moved, sad, and conscious of a slight remorse. This young woman, whom he would never meet again, had not been happy with him. He was genuinely warm and affectionate with her, but yet, in his manner, his tone, and his caresses, there had been a shade of light irony, the coarse condescension of a happy man who was, besides, almost twice her age. All the time she had called him kind, exceptional, 
lofty. Obviously, he had seemed to her different from what he really was. So he had unintentionally deceived her. Here at the station was already a scent of autumn. It was a cold evening. It's time for me to go north, thought Gurov, as he left the platform. High time. Part 3 At home in Moscow, everything was in its winter routine. The stoves were heated, and in the morning it was still dark when the children were having breakfast and getting ready for school, and the nurse would light the lamp for a short time. The frost had begun already. When the first snow has fallen, on the first day of sledge driving, it is pleasant to see the white earth, the white roofs, to draw soft, delicious breath, and the season brings back the days of one's youth. The old limes and birches, white with hoar-frost, have a good-natured expression. They are nearer to one's heart than cypresses and palms, and near them one doesn't want to be thinking of the sea and the mountains. Gurov was Moscow-born. He arrived in Moscow on a fine, frosty day, and when he put on his fur coat and warm gloves and walked along Petrovka, and when on Saturday evening he heard the ringing of the bells, his recent trip and the places he had seen lost all charm for him. Little by little, he became absorbed in Moscow life, greedily read three newspapers a day, and declared he did not read the Moscow papers on principle. He already felt a longing to go to restaurants, clubs, dinner parties, anniversary celebrations, and he felt flattered at entertaining distinguished lawyers and artists, and at playing cards with a professor at the doctor's club. He could already eat a whole plateful of salt fish and cabbage. In another month, he fancied, the image of Anna Sergeyevna would be shrouded in a mist in his memory, and only from time to time would visit him in his dreams with a touching smile, as others did. But more than a month passed, real winter had come, and everything was still clear in his memory as though he had parted with Anna Sergeyevna only the day before. And his memories glowed more and more vividly. When in the evening stillness he heard from his study the voices of his children preparing their lessons, or when he listened to a song or the organ at the restaurant, or the storm howled in the chimney, Suddenly everything would rise up in his memory, what had happened on the groin, and the early morning with the mist on the mountains, and the steamer coming from Theodosia, and the kisses. He would pace a long time about his room, remembering it all and smiling. Then his memories passed into dreams, and in his fancy, the past was mingled with what was to come. Anna Sergeyevna did not visit him in dreams, but followed him about everywhere like a shadow and haunted him. When he shut his eyes, he saw her as though she were living before him, and she seemed to him lovelier, younger, tender than she was and he imagined himself finer than he had been in Yalta. In the evenings, she peeped out at him from the bookcase, from the fireplace, from the corner. He heard her breathing, the caressing rustle of her dress. In the street, he watched the women looking for someone like her. He was tormented by an intense desire to confide his memories to someone, but in his home it was impossible to talk of his love, 
and he had no one outside. He could not talk to his tenants, nor to anyone at the bank. And what had he to talk of? Had he been in love, then? Had there been anything beautiful, poetical, or edifying, or simply interesting in his relations with Anna Sergeyevna? And there was nothing for him but to talk vaguely of love, of woman, and no one guessed what it meant. Only his wife twitched her black eyebrows and said, The part of a lady-killer does not suit you at all, Dimitri. One evening, coming out of the doctor's club with an official with whom he had been playing cards, he could not resist saying, If only you knew what a fascinating woman I made the acquaintance of in Yalta. The official got into his sledge and was driving away, but turned suddenly and shouted, Dmitri Dmitrich, what? You were right this evening. The sturgeon was a bit too strong. These words, so ordinary, for some reason moved Gurov to indignation and struck him as degrading and unclean. What savage manners, what people, what senseless nights, what uninteresting, uneventful days, the rage for card-playing, the gluttony, the drunkenness, the continual talk always about the same thing, useless pursuits and conversations always about the same things absorb the better part of one's time, the better part of one's strength, and in the end, there is left a life groveling and curtailed, worthless and trivial, and there is no escaping or getting away from it, just as though one were in a madhouse or a prison. Gurov did not sleep all night, and was filled with indignation, and he had a heartache all next day, and the next night he slept badly. He sat up in bed, thinking, or paced up and down his room. He was sick of his children, sick of the bank. He had no desire to go anywhere or to talk of anything. In the holidays in December, he prepared for a journey, and told his wife he was going to Petersburg to do something in the interests of a young friend. And he set off for S. What for? He did not very well know himself. He wanted to see Anna Sergeyevna and to talk with her, to arrange a meeting, if possible. He reached us in the morning, and took the best room at the hotel, in which the floor was covered with grey army cloth, and on the table was an inkstand, grey with dust, and adorned with a figure on horseback, with its hat in its hand, and its head broken off. The hotel porter gave him the necessary information. Von Dieterits lived in a house of his own in Old Gaunt Charney Street. It was not far from the hotel. He was rich, and lived in good style, and had his own horses. Everyone in the town knew him. The porter pronounced the name Dieterits. Gurov went without haste to old Gaunt Charney Street and found the house. Just opposite the house stretched a long grey fence adorned with nails. One would run away from a fence like that, thought Gurov, looking from the fence to the windows of the house and back again. He considered. Today was a holiday and the husband would probably be at home, and, in any case, it would be tactless to go into the house and upset her. If he were to send her a note, it might fall into her husband's hands, and then it might ruin everything. The best thing was to trust to chance, and he kept walking up and down the street by the fence, waiting for the chance. 
he saw a beggar go in at the gate and dogs fly at him then an hour later he heard a piano and the sounds were faint and indistinct probably it was anna sergeyevna playing the front door suddenly opened and an old woman came out followed by the familiar white pomeranian gurov was on the point of calling to the dog but his heart began beating violently and in his excitement he could not remember the dog's name he walked up and down and loathed the gray fence more and more and by now he thought irritably that anna sergeyevna had forgotten him and was perhaps already amusing herself with someone else and that that was very natural in a young woman who had nothing to look at from morning till night but that confounded fence he went back to his hotel room and sat for a long while on the sofa not knowing what to do then he had dinner and a long nap how stupid and worrying it is he thought when he woke and looked at the dark windows it was already evening here i have had a good sleep for some reason what shall i do in the night he sat on the bed which was covered by a cheap gray blanket such as one sees in hospitals and he taunted himself in his vexation so much for the lady with the dog so much for the adventure you're in a nice fix that morning at the station a poster in large letters had caught his eye the geisha was to be performed for the first time he thought of this and went to the theatre it's quite possible she may go to the first performance he thought the theatre was full as in all provincial theatres there was a fog above the chandelier the gallery was noisy and restless in the front row the local dandies were standing up before the beginning of the performance with their hands behind them in the governor's box the governor's daughter wearing a boa was sitting in the front seat while the governor himself lurked modestly behind the curtain with only his hands visible the orchestra was a long time tuning up the stage curtain swayed all the time the audience were coming in and taking their seats gurov looked at them eagerly anna sergeyevna too came in she sat down in the third row and when gurov looked at her his heart contracted and he understood clearly that for him there was in the whole world no creature so near so precious and so important to him she this little woman in no way remarkable lost in a provincial crowd with a vulgar lorgnette in her hand filled his whole life now was his sorrow and his joy the one happiness that he now desired for himself and to the sounds of the inferior orchestra of the wretched provincial violins he thought how lovely she was he thought and dreamed a young man with small side whiskers tall and stooping came in with anna sergeyevna and sat down beside her he bent his head at every step and seemed to be continually bowing most likely this was the husband whom at yalta in a rush of bitter feeling she had called a flunky and there really was in his long figure his side whiskers and the small bald patch on his head something of the flunky's obsequiousness his smile was sugary and in his buttonhole there was some badge of distinction like the number on a waiter during the first interval the husband went away to smoke she remained alone in her stall gurov who was sitting in the stalls too went up to her and said in a trembling voice with a forced smile good evening she glanced at him and turned pale then glanced again with horror 
unable to believe her eyes, and tightly gripped the fan and the lorgnette in her hands, evidently struggling with herself not to faint. Both were silent. She was sitting, he was standing. Frightened by her confusion and not venturing to sit down beside her, the violins and the flute began tuning up. He felt suddenly frightened. It seemed as though all the people in the boxes were looking at them. She got up and went quickly to the door. He followed her, and both walked senselessly along passages and up and down stairs and figures in legal, scholastic, and civil service uniforms, all wearing badges, flitted before their eyes. They caught glimpses of ladies, of fur coats hanging on pegs. The draughts blew on them, bringing a smell of stale tobacco. And Gurov, whose heart was beating violently, thought, Oh heavens, why are these people here and this orchestra? And at that instant, he recalled how when he had seen Anna Sergeyevna off at the station, he had thought that everything was over, and they would never meet again. But how far they were still from the end! On the narrow, gloomy staircase over which was written, To the Amphitheatre, she stopped. How you have frightened me, she said, breathing hard, still pale and overwhelmed. Oh, how you have frightened me! I am half dead. Why have you come? Why? But do understand, Anna, do understand, he said hastily in a low voice. I entreat you to understand. She looked at him with dread, with entreaty, with love. She looked at him intently, to keep his features more distinctly in her memory. I am so unhappy, she went on, not heeding him. I have thought of nothing but you all the time. I live only in the thought of you, and I wanted to forget, to forget you, but why, oh, why have you come? On the landing above them, two schoolboys were smoking and looking down, but that was nothing to Gurov. He drew Anna Sergeyevna to him and began kissing her face, her cheeks, and her hands. What are you doing? What are you doing? she cried in horror, pushing him away. We are mad. Go away today, go away at once. I beseech you by all that is sacred, I implore you. There are people coming this way. Someone was coming up the stairs. You must go away, Anna Sergeyevna went on in a whisper. Do you hear, Dmitri Dmitrich? I will come and see you in Moscow. I have never been happy. I am miserable now. And I never, never shall be happy. Never. Don't make me suffer still more. I swear I'll come to Moscow. But now let us part. My precious, good, dear one, we must part. She pressed his hand and began rapidly going downstairs, looking round at him. And from her eyes, he could see that she really was unhappy. Gurov stood for a little while, listened. Then, when all sound had died away, he found his coat and left the theater. Part 4 And Anna Sergeyevna began coming to see him in Moscow. Once, in two or three months, she left us, telling her husband that she was going to consult a doctor about an internal complaint. And her husband believed her, and did not believe her. In Moscow, she stayed at the Slavyansky Bazaar Hotel, and at once sent a man in a red cap to Gurov. Gurov went to see her, and no one in Moscow knew of it. Once he was going to see her in this way on a winter morning. The messenger had come the evening before when he was out. With him walked his daughter, whom he wanted to take to school. It was on the way. Snow was falling in big, wet flakes. 
It's three degrees above freezing point, and yet it is snowing, said Gurov to his daughter. The thaw is only on the surface of the earth. There is quite a different temperature at a greater height than the atmosphere. And why are there no thunderstorms in the winter, father? He explained that, too. He talked, thinking all the while that he was going to see her, and no living soul knew of it, and probably never would know. He had two lives, one open, seen and known by all who cared to know, full of relative truth and of relative falsehood, exactly like the lives of his friends and acquaintances, and another life running its course in secret, and through some strange, perhaps accidental, conjunction of circumstances, everything that was essential, of interest and of value to him, everything in which he was sincere and did not deceive himself, everything that made the kernel of his life, was hidden from other people. And all that was false in him, the sheath in which he hid himself to conceal the truth, such, for instance, as his work in the bank, his discussions at the club, his lower race, his presence with his wife at anniversary festivities, all that was open, and he judged of others by himself, not believing in what he saw, and always believing that every man had his real, most interesting life under the cover of secrecy and under the cover of night. All personal life rested on secrecy, and possibly it was partly on that account that civilized man was so nervously anxious that personal privacy should be respected. After leaving his daughter at school, Gurov went on to the Slavyansky Bazaar. He took off his fur coat below, went upstairs, and softly knocked at the door. Anna Sergeyevna, wearing his favorite gray dress, exhausted by the journey and the suspense, had been expecting him since the evening before. She was pale. She looked at him and did not smile, and he had hardly come in when she fell on his breast. Their kiss was slow and prolonged as though they had not met for two years. Well, how are you getting on there, he asked. What news? Wait, I'll tell you directly. I can't talk. She could not speak. She was crying. She turned away from him and pressed her handkerchief to her eyes. Let her have her cry out. I'll sit down and wait, he thought, and he sat down in an armchair. Then he rang and asked for tea to be brought him, and while he drank his tea, she remained standing at the window with her back to him. She was crying from emotion, from the miserable consciousness that their life was so hard for them they could only meet in secret, hiding themselves from people, like thieves. Was not their life shattered? Come, do stop, he said. It was evident to him that this love of theirs would not soon be over, that he could not see the end of it. Anna Sergeyevna grew more and more attached to him. She adored him. And it was unthinkable to say to her that it was bound to have an end some day. Besides, she would not have believed it. He went up to her and took her by the shoulders to say something affectionate and cheering. And at that moment, he saw himself in the looking glass. His hair was already beginning to turn gray. And it seemed strange to him that he had grown so much older, so much plainer during the last few years. The shoulders on which his hands rested were warm and quivering. He felt compassion for this life, still so warm and lovely, but probably not far from beginning to fade and wither like his own.
why did she love him so much? He always seemed to women different from what he was, and they loved in him not himself, but the man created by their imagination, whom they had been eagerly seeking all their lives, and afterwards, when they noticed their mistake, they loved him all the same, and not one of them had been happy with him. Time passed. He had made their acquaintance, got on with them, parted, but he had never once loved. It was anything you like, but not love. And only now, when his head was gray, he had fallen properly, really, in love, for the first time in his life. Anna Sergeyevna and he loved each other like people very close and akin, like husband and wife, like tender friends. It seemed to them that fate itself had meant them for one another, and they could not understand why he had a wife and she a husband. And it was as though they were a pair of birds of passage, caught and forced to live in different cages. They forgave each other for what they were ashamed of in their past. They forgave everything in the present, and felt that this love of theirs had changed them both. In moments of depression in the past, he had comforted himself with any arguments that came into his mind, but now he no longer cared for arguments. He felt profound compassion. He wanted to be sincere and tender. Don't cry, my darling, he said. You have had your cry. That's enough. Let us talk now. Let us think of some plan. Then they spent a long while taking counsel together talked of how to avoid the necessity for secrecy, for deception, for living in different towns and not seeing each other for long at a time. How could they be free from this intolerable bondage? How? How? he asked, clutching his head. How? And it seemed as though in a little while the solution would be found and then a new and splendid life would begin. And it was clear to both of them that they had still a long, long road before them, and that the most complicated and difficult part of it was only just beginning. End of The Lady with the Dog The Legion of Honor by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Retief. The Legion of Honor by Guy de Maupassant. How he got the Legion of Honor. From the time some people begin to talk, they seem to have an overmastering desire or vocation. Ever since he was a child, Monsieur Kellard had only had one idea in his head, to wear the ribbon of an order. When he was still quite a small boy, he used to wear a zinc cross of the Legion of Honour pinned on his tunic, just as other children wear a soldier's cap and he took his mother's hand in the street with a proud air, sticking out his little chest with its red ribbon and metal star, so that it might show to advantage. His studies were not a success, and he failed in his examination for Bachelor of Arts. So, not knowing what to do, he married a pretty girl, as he had plenty of money of his own. They lived in Paris, as many rich middle-class people do, mixing with their own particular set, and proud of knowing a deputy, who might perhaps be a minister some day, and counting two heads of departments among their friends. But Monsieur Callard 
could not get rid of his one absorbing idea, and he felt constantly unhappy because he had not the right to wear a little bit of coloured ribbon in his buttonhole. When he met any men who were decorated on the boulevards, he looked at them askance with intense jealousy. Sometimes, when he had nothing to do in the afternoon, he would count them and say to himself, Just let me see how many I shall meet between the Madeleine and the Rue Treuot. Then he would walk slowly, looking at every coat with a practised eye for the little bit of red ribbon, and when he had got to the end of his walk, he always repeated the numbers aloud. Eight officers and seventeen knights. As many as that? It is stupid to sew the cross broadcast in that fashion. I wonder how many I shall meet going back. And he returned slowly, unhappy when the crowd of passers-by interfered with his vision. He knew the places where most were to be found. They swarmed in the Palais Royal. Fewer were seen in the Avenue de l'Opera, than in the Rue de la Paix, while the right side of the boulevard was more frequented by them than the left. They also seemed to prefer certain cafés and theatres. Whenever he saw a group of white-haired old gentlemen standing together in the middle of the pavement, interfering with the traffic, he used to say to himself, They are officers of the Legion of Honour, and he felt inclined to take off his hat to them. He had often remarked that the officers had a different bearing to the mere knights. They carried their head differently, and one felt that they enjoyed a higher official consideration and a more widely extended importance. Sometimes, however, the worthy man would be seized with a furious hatred for every one who was decorated, and he felt like a socialist toward them. Then, when he got home, excited at meeting so many crosses, just as a poor hungry wretch might be on passing some dainty provision shop, he used to ask in a loud voice, When shall we get rid of this wretched government? And his wife would be surprised and ask, What is the matter with you today? I am indignant he replied, at the injustice I see going on around us. Oh, the communards were certainly right. After dinner he would go out again and look at the shops where the decorations were sold, and he examined all the emblems of various shapes and colours. He would have liked to possess them all, and to have walked gravely at the head of a procession, with his crush hat under his arm, and his breast covered with decorations, radiant as a star, amid a buzz of admiring whispers and a hum of respect. But, alas, he had no right to wear any decoration whatever. He used to say to himself, It is really too difficult for any man to obtain the Legion of Honour, unless he is some public functionary. Suppose I try to be appointed an officer of the Academy? But he did not know how to set about it, and spoke on the subject to his wife, who was stupefied. Officer of the Academy? What have you done to deserve it? He got angry. I know what I am talking about. I only want to know how to set about it. You are quite stupid at times. She smiled. You are quite right. I don't understand anything about it. An idea struck him. Suppose you were to speak to Monsieur Rosselin, the deputy. He might be able to advise me. You understand I cannot broach the subject to him directly. It is rather difficult and delicate. But coming from you, it might seem quite natural. Madame Kellard did what he asked her, and Monsieur Rosselin promised to speak to the minister about it. And then Kellard began to worry him till the deputy told him he must make a formal application and put forward his claims. What were his claims, he said? 
He was not even a Bachelor of Arts. However, he set to work and produced a pamphlet with the title The People's Right to Instruction, but he could not finish it for want of ideas. He sought for easier subjects and began several in succession. The first was the instruction of children by means of the eye. He wanted gratuitous theatres to be established in every poor quarter of Paris for little children. Their parents were to take them there when they were quite young, and by means of a magic lantern all the notions of human knowledge were to be imparted to them. There were to be regular courses. The sight would educate the mind while the pictures would remain impressed on the brain, and thus science would, so to say, be made visible. What could be more simple than to teach universal history, natural history, geography, botany, zoology, anatomy, etc., etc., in this manner? He had his idea printed in pamphlets and sent a copy to each deputy, ten to each minister, fifty to the President of the Republic, ten to each Parisian, and five to each provincial newspaper. Then he wrote on street lending libraries. His idea was to have little push carts full of books drawn about the streets. Everyone would have a right to ten volumes a month in his home on payment of one sou. The people, Monsieur Kerard said, will only disturb itself for the sake of its pleasures, and since it will not go to instruction, instruction must come to it, etc., etc. His essays attracted no attention, but he sent in his application, and he got the usual formal official reply. He thought himself sure of success, but nothing came of it. Then he made up his mind to apply personally, he begged for an interview with the Minister of Public Instruction, and he was received by a young subordinate who was very grave and important, and kept touching the knobs of electric bells to summon ushers and footmen and officials inferior to himself. He declared to Monsieur Caillard that his matter was going on quite favourably, and advised him to continue his remarkable labours, and Monsieur Caillard set at it again. Monsieur Rosselin, the deputy, seemed now to take a great interest in his success, and gave him a lot of excellent practical advice. He himself was decorated, although nobody knew exactly what he had done to deserve such a distinction. He told Callard what new studies he ought to undertake. He introduced him to learned societies which took up particularly obscure points of science in the hope of gaining credit and honours thereby, and he even took him under his wing at the ministry. One day, when he came to lunch with his friend, for several months past he had constantly taken his meals there, he said to him in a whisper as he shook hands, I have just obtained a great favour for you, the Committee of Historical Works is going to entrust you with a commission. There are some researches to be made in various libraries in France. Kellard was so delighted that he could scarcely eat or drink, and a week later he set out. He went from town to town studying catalogues, rummaging in lofts full of dusty volumes, and was hated by all the librarians. One day, happening to be at Rouen, he thought he should like to go and visit his wife, whom he had not seen for more than a week, so he took the nine o'clock train, which would land him at home by twelve at night. He had his latch key, so he went in without making any noise, delighted at the idea of the surprise he was going to give her. She had locked herself in. How tiresome! However, he cried out through the door, Jeanne, it is I. She must have been very frightened, for he heard her jump out of her bed and speak to herself as if she were in a dream. Then she went to her dressing room, opened and closed the door, 
and went quickly up and down her room barefoot two or three times, shaking the furniture till the vases and glasses sounded. Then at last she asked, Is it you, Alexander? Yes, yes, he replied. Make haste and open the door. As soon as she had done so, she threw herself into his arms, exclaiming, Oh, what a fright! What a surprise! What a pleasure! He began to undress himself methodically, as he did everything, and took from a chair his overcoat, which he was in the habit of hanging up in the hall. But suddenly he remained motionless, struck dumb with astonishment. There was a red ribbon in the buttonhole. Why? he stammered. This, this, this overcoat has got the ribbon in it. In a second his wife threw herself on him, and taking it from his hands, she said, No, you have made a mistake. Give it to me. But he still held it by one of the sleeves, without letting it go, repeating in a half-dazed manner, Oh, why? Just explain. Whose overcoat is it? It is not mine, as it has the Legion of Honor on it. She tried to take it from him, terrified and hardly able to say, Listen, listen, g g give it to me. I must not tell you. It is a secret. Listen to me. But he grew angry and turned pale. I want to know how this overcoat comes to be here. It does not belong to me. Then she almost screamed at him. Yes, it does. Listen, uh, uh, swear to me. Well, uh, <laughs> you are decorated. She did not intend to joke at his expense. He was so overcome that he let the overcoat fall and dropped into an armchair. I am, you say, I am decorated? Yes, but it is a secret, a great secret. She had put the glorious garment into a cupboard and came to her husband, pale and trembling. Yes, she continued. It is a new overcoat that I have had made for you, but I swore that I would not tell you anything about it, as it will not be officially announced for a month or six weeks, and you are not to have known till your return from your business journey. Monsieur Rosselin managed it for you. Rosselin? he contrived to utter in his joy. He has obtained a decoration for me? He? Oh! and he was obliged to drink a glass of water. A little piece of white paper fell to the floor out of the pocket of the overcoat. Kellard picked it up. It was a visiting card, and he read out, Rosselin, deputy. You see how it is? said his wife. He almost cried with joy, and a week later it was announced in the journal officiel that Monsieur Kellard had been awarded the Legion of Honor on account of his exceptional services. End of the Legion of Honor Recording by Jerry Retief, Durban, South Africa Magnetism by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Retief. Magnetism by Guy de Maupassant It was a men's dinner party, and they were sitting over their cigars and brandy and discussing magnetism. Donato's tricks and Charcot's experiments. Presently, the sceptical, easy-going men who cared nothing for religion of any sort began telling stories of strange occurrences, incredible things which, nevertheless, had really occurred, so they said, falling back into superstitious beliefs, clinging to these last remnants of the marvellous becoming devotees of this mystery of magnetism, defending it in the name of science. 
There was only one person who smiled, a vigorous young fellow, a great ladies' man, who was so incredulous that he would not even enter upon a discussion of such matters. He repeated with a sneer, Humbug! 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 We need not discuss Donato, who is merely a very smart juggler. As for Monsieur Charcot, who is said to be a remarkable man of science, he produces on me the effect of those storytellers of the school of Edgar Poe, who end up by going mad through constantly reflecting on queer cases of insanity. He has authenticated some cases of unexplained and inexplicable nervous phenomena. He makes his way into that unknown region which men are exploring every day, and unable always to understand what he sees, he recalls, perhaps, the ecclesiastical interpretation of these mysteries. I should like to hear what he says himself. The words of the unbeliever were listened to with a kind of pity, as if he had blasphemed in an assembly of monks. One of these gentlemen exclaimed, And yet miracles were performed in olden times. I deny it, replied the other. Why cannot they be performed now? Then each mentioned some fact, some fantastic presentiment, some instance of souls communicating with each other across space, or some case of the secret influence of one being over another. They asserted and maintained that these things had actually occurred, while the sceptic angrily repeated, Humbug! 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 At last he rose, threw away his cigar, and with his hands in his pockets said, Well, I also have two stories to tell you, which I will afterwards explain. Here they are. In the little village of Etretat, the men, who are all seafaring folk, go every year to Newfoundland to fish for cod. One night the little son of one of these fishermen woke up with a start, crying out that his father was dead. The child was quieted, and again he woke up, exclaiming that his father was drowned. A month later the news came that his father had, in fact, been swept off the deck of his smack by a billow. The widow then remembered how her son had woken up and spoken of his father's death. Everyone said it was a miracle, and the affair caused a great sensation. The dates were compared and it was found that the accident and the dream were almost coincident, whence they concluded that they had happened on the same night and at the same hour. And there is a mystery of magnetism. The storyteller stopped suddenly. Thereupon, one of those who had heard him, much affected by the narrative, asked, And can you explain this? Perfectly, monsieur. I have discovered the secret. The circumstance surprised me and even perplexed me very much. But you see, I do not believe on principle. Just as others begin by believing, I begin by doubting. And when I cannot understand, I continue to deny that there can be any telepathic communication between souls, certain that my own intelligence will be able to explain it. Well, I kept on inquiring into the matter, and by dint of questioning all the wives of the absent seamen, I was convinced that not a week passed without one of them, or one of their children, dreaming and declaring when they woke up that the father was drowned. The horrible and continual fear of this accident makes them always talk about it. Now. If one of these frequent predictions coincides, by a very simple chance, with the death of the person referred to, people at once declare it to be a miracle, for they suddenly lose sight of all the other predictions of misfortune that have remained unfulfilled. 
I have myself known fifty cases where the persons who made the prediction forgot all about it a week afterwards. But if then one happens to die, then the recollection of the thing is immediately revived, and people are ready to believe in the intervention of God, according to some, and magnetism, according to others. One of the smokers remarked, What you say is right enough, but what about your second story? Oh, my second story is a very delicate matter to relate. It happened to myself, and so I don't place any great value on my own view of the matter. An interested party can never give an impartial opinion. However, here it is. Among my acquaintances was a young woman on whom I had never bestowed a thought, whom I would never even looked at attentively, never taken any notice of. I classed her among the women of no importance, though she was not bad-looking. She appeared, in fact, to possess eyes, a nose, a mouth, some sort of hair, just a colourless type of countenance. She was one of those beings who awaken only a chance, passing thought, but no special interest, no desire. Well, one night, as I was writing some letters by my fireside before going to bed, I was conscious, in the midst of that train of sensuous visions that sometimes pass through one's brain in moments of idle reverie, of a kind of slight influence passing over me, a little flutter of the heart, and immediately, without any cause, without any logical connection of thought, I saw distinctly, as if I were touching her, saw from head to foot, and disrobed, this young woman to whom I had never given more than three seconds thought at a time. I suddenly discovered in her a number of qualities which I had never before observed. A sweet charm, a languorous fascination. She awakened in me that sort of restless emotion that causes one to pursue a woman. But I did not think of her long. I went to bed and was soon asleep, and I dreamed. You've all had these strange dreams which make you overcome the impossible, which open to you double-locked doors, unexpected joys, tightly folded arms? Which of us, in these troubled, excising, breathless slumbers, has not held, clasped, embraced with rapture, the woman who occupied his thoughts? And have you ever noticed what superhuman delight these happy dreams give us? Into what mad intoxication they cast you, with what passionate spasms they shake you, and with what infinite, caressing, penetrating tenderness they fill your heart for her whom you hold clasped in your arms in that adorable illusion that is so like reality. All this I felt with unforgettable violence. This woman was mine, so much mine that the pleasant warmth of her skin remained in my fingers, the odour of her skin in my brain, the taste of her kisses on my lips, the sound of her voice lingered in my ears, the touch of her clasp still clung to me, and the burning charm of her tenderness still gratified my senses long after the delight but this illusion of my awakening. And three times that night I had the same dream. When the day dawned, she haunted me, possessed me, filled my senses to such an extent that I was not one second without thinking of her. At last, not knowing what to do, I dressed myself and went to call on her. As I went upstairs to her apartment, I was so overcome by emotion that I trembled, and my heart beat rapidly. I entered the apartment. She rose the moment she heard my name mentioned, and suddenly our eyes met in a peculiar fixed gaze. 
I sat down. I stammered out some commonplaces which she seemed not to hear. I did not know what to say or do. Then abruptly, clasping my arms round her, my dream was realized so suddenly that I began to doubt whether I was really awake. We were friends after this for two years. What conclusion do you draw from it? said a voice. The storyteller seemed to hesitate. The conclusion I draw from it? Well, by Jove, the conclusion is that it was just a coincidence. And then, who can tell? Perhaps it was some glance of hers, which I had not noticed, and which came back that night to me through one of those mysterious and unconscious recollections that often bring before us things ignored by our own consciousness, unperceived by our minds. "'Call it whatever you like,' said one of his table companions when the story was finished. "'But if you don't believe in magnetism after that, my dear boy, you are an ungrateful fellow.'" End of Magnetism by Guy de Maupassant Recording by Jerry Retief, Durban, South Africa Pigs is Pigs by Ellis Parker Butler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jerry Retief. Pigs is Pigs by Ellis Parker Butler. Mike Flannery, the West Coast agent of the Interurban Express Company, leaned over the counter of the express office and shook his fist. Mr. Morehouse, angry and red, stood on the other side of the counter, trembling with rage. The argument had been long and heated, and at last Mr. Morehouse had talked himself speechless. The cause of the trouble stood on the counter between the two men. It was a soapbox across the top of which were nailed a number of strips, forming a rough but serviceable cage. In it, two spotted guinea pigs were greedily eating lettuce leaves. "'Do as you like, then!' shouted Flannery. "'Pay for them, and take them, or don't pay for them, and leave them be. Rules is rules, Mr. Morehouse, and Mike Flannery's not going to be called down for breaking of them.' "'But you everlasting stupid idiot!' shouted Mr. Morehouse, madly shaking a flimsy printed book beneath the agent's nose. Can't you read it here in your own plain printed rates? Pets, domestic, Franklin to Westcote, if properly boxed, twenty-five cents each. He threw the book on the counter in his dust. What more do you want? Aren't they pets? Aren't they domestic? Aren't they properly boxed? What? He turned and walked back and forth rapidly, frowning ferociously. Suddenly he turned to Flannery, and forcing his voice to an artificial calmness, spoke slowly, but with intense sarcasm. Pets, he said, P-E-T-S, twenty-five cents each. There are two of them, one, two. Two times twenty-five are fifty. Can you understand that? I offer you fifty cents. Flannery reached for the book. He ran his hand through the pages and stopped at page sixty-four. And I don't take fifty cents, he whispered in mockery. Here's the rule for it. When the agent be in any doubt regarding which of two rates applies to a shipment, he shall charge the larger. The consignee may file a claim for the overcharge. In this case, Mr. Morehouse, I be in doubt. Pets them animals may be, and domestic they be, but pigs I'm blame sure they do be, and me rule says plain as the nose on your face, pigs, Franklin to Westcote, thirty cents each. And Mr. Morehouse, by me 
arithmetical knowledge, two times thirty comes to sixty cents. Mr. Morehouse shook his head savagely. Nonsense! he shouted. Confounded nonsense, I tell you. Why, you poor ignorant foreigner, that rule means common pigs, domestic pigs, not guinea pigs. Flannery was stubborn. Pigs is pigs, he declared firmly. Guinea pigs or dago pigs or Irish pigs is all the same to the Interurban Express Company and to Mike Flannery. The nationality of the pig creates no differentiality in the rate, Mr. Morehouse. It would be the same was they Dutch pigs or Russian pigs. Mike Flannery, he added, is here to tend the express business and not to hold conversation with dago pigs in seventeen languages for to discover, be they Chinese or Tipperary by birth and nativity. Mr. Morehouse hesitated. He bit his lip and then flung out his arms wildly. Very well, he shouted. You shall hear of this. Your president shall hear of this. It is an outrage. I have offered you fifty cents. You refuse it. Keep the pigs until you are ready to take the fifty cents. But by George, sir, if one hair of those pigs' heads is harmed, I will have the law on you. He turned and stalked out, slamming the door. Flannery carefully lifted the soap box from the counter and placed it in a corner. He was not worried. He felt the peace that comes to a faithful servant who has done his duty and done it well. Mr. Morehouse went home raging. His boy, who had been awaiting the guinea pigs, knew better than to ask him for them. He was a normal boy and therefore always had a guilty conscience when his father was angry. So the boy slipped quietly around the house. There is nothing so soothing to a guilty conscience as to be out of the path of the avenger. Mr. Morehouse stormed into the house. Where's the ink? He shouted at his wife as soon as his foot was across the dorsal. Mrs. Morehouse jumped guiltily. She never used ink. She had not seen the ink, nor moved the ink, nor thought of the ink. But her husband's tone convicted her of the guilt of having borne and reared a boy, and she knew that whenever her husband wanted anything in a loud voice, the boy had been at it. I'll find Sammy, she said meekly. When the ink was found, Mr. Morehouse wrote rapidly, and he read the completed letter and smiled a triumphant smile. That will settle that crazy Irishman, he exclaimed. When they get that letter, he will hunt another job, all right. A week later, Mr. Morehouse received a long official envelope with a card of the Interurban Express Company in the upper left corner. He tore it open eagerly and drew out a sheet of paper. At the top, it bore the number A6754. The letter was short. Subject, rate on guinea pigs, it said. Dear Sir, we are in receipt of your letter regarding rate on guinea pigs between Franklin and Westcote addressed to the president of this company. All claims for overcharge should be addressed to the claims department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the claims department. He wrote six pages of choice, sarcasm, vituperation and argument and sent them to the claims department. A few weeks later... He received a reply from the claims department. Attached to it was his last letter. Dear Sir, said the reply, your letter of the 16th instant addressed to this department, subject rate on guinea pigs from Franklin to Westcote, received. We have taken up the matter with our agent at Westcote, and his reply is attached herewith. He informs us that you refuse to receive the consignment or to pay the charges. You have therefore no claim against this company, and your letter regarding the proper rate on the consignment should be addressed to our tariff department. Mr. Morehouse wrote to the tariff department. He stated his case clearly and gave his arguments in full, quoting a page or two from the encyclopedia to prove that guinea pigs were not common pigs. 
with the care that characterizes corporations when they are systematically conducted, Mr. Morehouse's letter was numbered, okayed, and started through the regular channels. Duplicate copies of the Bill of Lading, Manifest, Flannery's Receipt for the Package, and several other pertinent papers were pinned to the letter, and they were passed to the head of the Tariff Department. The head of the tariff department put his feet on his desk and yawned. He looked through the papers carelessly. Miss Kane, he said to his stenographer, take this letter. Agent Westcote N.J. Please advise why consignment referred to in attached papers was refused domestic pet rates. Miss Kane made a series of curves and angles on her notebook and waited with pencil poised. The head of the department looked at the papers again. Ha! Guinea pigs, he said. Probably starved to death by this time. Add this to that letter. Give condition of consignment at present. He tossed the papers onto the stenographer's desk, took his feet from his own desk, and went out to lunch. When Mike Flannery received the letter, he scratched his head. Give present condition? he repeated thoughtfully. Now what do them clerks be wanting to know, I wonder? Present condition, is it? Them pigs, praise St. Patrick, to be in good health, so far as I know, but I never was no veterinary surgeon to dago pigs. Maybe them clerks wants me to call in the pig doctor and have their pulses took. One thing I do know, however, which is, they've glorious appetites for pigs of their soys. Eight! They'd eat the brass padlocks off a barn door. If the paddy pig, by the same token, ate as hearty as these dago pigs do, there'd be a famine in Ireland. To assure himself that his report would be up to date, Flannery went to the rear of the office and looked into the cage. The pigs had been transferred to a larger box, a dry goods box. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, he counted. Seven spotted and one all black, all well and hearty and all eaten like raging hippopotamuses. He went back to his desk and wrote, Mr. Morgan, Head of Tariff Department, he wrote. Why do I say Dago pigs is pigs? Because they is pigs, and will be till you say they ain't. Which is what the rule book says. Stop your jollying me. You know it as well as I do. As to health, they are all well and hoping you are the same. P.S. There are eight now. The family increased all good eaters. P.S. I paid out so far... Two dollars for cabbage, which they like, shall I put in bill for same what? Morgan, head of the tariff department, when he received this letter, laughed. He read it again, and became serious. By George, he said, Flannery is right. Pigs is pigs. I'll have to get authority on this thing. Meanwhile, Miss Kane, take this letter. Agent Westcote N. J. Regarding shipment guinea pigs. File number A6754, Rule 83, General Instructions to Agents, clearly states that agents shall collect from consignee all costs of provender, etc., etc., required for livestock while in transit or storage. You will proceed to collect same from consignee. Flannery received this letter next morning, and when he read it, he grinned. Proceed to collect, he said softly. How them clerks do like to be talking. Me proceed to collect two dollars and twenty-five cents of Mr. Morehouse? I wonder do them clerks know Mr. Morehouse? I'll get it. Oh, yes, Mr. Morehouse. Two and quarter, please. Certainly, my dear friend Flannery. Delighted. Not.
Flannery drove the express wagon to Mr. Morehouse's door. Mr. Morehouse answered the bell. Aha! he cried as soon as he saw it was Flannery. So you've come to your senses at last, have you? I thought you would. Bring the box in. I have no box, said Flannery coldly. I have a bill again Mr. John C. Morehouse for two dollars and twenty-five cents for cabbages eaten by his dago pigs. Would you wish to pay it? Pay cabbages? gasped Mr. Morehouse. Do you mean to say that two little guinea pigs? Eight, said Flannery. Papa and Mama and the six children eight for answer mr morehouse slammed the door in flannery's face flannery looked at the door reproachfully i take it the consignee don't want to pay for them carriages he said if i know signs of refusal the consignee refuses to pay for one dang cabbage leaf and be hanged to me Mr. Morgan, the head of the tariff department, consulted the president of the Interurban Express Company regarding guinea pigs, as to whether they were pigs or not pigs. The president was inclined to treat the matter lightly. What is the rate on pigs and on pets? he asked. Pigs, thirty cents. Pets, twenty-five, said Morgan. Then, of course, guinea pigs are pigs, said the president. Yes agreed morgan i look at it that way too a thing that can come under two rates is naturally due to be classed as the higher but are guinea pigs pigs aren't they rabbits come to think of it said the president i believe they are more like rabbits sort of halfway stationed between pig and rabbit i think the question is this are guinea pigs of the domestic pig family i'll ask professor gordon he is authority on such things. Leave the papers with me. The president put the papers on his desk and wrote a letter to Professor Gordon. Unfortunately, the professor was in South America collecting zoological specimens, and the letter was forwarded to him by his wife. As the professor was in the highest Andes, where no white man had ever penetrated, the letter was many months in reaching him. The president forgot the guinea pigs, Morgan forgot them, Mr. Morehouse forgot them, but Flannery did not. One half of his time he gave to the duties of his agency. The other half was devoted to the guinea pigs. Long before Professor Gordon received the president's letter, Morgan received one from Flannery. About them dago pigs, it said. What shall I do? They are great in family life. No race suicide for them. There are thirty-two now. Shall I sell them? Do you take this express office for a menagerie? Answer quick. Morgan reached for a telegraph blank and wrote, Agent Westcote, don't sell pigs. He then wrote Flannery a letter calling his attention to the fact that the pigs were not the property of the company, but were merely being held during a settlement of a dispute regarding rates. He advised Flannery to take the best possible care of them. Flannery, letter in hand, looked at the pigs and sighed. The dry goods box cage had become too small. He boarded up twenty feet of the rear of the express office to make a large and airy home for them, and went about his business. He worked with feverish intensity when out on his rounds, for the pigs required attention and took most of his time. Some months later, in desperation, he seized a sheet of paper and wrote 160 across it, and mailed it to Morgan. Morgan returned it, asking for explanation. Flannery replied, There be now 160 of them dago pigs. For heaven's sake, let me sell off some. Do you want me to go crazy? What? Sell no pigs, Morgan wired. Not long after this, the president of the express company received a letter from Professor Gordon. It was a long and scholarly letter, but the point was that the guinea pig was the Cava aparoia, while the common pig was the genus Sus of the family Suidae. He remarked that they were prolific 
and multiplied rapidly. They are not pigs, said the President decidedly to Morgan. The 25 cent rate applies. Morgan made the proper notation on the papers that had accumulated in file A6754 and turned them over to the Audit Department. The Audit Department took some time to look the matter up and after the usual delay wrote Flannery that as he had on hand 160 guinea pigs, the property of consignee, he should deliver them and collect charges at the rate of 25 cents each. Flannery spent a day herding his charges through a narrow opening in their cage so that he might count them. Audit Department, he wrote, when he had finished the count. You are way off. There may be was 160 dago pigs once, but wake up, don't be a back number. I've got even 800. Now shall I collect for 800 or what? How about $64 I paid out for cabbages? It required a great many letters back and forth before the audit department was able to understand why the error had been made of billing 160 instead of 800, and still more time for it to get the meaning of the cabbages. Flannery was crowded into a few feet at the extreme front of the office. The pigs had all the rest of the room, and two boys were employed constantly attending to them. The day after Flannery had counted the guinea pigs, there were eight more added to his drove, and by the time the audit department gave him authority to collect for 800, Flannery had given up all attempts to attend to the receipt or the delivery of goods. He was hastily building galleries around the express office, tier above tier. He had 4,064 guinea pigs to care for. More were arriving daily. Immediately following its authorization, the audit department sent another letter, but Flannery was too busy to open it. They wrote another, and then they telegraphed. Error in guinea pig bull. Collect for two guinea pigs, 50 cents. Deliver all to consignee. Flannery read the telegram and cheered up. He wrote out a bill as rapidly as his pencil could travel over paper and ran all the way to the Morehouse home. At the gate, he stopped suddenly. The house stared at him with vacant eyes. The windows were bare of curtains, and he could see into the empty rooms. A sign on the porch said, To Let. Mr. Morehouse had moved. Flannery ran all the way back to the express office. Sixty-nine guinea pigs had been born during his absence. He ran out again and made feverish inquiries in the village. Mr. Morehouse had not only moved, but he had left Westcote. Flannery returned to the express office and found that 260 guinea pigs had entered the world since he left it. He wrote a telegram to the audit department. Can't collect 50 cents for two dago pigs consignee has left town address unknown. What shall I do? Flannery. The telegram was handed to one of the clerks in the audit department, and as he read it, he laughed. Flannery must be crazy. He ought to know that the thing to do is to return the consignment here, said the clerk. He telegraphed Flannery to send the pigs to the main office of the company at Franklin. When Flannery received the telegram, he set to work. The six boys he had engaged to help him also set to work. They worked with the haste of desperate men, making cages out of soap boxes, cracker boxes, and all kinds of boxes. And as fast as the cages were completed, they filled them with guinea pigs and expressed them to Franklin. Day after day the cages of guinea pigs flowed in a steady stream from Westcote to Franklin, and still Flannery and his six helpers ripped and nailed and packed, relentlessly and feverishly. At the end of the week they had shipped 280 cases of guinea pigs, and there were in the express office 704 more pigs than when they began packing them.
Stop sending pigs, warehouse full, came a telegram to Flannery. He stopped packing only long enough to wire back. Can't stop, and kept on sending them. On the next train up, from Franklin, came one of the company's inspectors. He had instructions to stop the stream of guinea pigs at all hazards. As his train drew up at Westcote Station, he saw a cattle car standing on the express company's siding. When he reached the express office, he saw the express wagon backed up to the door. Six boys were carrying bushel baskets full of guinea pigs from the office and dumping them into the wagon. Inside the room, Flannery, with his coat and vest off, was shoveling guinea pigs into bushel baskets with a coal scoop. He was winding up the guinea pig episode. He looked up at the inspector with a snort of anger. One wagon load more, and I'll be quit of them, and never will ye catch Flannery with no more foreign pigs on his hands. No, sir, they near was the death of me. Next time I'll know that pigs of whatever nationality is domestic pets, and go at the lowest rate. He began shoveling again rapidly, speaking quickly between breaths. Rules may be rules. But you can't fool Mike Flannery twice with the same trick. When it comes to livestock, dang the rules. So long as Flannery runs this express office, pigs is pigs, and cows is pets, and horses is pets, and lions and tigers and Rocky Mountain goats is pets, and the rate on them is twenty-five cents. He paused long enough to let one of the boys put an empty basket in the place of the one he had just filled. There were only a few guinea pigs left. As he noted their limited number, his natural habit of looking on the bright side returned. "'Well, anyhow,' he said cheerfully, "'tis not so bad as it might be. What if them dago pigs had been elephants?' End of Pigs is Pigs Recording by Jerry Retief Speech on the Weather by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com Speech on the Weather at the New England Society's 71st Annual Dinner, New York City The next toast was The Oldest Inhabitant, The Weather of New England. Who can lose it and forget it? Who can have it and regret it? Be interposes twixt us twain. Merchant of Venice. To this Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain, replied as follows. I reverently believe that the maker who made us all makes everything in New England but the weather. I don't know who makes that, but I think it must be raw apprentices in the weather clerk's factory who experiment and learn how, in New England, for board and clothes, and then are promoted to make weather for countries that require a good article and will take their custom elsewhere if they don't get it. There is a sumptuous variety about the New England weather that compels the stranger's admiration and regret. The weather is always doing something there, always attending strictly to business, always getting up new designs and trying them on the people to see how they will go. But it gets through more business in spring than at any other season. In the spring I have counted 136 different kinds of weather inside four and twenty hours. It was I that made the fame and fortune of that man that had that marvelous collection of weather on exhibition at the Centennial that so astounded the foreigners. He was going to travel all over the world and get specimens from all the climes. I said, don't you do it. You come to New England on a favorable spring day. I told him what we could do in the way of style, variety, and quantity. Well, he came and he made his collection in four days. As to variety, why, he confessed that he got hundreds of kinds of weather that he had never heard of before. And as to quantity, well, after he picked out and discarded all that was blemished in any way, he not only had weather enough, but weather to spare, weather to hire out, weather to sell, weather to deposit, weather to invest, weather to give to the poor. The people of New England are by nature patient and forbearing, but there are some things which they will not stand. Every year they kill a lot of poets for writing about beautiful spring. These are generally casual visitors who bring their notions of spring from somewhere else and cannot, of course, know how the natives feel about spring. 
and so the first thing they know the opportunity to inquire how they feel has permanently gone by. Old Probabilities has a mighty reputation for accurate prophecy, and thoroughly well deserves it. You take up the paper and observe how crisply and confidently he checks off what today's weather is going to be on the Pacific, down south, in the middle states, in the Wisconsin region. See him sail along in the joy and pride of his power till he gets to New England, and then see his tail drop. He doesn't know what the weather is going to be in New England. Well, he mulls it over, and by and by he gets out something about like this. Probable northwest to southwest winds, varying to the southward and westward and eastward, and points between. High and low barometer, swapping around from place to place. Probable areas of rain, snow, hail, and drought. Succeeded or preceded by earthquakes, with thunder and lightning. Then he jots down this postscript from his wandering mind to cover accidents. But it is possible that the program may be wholly changed in the meantime. Yes, one of the brightest gems in the New England weather is the dazzling uncertainty of it. There is only one thing certain about it. You are certain there is going to be plenty of it. A perfect grand review, but you never can tell which end of the procession is going to move first. You fix up for the drought, you leave your umbrella in the house and sally out, and two to one you get drowned. You make up your mind that an earthquake is due. You stand from under and take hold of something to steady yourself, and the first thing you know you get struck by lightning. These are great disappointments, but they can't be helped. The lightning there is peculiar. It is so convincing that when it strikes a thing it doesn't leave enough of that thing behind for you to tell whether, well, you think it was something valuable, and a congressman had been there. And the thunder. When the thunder begins to merely tune up and scrape and saw, and key up the instruments for the performance, strangers say, why, what awful thunder you have here. But when the baton is raised and the real concert begins, you'll find that stranger down in the cellar with his head in the ash barrel. Now as to the size of the weather in New England, lengthways I mean, it is utterly disproportioned to the size of that little country. Half the time, when it is packed as full as it can stick, you will see that New England weather sticking out beyond the edges and projecting around hundreds and hundreds of miles over the neighboring states. She can't hold a tenth part of her weather. You can see cracks all about where she has strained herself trying to do it. I could speak volumes about the inhuman perversity of the New England weather, but I will give but a single specimen. I like to hear the rain on a tin roof, so I cover part of my roof with tin, with an eye to that luxury. Well, sir, do you think it ever rains on that tin? No, sir. Skips it every time. Mind, in this speech, I have been trying merely to do honor to the New England weather. No language could do it justice. But, after all, there is at least one or two things about the weather, or, if you please, effects produced by it, which we residents would not like to part with. If we hadn't our bewitching autumn foliage, we should still have to credit the weather with one feature which compensates for all its bullying vagaries, the ice storm. When a leafless tree is clothed with ice from bottom to the top, ice that is as bright and clear as crystal, when every bough and twig is strung with ice beads, frozen dewdrops, and the whole tree sparkles cold and white, like the Shah of Persia's diamond plume. When the wind waves the branches and the sun comes out and turns all those myriads of beads and drops into prisms that glow and burn and flash with all the manner of colored fires, which change and change again with inconceivable rapidity from blue to red, from red to green, and green to gold, the tree becomes a spraying fountain, a very explosion of dazzling jewels. And it stands there the acme, the climax, the supremest possibility in art or nature, of bewitching, intoxicating, intolerable magnificence. One cannot make the words too strong. End of Speech on the Weather by Mark Twain This recording by James Christopher, jxchristopher at yahoo.com War by Jack London this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sean O'Hara. War by Jack London. He was a young man, not more than twenty-four or five, and he might have sat his horse with the careless grace of his youth, had he not been so cat-like and tense. His black eyes roved everywhere, catching the movement of twigs and branches where small birds hopped questing ever onward through the changing vistas of trees and brush, and returning always to clumps of undergrowth on either side. And as he watched, so did he listen, though he rode on in silence, save for the boom of heavy guns from far to the west. 
This had been sounding monotonously in his ears for hours, and only its cessation could have aroused his notice, for he had business closer at hand. Across the saddle-bow was balanced a carbine. So tensely was he strung that a bunch of quail, exploding into flight from under his horse's nose, startled him to such an extent that automatically, instantly, he had reined in and fetched his carbine halfway to his shoulder. He grinned sheepishly, recovered himself, and rode on. So tense was he, so bent upon the work he had to do, that the sweat stung his eyes unwiped, and unheeded rolled down his nose and spattered his saddle pommel. The band of his cavalryman's hat was fresh stained with sweat. The roan horse under him was likewise wet. It was high noon of a breathless day of heat. Even the birds and squirrels did not dare the sun, but sheltered in shading hiding places among the trees. Man and horse were littered with leaves and dusted with yellow pollen, for the open was ventured no more than was compulsory. They kept to the brush and trees, and invariably the man halted and peered out before crossing a dry glade or a naked stretch of upland pasturage. He worked always to the north, though his way was devious, and it was from the north that he seemed most to apprehend that for which he was looking. He was no coward, but his courage was only that of the average civilized man, and he was looking to live, not die. Up a small hillside he followed the cowpath through such dense scrub that he was forced to dismount and lead his horse. But when the path swung round to the west he abandoned it and headed north again, across the oak-covered top of the ridge. The ridge ended in a steep descent, so steep that he zigzagged back and forth across the face of slope, sliding and stumbling among the dead leaves and matted vines, and keeping his watchful eye on the horse above that threatened to fall down upon him. The sweat ran from him, and the pollen dust, settling pungently in his mouth and nostrils, increased his thirst. Try as he would, nevertheless, the descent was noisy, and frequently he stopped, panning in the dry heat and listening for any warning from beneath. At the bottom he came out on a flat so densely forested that he could not make out its extent. Here the character of the woods changed, and he was able to remount. Instead of the twisted hillside oaks, tall, straight trees, big-trunked, prosperous, rose from the damp, fat soil. Only here and there were thickets, easily avoided, while he encountered winding, park-like glades where the cattle had pastured in days before the war had run them off. His progress was more rapid now as he came down into the valley, and at the end of half an hour he halted at an ancient rail fence at the edge of the clearing. He did not like the openness of it, yet his path lay across to the fringe of the trees that marked the banks of the stream. It was a mere quarter of a mile across the open, but the thought of venturing out in it was repugnant. A rifle, a score of them, a thousand might lurk in the fringe by the stream, and he the naked mark. Twice he essayed to start, and twice he paused. He was appalled by his own loneliness. The pulse of war that beat from the west suggested companionship of battling thousands. Here was naught but silence, and himself and possible death-dealing bullets from myriad ambushes. And yet his task was to find what he feared to find. He must go on and on, till somewhere, sometime, he encountered another man, or other men, from the other side, scouting as he was scouting, to make report, as he must make report, of having come in touch. Changing his mind, he skirted inside the woods for a distance, and again peeped forth. This time in the middle of a clearing he saw a small farmhouse. There were no signs of life. No smoke curled from the chimney, no barnyard fowl clucked or strutted. The kitchen door stood open, and he gazed so long and hard into the black aperture it seemed almost the farmer's wife must emerge at any moment. He licked the pollen and dust from his dry lips, stiffened himself, mind and body, and rode out into the blazing sunshine. Nothing stirred. He went on past the house and approached the wall of the trees and bushes by the river's bank. One thought persisted maddeningly. It was of the crash in his body of a high-velocity bullet. It made him feel very fragile and defenseless, and he crouched lower in the saddle. Tethering his horse in the edge of the woods, he continued a hundred yards on foot till he came to the stream. Twenty feet wide it was, without perceptible current, cool and inviting, and he was very thirsty. But he waited inside the screen of leafage, his eyes fixed on the screen on the opposite side. To make the wait endurable, he sat down, his carbine resting on his knees. The minutes passed, and slowly his tenseness relaxed. At last he decided there was no danger. But, just as he prepared to part the bushes and bend down to the water, a movement among the opposite bushes caught his eye. It might be a bird, but he waited. Again, there was an agitation in the bushes, and then, so suddenly that it almost startled a cry from him, the bushes parted and the face peered out. It was a face covered with several weeks' growth of ginger-colored beard. The eyes were blue and wide apart, with laughter wrinkles in the corners, that showed despite the tired and anxious expression of the whole face. All this he could see with microscopic clearness, for the distance was no more than twenty feet. And all this he saw in such brief time that he saw it as he lifted his carbine to his shoulder. He glanced along the sights and knew he was gazing upon a man who was as good as dead. It was impossible to miss at such point-blank range. But he did not shoot. Slowly he lowered the carbine and watched. 
A hand clutching the water bottle became visible, and the ginger beard bent downward to fill the bottle. He could hear the gurgle of the water. Then the arm and bottle and ginger beard disappeared behind closing bushes. A long time he waited. Then, his thirst on slaked, he crept back to his horse, rode slowly across the sun-washed clearing, and passed into the shelter of the woods beyond. Section 2 Another day, hot and breathless. A deserted farmhouse, large with many outbuildings and an orchard standing in the clearing. From the woods, on a roan horse, carving across the pommel, rode the young man with quick black eyes. He breathed with relief as he gained the house. That a fight had taken place here earlier in the season was evident. Clips and empty cartridges, tarnished with verdigris, lay on the ground, which, while wet, had been torn up by the hoofs of horses. Hard by the kitchen and garden were graves, tagged and numbered. From the oak tree by the kitchen door, in tattered, weather-beaten garments, hung the bodies of two men. The faces, shriveled and defaced, bore no likeness to the faces of men. The roan horse snorted beneath them, and the rider caressed and soothed it, and tied it farther away. Entering the house, he found its interior a wreck. He trod in empty cartridges as he walked from room to room to reconnoiter from the windows. Men had camped and slept everywhere, and on the floor of one room he came upon stains, unmistakable, where the wounded had been laid down. Again outside, he led his horse round behind the barn and invaded the orchard. A dozen trees were burdened with ripe apples. He filled his pocket, eating while he picked. Then a thought came to him, and he glanced at the sun, calculating time to return to his camp. He pulled off a shirt, tying the sleeves and making a bag. This he proceeded to fill with apples. As he was about to mount his horse, the animal suddenly pricked up its ears. The man, too, listened and heard, faintly, the thud of hoofs on soft dirt. He crept to the corner of the barn and peered out. A dozen mounted men, strung out loosely approaching from the opposite side of the clearing, were only a matter of a hundred yards or so away. They rode on to the house. Some dismounted while others remained in the saddle, as an earnest that their stay should be short. They seemed to be holding a council, for he could hear them talking excitedly in the detested tongue of the alien invader. Time passed, but they seemed unable to reach a decision. He put the carbine away in his boot, mounted, and waited impatiently, balancing the shirt of the apples on the pommel. He heard footsteps approaching and drove his spur so fiercely into the roan as to force a surprised groan from the animal as it leapt forward. At the corner of the barn he saw the intruder, a mere boy of nineteen or twenty for all of his uniform, jump back to escape being run down. At the same moment the roan swerved, and its rider caught a glimpse of the roused men by the house. Some were springing from their horses, and he could see rifles going up to their shoulders. He passed the kitchen door and dried corpses swinging in the shade, compelling his foes to run around to the front of the house. A rifle cracked in a second, but he was going fast, leaning forward low in the saddle, one hand clutching the shirt of apples, the other guiding the horse. The top bar of the fence was four feet high, but he knew his roan, and leapt it at full career to the accompaniment of several scattered shots. Eight hundred yards straight away were the woods, and a roan was covering distance with mighty strides. Every man was now firing. They were pumping their guns so rapidly that he no longer heard the individual shots. A bullet went through his hat, but he was unaware though he did know when another tore through the apples on the pommel. And he winced and ducked even lower when the third bullet, fired low, struck a stone between the horse's legs and ricocheted off through the air, buzzing and humming like some incredible insect. The shots died down as the magazines were emptied until, quickly, there was no more shooting. The young man was elated. Through that astonishing fusillade, he'd come unscathed. He glanced back. Yes, they had emptied their magazines. He could see several reloading. Others were running back behind the house for their horses. As he looked, two already mounted came back into view around the corner, riding hard, and at the same moment he saw the man with the unmistakable ginger beard kneel down on the ground, level his gun, and coolly take his time for the long shot. The young man threw his spurs into the horse, crouched very low, and swerved in flight in order to distract the other's aim. And still the shot did not come. With each jump of the horse, the wood sprang nearer. They were only two hundred yards away, and still the shot was delayed. And then he heard it last thing he was ever to hear, for he was dead, ere he hit the ground in a long, crashing fall from the saddle. And they, watching at the house, saw him fall, saw his body bounce when it struck the earth, and saw the burst of red-cheeked apples rolled about him. They laughed at the unexpected eruption of apples, and clapped their hands in applause of the long shot of the man with the ginger beard. End of War The Watchtower by Lord Dunsany this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
This recording by James Christopher. The Watchtower by Lord Dunsany. I sat one April in Provence on a small hill above an ancient town that Goth and Vandal as yet forbore to bring up to date. On the hill was an old worn castle with a watchtower, and a well with narrow steps and water still in it. The watchtower, staring south with neglected windows, faced a broad valley full of the pleasant twilight and the hum of evening things. It saw the fires of wanderers blink from the hills, beyond them the long forest black with pines, one star appearing, and darkness settling slowly down on Var. Sitting there listening to the green frogs croaking, hearing far voices clearly but all transmuted by evening, watching the windows in the little town glittering one by one, and seeing the gloaming dwindle solemnly into night. A great many things fell for mine that seem important by day, and evening in their place planted strange fancies. Little winds had arisen and were whispering to and fro. It grew cold, and I was about to descend the hill, when I heard a voice behind me saying, Beware, beware. So much the voice appeared a part of the evening that I did not turn round at first. It was like voices that one hears in sleep and thinks to be of one's dreams, and the word was monotonously repeated in French. When I turned round I saw an old man with a horn. He had a white beard marvelously long, and still went on saying slowly, Beware, beware. He had clearly just come from the tower by which he stood, though I had heard no footfall. Had a man come stealthily upon me at such an hour, and in so lonesome a place, I had certainly felt surprised. But I saw almost at once that he was a spirit, and he seemed with his uncouth horn and his long white beard and that noiseless step of his to be so naive to that time and place that I spoke to him as one does to some fellow traveller, who asked you if you mind having the window up. I asked him what there was to beware of. Of what should the town beware, he said, but the Saracens. Saracens, I said. Yes, Saracens, Saracens, he answered and brandished his horn. And who are you? I said. I, I am the spirit of the tower, he said. When I asked him how he came by so human an aspect and was so unlike the material tower beside him, he told me that the lives of all the watchers who had ever held the horn in the tower there had gone to make the spirit of the tower. It takes a hundred lives, he said. None hold the horn of late, and men neglect the tower. When the walls are in ill repair, the Saracens come. It was ever so. The Saracens don't come nowadays, I said. But he was gazing past me watching, and did not seem to heed me. They will run down those hills, he said, pointing away to the south, out of the woods about nightfall, and I shall blow my horn. The people will all come up from the town to the tower again, but the loopholes are in very ill repair. We never hear of the Saracens now, I said. Hear of the Saracens? the old spirit said. Here are the Saracens. They slip one evening out of the forest in long white robes that they wear, and I blow my horn. That is the first that anyone ever hears of the Saracens. I mean, I said, that they never come at all. They cannot come, and men fear other things. For I thought the old spirit might rest if he knew that the Saracens can never come again. But he said, There is nothing in the world to fear but the Saracens. Nothing else matters. How can men fear other things? Then I explained, so that he might have rest, and told him of how all Europe, and in particular France, had terrible engines of war, both on land and sea, and how the Saracens had not these terrible engines, either on land or sea, and so could by no means cross the Mediterranean, or escape destruction on shore, even though they should come there. I alluded to the European railways that could move armies night and day, faster than horses could gallop, and when as well as I could I had explained it all, he answered, in time all these things pass away, and then there will still be the Saracens. And then I said, There has not been a Saracen either in France or Spain for over four hundred years. And he said, The Saracens, you do not know their cunning. That was ever the way of the Saracens. They do not come for a while, no, not they, for a long while, and then one day they come. And peering southwards, but not seeing clearly because of the rising mist, he silently moved to his tower, and up its broken steps. End of The Watchtower by Lord Dunsany. This recording by James Christopher. JX Christopher at Yahoo.com. The Wrong Black Bag by Angelo Lewis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jessica Louise The Wrong Black Bag 
by Angelo Lewis. It was the eve of Good Friday. Within a modest parlour of number 13 Primrose Terrace, a little man, wearing a grey felt hat and a red necktie, stood admiring himself in the looking-glass over the mantelpiece. Such a state of things anywhere else would have had no significance whatever, but circumstances proverbially alter cases. At 13 Primrose Terrace it approached the dimensions of a portal not to keep the reader in suspense the little man was benjamin quelch clerk in the office of monsieur cobble and clink coal merchants and he was about to carry out a desperate resolution most men have some secret ambition benjamin's was twofold for years he had yearned to wear a soft felt hat and to make a trip to paris and for years fate, in the person of Mrs. Quelch, had stood in the way and prevented the indulgence of his longing. Quelch, being, as we have hinted, exceptionally small of stature, had, in accordance with mysterious law of opposites, selected the largest lady of his acquaintance as the partner of his joys. He himself was of a meek and retiring disposition. Mrs. Quelch, on the other hand, was a woman of stern and decided temperament, with strong views upon most subjects. She administered Benjamin's finances, regulated his diet, and prescribed for him when his health was out of order. Though fond of him in her own way, she ruled him with a rod of iron, and on three points she was inflexible. To make up for his insignificance of stature, she insisted on his wearing the tallest hat that money could procure, to the exclusion of all other headgear. Secondly, on the ground that it looked more professional, she would allow him none but black silk neckties. And lastly, she would not let him smoke. She had further an intense repugnance to all things foreign, holding as an article of faith that no good thing, whether in art, cookery, or morals, was to be found on other than English soil. When Benjamin once, in a rash moment, suggested a trip to Boulogne by way of summer holiday, the suggestion was received in a manner that took away his appetite for a week afterward. The prohibition of smoking Quelch did not much mind, for having in his salad days made trial of a cheap cigar, the result somehow satisfies him that tobacco was not in his line, and he ceased to yearn for it accordingly. But the tall hat and the black necktie were constant sources of irritation. He had an idea, based on his having once won a drawing prize at school, that nature had intended him for an artist, and he secretly lamented the untoward fate which had thrown him away upon coals. Now the few artists Benjamin had chanced to meet affected a soft and slouchy style of headgear, and a considerable amount of freedom, generally with a touch of color, in the region of the neck. Such, therefore, in the fitness of things, should have been the hat and such the neck gear of Benjamin Quelch, and the veto of his wife only made him yearn for them the more intensely. In later years he had been seized with a longing to see Paris. It chanced that a clerk in the same office, one Peter Flip, had made one of a personally conducted party on a visit to the gay city. The cost of the trip had been but five guineas, but never, surely, were five guineas so magnificently invested. There was a good deal of romance about Flip, and it may be that his accounts were not entirely trustworthy, but they so fired the imagination of our friend Benjamin that he had at once begun to hoard up surreptitious expenses with the hope that some day he too might, by some unforeseen combination of circumstances, be enabled to visit the enchanted city. And at last that day had come. Mrs. Quelch, her three children, and her one domestic, had gone to Lowestoft for an Easter outing, Benjamin and a deaf charwoman, Mrs. Widger, being left in charge of the family belongings. 
Benjamin's Easter holidays were limited to Good Friday and Easter Monday, and as it seemed hardly worth while that he should travel so far as Lowestoft for such short periods, Mrs. Quelch had thoughtfully arranged that he should spend the former day at the British Museum, and the latter at the Zoological Gardens. Two days after her departure, however, Mr. Cobble called Quelch into his private office, and told him that if he liked, he might for once take holiday from the Friday to the Tuesday inclusive, and join his wife at the seaside. Quelch accepted the boon with an honest intention of employing it as suggested. Indeed, he had even begun a letter to his wife announcing the pleasing intelligence, and had got as far as, my dear Penelope, when a wild and wicked thought struck him. Why should he not spend his unexpected holiday in Paris? Laying down his pen, he opened his desk, and counted his secret hoard. It amounted to five pounds seventeen, twelve shillings more than Philip's outlay. There was no difficulty in that direction, and nobody would be any the wiser. His wife would imagine that he was in London, while his employers would believe him to be at Lowestoft. There was a brief struggle in his mind, but the tempter prevailed, and with a courage worthy of a better cause, he determined to risk it, and go. And thus it came to pass that on the evening of our story Benjamin Quelch, having completed his packing, which merely comprised what he was accustomed to call his night things, neatly bestowed in a small black handbag belonging to Mrs. Quelch, stood before the looking-glass and contemplated his guilty splendor, the red necktie and the soft gray felt hat, purchased out of surplus funds. He had expended a couple of guineas in a second-class return ticket, and another two pounds in coupons, entitling him to bed, breakfast, and dinner for five days at certain specified hotels in Paris. This outlay, with half a crown for a pair of gloves, and a bribe of five shillings to secure the silence of Mrs. Widger, left him with little more than a pound in hand, but this small surplus would no doubt amply suffice for his modest needs. His only regret as he gazed at himself in the glass was that he had not had time to grow a moustache, the one thing needed to complete his artistic appearance. But time was fleeting, and he dared not linger over the enticing picture. He stole along the passage and softly opened the street door. As he did so, a sudden panic came over him, and he felt half inclined to abandon his rash design. But as he wavered, he caught sight of the detested tall hat hanging up in the passage, and he hesitated no longer. He passed out, and closing the door behind him, started at a brisk pace for Victoria Station. His plans had been laid with much ingenuity, though at a terrible sacrifice of his usual straightforwardness. He had written a couple of letters to Mrs. Quelch, to be posted by Mrs. Widger on appropriate days, giving imaginary accounts of his visits to the British Museum and Zoological Gardens, with pointed allusions to the behavior of the elephant, and other circumstantial particulars. To ensure the posting of these in proper order, he had marked the dates in pencil on the envelopes in the corner usually occupied by the postage stamp, so that when the latter was affixed the figures would be concealed. He explained the arrangement to Mrs. Widger, who promised that his instructions should be faithfully carried out. After a sharp walk he reached the railway station, and in due course found himself streaming across the channel to Dieppe. The passage was not especially rough, but to poor Quelch, unaccustomed as he was to the sea, it seemed as if the boat must go to the bottom every moment. To the bodily pains of seasickness were added the mental pains of remorse, and between the two he reached Dieppe more dead than alive. Indeed, he would almost have welcomed death as a release from his sufferings. Even when the boat had arrived at the pier, he still remained in the berth he had occupied all night, and would probably have continued to lie there had not the steward lifted him by main force to his feet. He seized his black bag with a groan, and staggered on deck. Here he felt a little better, but new terrors seized him at the sight of the gold-laced officials and blue-bloused porters, who lined each side of the gangway, all talking at the top of their voices, and in tones which seemed, to his unaccustomed ear, to convey a thirst for British blood. 
No sooner had he landed than he was accosted by a ferocious-looking personage, in truth a harmless custom-house officer, who asked him in French whether he had anything to declare, and made a movement to take his bag in order to mark it as passed. Quelch jumped to the conclusion that the stranger was a brigand bent on depriving him of his property, and he held on to the bag with such tenacity that the douanier naturally inferred there was something specially contraband about it. He proceeded to open it, and produced, among sundry other feminine belongings, a lady's frilled and furbelowed nightdress, from which, as he unrolled it, fell a couple bundles of cigars. Benjamin's look of astonishment as he saw these unexpected articles produced from his handbag was interpreted by the officials as a look of guilt. As a matter of fact, half stupefied by the agonies of the night, he had forgotten the precise spot where he had left his own bag, and had picked up in its stead one belonging to the wife of a sporting gentleman on his way to some races in Longchamp. Desiring to smuggle a few weeds, and deeming that the presence of such articles would be less likely to be suspected among a lady's belongings, the sporting gentleman had committed them to his companion's keeping. Handbags, as a rule, are passed, unopened, and such would probably have been the case in the present instance had not Quelch's look of panic excited its suspicion. The real owners of the bag had picked up Quelch's, which it precisely resembled, and were close behind him on the gangway. The lady uttered an exclamation of dismay as she saw the contents of her bag spread abroad by the customs officer, but was promptly silenced by her husband. "'Keep your blessed tongue quiet,' he whispered. "'If a bloomin' idiot chooses to sneak our bag, and then to give himself away to the first man that looks at him, he must stand the racket.' whereupon the sporting gentleman and lady first taking a quiet peep into benjamin's bag to make sure that it contained nothing compromising passed the examiner with a smile of conscious innocence and after an interval for refreshment at the buffet took their seats in the train for paris meanwhile poor quelch was taken before a pompous individual with an extra-large moustache and a double allowance of gold lace on his cap and charged not only with defrauding the revenue, but with forcibly resisting an officer in the execution of his duty. The accusation being in French, Quelch did not understand a word of it, and in his ignorance took it for granted that he was accused of stealing the strange bag and its contents. Visions of imprisonment, penal servitude, nay, even capital punishment, floated before his bewildered brain. Finally, the official with a large moustache made a speech to him in French, setting forth that for his dishonest attempt to smuggle he must pay a fine of a hundred francs. With regard to the assault on the official, as said official was not much hurt, he graciously agreed to throw that in and make no charge for it. When he had fully explained matters to his own satisfaction, he waited to receive the answer of the prisoner, but none was forthcoming for the best of reasons. It finally dawned on the official that Quelch might not understand French, and he therefore proceeded to address him in what he considered to be his native tongue. "'You smuggle, smuggle cigar. Then it must be that you pay amende, hundred francs. You me understand? Hundred francs, pay, pay, pay!' At each repetition of the last word he brought down a dirty fist into the palm of the opposite hand immediately under Quelch's nose. Hundred francs, English money, four pound. Quelch caught the last words and was relieved to find that it was merely a money payment that was demanded of him. But he was little better off, for having but a few shillings in his pocket to pay four pounds was as much out of his power as if it had been four hundred. He determined to appeal to the mercy of his captors. Not got he said, apologetically, with a vague idea that by speaking very elementary English he came somehow nearer to French. That all, he continued, producing his little store and holding it out beseechingly to the official. Pas assez, not enough, growled the latter. Quelch tried again in all his pockets, but only succeeded in finding another threepenny piece. The officer shook his head, and after a brief discussion with his fellows said, Comment vous appelez-vous, monsieur? How do you call yourself? With a vague idea of keeping his disgrace from his friends, 
Quelch rashly determined to give a false name. If he had a few minutes to think it over, he would have invented one for the occasion, but his imagination was not accustomed to such sudden calls, and on the question being repeated, he desperately gave the name of his next-door neighbor, Mr. Henry Fladgate. "'Henri Flodget,' repeated the officer as he wrote it down. "'Et vous demeurez? You live where?' And Quelch proceeded to give the address of Mr. Fladgate, 11 Primrose Terrace. "'Très bien. I sent telegram. A violon.' And poor Benjamin was ignominiously marched to the local police station. Meanwhile, Quelch's arrangements at home were scarcely working as he had intended. The estimable Mrs. Widger, partly by reason of her deafness and partly of native stupidity, had only half understood his instructions about the letters. She knew she was to stamp them, and she knew she was to post them, but the dates in the corners might have been runic inscriptions for any idea they conveyed to her obfuscated intellect. Accordingly, the first time she visited her usual house of call, which was early in the morning of Good Friday, she proceeded in her own language to get the dreaded things off her mind by dropping them both into the nearest pillar-box. On the following day, therefore, Mrs. Quelch at Law's Toft was surprised to find on the breakfast-table two letters in her Benjamin's handwriting. Her surprise was still greater when, on opening them, she found one to be a graphic account of a visit to the zoological gardens on the following Monday. The conclusion was obvious. Either Benjamin had turned prophet and had somehow got ahead of the almanac, or he was carrying on in some very underhand manner. Mrs. Quelch decided for the latter alternative, and determined to get to the bottom of the matter at once. She cut a sandwich, put on her bonnet, and grasping her umbrella in a manner which boded no good to anyone who stayed her progress, started by the next train for Liverpool Street. On reaching home she extracted from the weeping widger, who had just been spending the last of Benjamin's five shillings, and was far gone in depression and gin and water, that her good gentleman had not been home since Thursday night. This was bad enough, but there was still more conclusive evidence that he was up to no good in the shape of his tall hat, which hung, silent accuser, on the last peg in the passage. Having pumped Mrs. Widger till there was no more, save tears, to be pumped out of her, Mrs. Quelch, still firmly grasping her umbrella, proceeded next door, on the chance that her neighbor, Mrs. Fladgate, might be able to give her some information. She found Mrs. Fladgate weeping in the parlor with an open telegram before her. Being a woman who did not stand upon ceremony, she read the telegram, which was dated from Dieppe, and ran as follows. Monsieur Fladgate, here detained for to have smuggled cigars. Fine to pay one hundred franc. Send money, and he will be release. Oh, the men, the men, ejaculated Mrs. Quelch, as she dropped into an armchair. They're all alike. First Benjamin, and now Fladgate. I shouldn't wonder if they'd gone off together. "'You don't mean to say Mr. Quelch has gone too?' sobbed Mrs. Fladgate. "'He has taken a shameful advantage of my absence. He has not been home since Thursday evening, and his hat is hanging up in the hall. "'You don't think he has been m m murdered?' "'I'm not afraid of that,' replied Mrs. Quelch. "'It wouldn't be worth anybody's while.' But what has he got on his head? That's what I want to know. Of course, if he's with Mr. Fladgate in some foreign den of iniquity, that accounts for it. Don't foreigners wear hats? inquired Mrs. Fladgate innocently. Not the respectable English sort, I'll bet bound, replied Mrs. Quelch. Some outlandish rubbish, I dare say. But I thought Mr. Fladgate on his Scotch journey. Mr. Fladgate, it should be stated, was a traveller in the oil and colour line. "'So he is. I mean, so he ought to be. In fact, I expected him home to-day. But now he's in p prison, and I may never see him any more.' And Mrs. Fladgate wept afresh. "'Stuff and nonsense,' retorted Mrs. Quelch. "'You've only to send the money they ask for, and they'll be glad enough to get rid of him. But I wouldn't hurry. I'd let him wait a bit.' You'll see him soon enough, never fear. The prophecy was fulfilled sooner than the prophet expected. 
Scarcely were the words out of her mouth when a cab was heard to draw up at the door, and a moment later Fladgate himself, a big, jovial man, wearing a white hat very much on one side, entered the room and threw a bundle of rugs on the sofa. "'Home again, old girl, and glad of it. Morning, Mrs. Quelch,' said the newcomer. Mrs. Fladgate gazed at him doubtfully for a moment, and then flung her arms around his neck, ejaculating, "'Saved! Saved!' martha said mrs quelch reprovingly have you no self-respect is this the way you deal to so shameful a deception then turning the supposed offender so mr fladgate you have escaped from your foreign prison foreign how much have you both gone dotty ladies i've just escaped from a third-class carriage on the london and northwestern the space is limited but i never heard it called a foreign prison it is useless to endeavour to deceive us said mrs quelch sternly look at that telegram mr fladgate and deny it if you can you have been gadding about in some vile foreign place with my misguided husband oh quelch is in it too is he then it must be a bad case but let's see what we have been up to for upon my word i'm quite in the dark at present he held out his hand for the telegram and read it carefully "'Somebody's been having a lark with you, old lady,' he said to his wife. "'You know well enough where I've been. My regular northern journey, and nowhere else.' "'I don't believe a word of it,' said Mrs. Quelch. "'You men are all alike, deceivers every one of you.' "'Much obliged for your good opinion, Mrs. Quelch. I had no idea Quelch was such a bad lot. But so far as I'm concerned, the thing's easily tested. Here is the bill for my bed last night at Carlisle.' now if i was in carlisle and lurking about at dieppe at the same time perhaps you'll kindly explain how i managed it mrs quelch was staggered but not convinced but if if you were at carlisle where is benjamin and what does this telegram mean not being a wizard i really can't say but concerning quelch we shall find him never fear when did he disappear mrs quelch told her story not forgetting the mysterious letter "'I think I see daylight,' said Fladgate. "'The party who has got into that mess is Quelch, "'and being frightened out of his wits, "'he has given my name instead of his own. "'That's about the size of it.' "'But Benjamin doesn't smoke, "'and how should he come to be at Depp? "'Went for a holiday, I suppose. "'As for smoking, I shouldn't have thought he was up to it. "'But with that sat-upon sort of man, "'begging your pardon, Mrs. Quelch, "'you never know where he may break out.' worms will turn you know and sometimes they take a wrong turning but benjamin would never dare that's just it he daren't do anything when you've got your eye on him when you haven't perhaps he may and perhaps he mayn't the fact is you hold up his head too tight and if he jibs now and then you can't wonder at it you have a very coarse way of putting things mr fladgate mr quelch is not a horse that i'm aware of we won't quarrel about the animal my dear madam but you may depend upon it my solution's right a hardened villain like myself say would never have got into such a scrape but quelch don't know enough of the world to keep himself out of mischief they've got him in quod that's clear but the best thing you can do is to send the coin and get him out again send money to those swindling frenchmen never if benjamin is in prison i will fetch him out myself you would never risk that dreadful sea passage exclaimed mrs fladgate and how will you manage the language you don't understand french oh i shall do very well said the heroic woman they won't talk french to me that same night a female passenger crossed by the boat from new haven to dieppe the passage was rough and the passenger was very seasick but she still sat grimly upright never for one moment relaxing her grasp on the handle of her silk umbrella what she went through on landing how she finally obtained her husband's release and what explanations passed between the reunited pair must be left to the reader's imagination for mrs quelch never told the story twenty-four hours later a four-wheeled cab drew up at the quelch's door and from it descended first a stately female and then a woe-begone little man in a soft felt hat and a red necktie, both sorely crushed and soiled, with a black bag in his hand. "'Is there a fire in the kitchen?' asked Mrs. Quelch the moment she set foot in the house. 
Being assured that there was, she proceeded down the kitchen stairs, Quelch meekly following her. Now, she said, pointing to the black bag, those things. Benjamin opened the bag, and tremblingly took out the frilled nightdress and the cigars. His wife pointed to the fire, and he meekly laid them on it. Now that necktie. The necktie followed the cigars. And that thing. And the hat crowned the funeral pile. The smell was peculiar, and to the ordinary nose disagreeable, but to Mrs. Quelch it was as the odor of burnt incense. She watched the heap as it smoldered away, and finally dispersed the embers by a vigorous application of the poker. Now, Benjamin, she said to her trembling spouse, I forgive you. But if ever again... The warning was left unspoken, but it was not needed. Benjamin's one experience has more than satisfied his yearning for soft raiment and foreign travel, and his hats are taller than ever. End of The Wrong Black Bag Recording by Jessica Louise, St. Paul, Minnesota September 25th, 2008